Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed this sweet romance today. If you did, please leave a comment below and let me know, like, and subscribe to the channel so that more people can find the clean romance here. And I hope you have a fantastic day. Remember that you're wonderful and that you're loved. The Devout Groom, a Texas Titans football romance novel. Written by Lucy McConnell. Read by Christina Dimmick. Prologue. The roaring of the student section took on a new level as the Bengals' offense left the field. They were ahead by three with two minutes left to go in the seventh game of the season. There was nothing like college football. The defensive coach grabbed Brad DeGrand's face mask and yanked him down so they were eye level. Do not let them score DeGrand. They've been aiming for that receiver all day. He's all yours. Yes, coach. Brad barked before jogging onto the field. The receiver in question was Dylan Silvering. A senior out of Dallas who was days away from signing with an NFL team back east. Brad narrowed his eyes, taking the guy's measure. He was fast, had a wicked spin, but he didn't have hops. Brad could outjump him eight days a week. He shook out his arms before getting set. Adrenaline pumped through his system and his heart thundered as loud as the feet stomping in the student section. The quarterback yelled out a string of numbers and colors. Brad's lineman shifted slightly. He was going to dive right. Hike! Brad dogged left, avoiding the collision altogether and sprinted after Silvering. Silvering looked over his shoulder, not at Brad but up in the air. The ball was coming. Brad was four steps away. He wouldn't be able to intercept the ball but he could stop Silvering. With a grunt, he dug his cleats into the turf and pushed off, wrapping his arms around Silvering's chest and taking him down. They landed hard, with Silvering taking the brunt of Brad's 236 pounds. Despite the screaming and cheering, the sound of Pad's crunching, and his own heavy breathing, Brad heard a crack. It was a nasty sound, the kind that makes your inside curdle. Silvering shrieked a panicked involuntary reaction to the pain, a noise that could have come from a ten-year-old kid, not the man beneath him. Brad hopped off and offered Silvering a hand. The ball had bounced out of bounds, ending the play. Silvering didn't see Brad, his eyes were squeezed so tight. He gasped for air. Ben's gaze raced over the guy. He stumbled back when he saw the bone poking through Silvering's skin at the elbow. His stomach roiled. He fell to his hands and knees, wrenching, he'd never been good with blood. Medics from both sides of the field surrounded the two. Brad waved them off. I'm fine. Help him. Help him, he insisted to Dr. Burns. The thin man with the bald spot shook his head. He's got loads of help. You're mine. He slipped his hand under Brad's arm and tugged him to standing. How a little guy like that managed to get him up when his knees were so weak, Brad would never know. Let's get you in the locker room. Brad's cleats seemed to grab onto the grass. He couldn't move one foot in front of the other as he watched a team of paramedics load Silvering onto a stretcher and roll him off the field. He's done, said someone. There goes his NFL dream. You don't come back from an elbow messed up like that. Brad wasn't sure who was around him. All he could see was how Silverling's uniform stood out against the white sheet. There was blood. Spots that swam in Brad's vision. The medical team disappeared inside the tunnel. Movement in the stands caught Brad's eye. The crowd parted to allow a beautiful blonde woman through. She wore Silverlink's number and clutched her small ball of a belly. A huge diamond ring blinked in the sunlight. Brad cursed. Just before she descended the stairs, the wife glanced across the field. Even from where he stood, 
Brad could see the fear in her eyes. He'd put that fear there. He'd ruined their future, the baby's future. In a split second, he could see all the hope this small family had, and he knew he'd broken it just as surely as he'd broken Silverling's elbow, and maybe more. The weight of ruining that beautiful creature's life crashed down on him, and he fell to his knees. It's going to be okay, said Dr. Burns, tugging on Brad once again. Brad struggled to his feet. It wasn't okay. And it wasn't going to be okay. Ever. Chapter 1 And as I count up to three, you come to a full state of consciousness. One. Two. Three. Brad's eyes fluttered open. He took in a deep, cleansing breath. Going into deep meditation with the team counselor always left him feeling tingly and renewed. Except today. Even as he pictured himself in a quiet garden full of blooming flowers and lush grass, the same nagging thought followed him like a large black balloon. You weren't as focused today. Are you still upset the Titans lost the playoffs? Brad lifted one side of his mouth in what the magazine photographers called his heartbreaker smile. It embarrassed the heck out of him when they said that. He'd grown up smiling that way. It wasn't like he stood in front of the mirror and practiced or anything. I'm always upset when we lose, you know that. Doc lifted his eyebrows and tipped his head to the side, silently agreeing while encouraging him to continue. When Brad joined the Titans, he had a few issues. After one particularly upsetting loss where he let the receiver slip through his hands and score the winning touchdown, he destroyed the locker room. After three months of bi-weekly meetings with Doc, they finally got down to the heart of the matter, he was scared. Scared of hurting someone the way he'd hurt Silverling. He wasn't naive enough to believe that what happened on the field didn't affect what happened off the field and he'd have to live with the consequences. In a game that's played hard and won hard, a guy had to be willing to leave it all on the field. He just hadn't been able to do that since that fateful college game. Silverling's life had slowly unraveled. He'd lost his pro contract, gotten a divorce, and taken a job in the bakery at a box store just to get by. Brad knew because he followed the guy like a stalker. Every time Brad signed for more money or won an award, the same feeling of sickness that had overtaken him that day on the field welled up in his stomach. Silverlings got a new job. Doc's thin black eyebrows rose in an uncharacteristic show of emotion. Brad, this obsession. It isn't healthy. I know. This is good, though. He's selling cars. Dressing better. Taking care of himself. Brad scrubbed the back of his head. I'm excited for him. Doc pressed his fingertips together. He studied Brad. How many anonymous letters have you sent him over the years? Brad lifted a shoulder. He regretted telling Doc about the envelopes full of cash. The Silverlings' first Christmas out of college had been tight. They were in a small apartment and their baby was just born. Silverling was still in a cast and had another surgery scheduled. They needed the money way more than he did. I don't know. One at Christmas. And one in the spring, too, right? He ducked his chin. Yeah, did you send one this Christmas? Yeah, so you still feel guilty. Brad sucked in. I can't forget her face, the panic, the fear, the love. Doc tapped his fingertips together. Whose face, the wife? Ex-wife, Brad muttered. He hadn't told anyone about seeing her about feeling a connection to her, a responsibility for her because they'd all think he was nuts. It was bad enough that he had to spend this much time with the team psychiatrist, he didn't need to prove how fascinated he really was with the Silverling family and Petra in particular. 
The woman was tough as nails. She'd carried the family for a couple years before the divorce, even going back to finish training as a dental technician. She'd faced the fear he'd seen in her eyes and come off conquering. He just felt bad that she had to face it at all. Doc leaned back in his seat. Ah! His eyes gleamed. This is what we in the shrink business call a breakthrough. He was in for a lecture and he deserved it. Lay it on me. You feel a kinship to this woman because you know what your mom went through to raise you and your sisters on her own. You feel responsible for her well-being just like you do for your mother's. Brad pressed his lips together and scanned the many pictures that lined the wall of Doc and his black lab out hunting ducks. There were more pictures of mallards than Doc's wife and kids. Brad often wondered what that meant but didn't bring it up. Feel responsible for him mom? That was a stretch. Sure, Brad had paid off her house and helped with his sister's expenses but not out of a sense of obligation. His financial support kept his mom at arm's length. She wasn't the easiest person to love. But, he didn't argue with the doctor. There may be some truth in there, he'd need time to think it over. Doc let the silence sit for a minute before asking, if you knew that Mrs. Silverling was okay, would you feel better? Ex Mrs. Silverling. He corrected. I ruined her marriage. How could anyone be okay, after that? From what he'd seen in life, divorce left lasting scars. People leave marriages every day and are better off emotionally. Some physically, depending on the situation. Have you followed her the way you followed Silverling? No, Brad leaned forward. As long as they were married, he didn't feel right about tracking Petra. I didn't friend her on social media after the divorce because I didn't think I could handle hearing if things were bad. I just hoped that by helping Silverling, I was helping her. I think you should look her up. It will help you find some closure. Who knows, maybe she's remarried and happy. Brad dropped his chin in disbelief. You want me to cyberstalk her? Doc copied his movement, mocking him and bringing lightness to the conversation. That was one thing Brad appreciated about the psychiatrist, though he talked about deep topics. He never made Brad feel like he was under a microscope. They could have had the same conversation in Brad's living room while a game was on. You obviously know how. Brad took the dig as easily as he took a hit on the field. And if things aren't good in her life? Then we'll talk. Doc got to his feet. Consider putting all this behind you as your off-season assignment. I'm going out of town for a month to visit the grandkids in Montana. We'll meet up again when I get back. If you need me, you have my number. They said, goodbye, and Brad left the office, his head spinning. His feelings for the ex-Mrs. Silverling were as tangled as the Christmas lights everyone was busy storing away for the year. Closure would be good. He'd carried this weight, these worries for five years. They affected his game. He'd done his job this year, but he didn't help the Titans the way he should have. He owed it to his teammates to get his head out of the sand and do his best. Once he settled in the privacy of his Ferrari Spider, he pulled out his phone and started sleuthing. Chapter 2 Come on back, I've got Magnum P.I. all ready for you, Petra Silverling, waved at her patient. A man in his early sixties with silver hair and a wicked sense of humor. Dan had been coming into Dr. Payne's dental since she'd been hired and he always asked for her. Dan eased into the seat and waited for her to hit the recline button. Thanks, but I'd rather hear about your other job. That's real-life crime fighting. Petra giggled. Hardly. All I do is give a few scammers a hard time. She placed a plastic bib over his chest. 
How's that New Year's resolution to floss more coming along? She'd see for herself in a minute but asking was always a good reminder. Just fine. How about you? You dating yet? Why would you ask that? I overheard you talking to Maddie last time I was here. Dan spoke matter-of-factly, as if the whole office had heard Maddie prodding her to get back into the dating scene. Maddie claimed that since she'd been happily divorced for two years, it was probably time. Petra's face burned and she slipped her mask up to cover the blush. They'd have to be more careful about their private conversations when patients were in the chairs. Good heavens, what else had they talked about? And not just on that day, but every day. The other dental techs were her best friends. They supported one another and joined forces against Dr. Payne when he wanted to cut their vacation days. I'm still considering my options. My daughter comes first, always, she replied. As she should. But, uh... My son, he came in a couple of weeks ago. He thought you were pretty cute. Ew. Dan's son hadn't brushed his teeth in a week, saying he wanted to get his money's worth out of his semi-annual cleaning. Nasty. When or if she started dating, it would not be with that guy. Thanks, that's sweet, but I don't think I'm ready yet. She picked up a scaler and a mirror. Open up and let me have a look. We'll have you clean in no time. All right, but a story really would keep my mind off things. She smiled under her mask. You got it. So this prince from Africa says he wants to send me a cart full of colored gemstones. All he needs is my bank account number for collateral. Dan scoffed. I'm sure, he said as she cleaned his teeth. It came out garbled but she'd gotten good at interpreting people. Once Dr. Payne had examined Dan for cavities, she showed him up to the receptionist where he'd settle up his bill. Thank goodness she didn't have to do that part of the visit. Asking people for money was worse than pulling teeth. Hey, Petra, can I see you for a minute? asked Kelly, the office manager. Sure. Petra followed her into the small closet that had been converted into an office. Kelly's desk was pushed against the far, windowless wall and two chairs sat close together. That was the extent of the furniture. Her filing cabinet was out front behind the receptionist and all office supplies were kept in the larger storage closet down the hall. She had a family picture on one wall, showing her and her husband and their two kids. Everyone had the same color blonde hair and blue eyes. Kelly shut the thin door and motioned for Petra to take a seat. She did, leaning back into the cushion. What's up? I'm giving everyone a heads up. We'll be closing the office for a week starting the 11th. You're welcome to use your paid vacation days or you can go without pay. Petra's head scrambled. She had a couple of paid days left, but she'd used most of her vacation when her daughter, Taya, had pneumonia last month. Why? she blurted. Kelly smiled. Dr. Payne is taking his wife to Paris for Valentine's Day. It's been a dream of theirs since their wedding and they finally get to go. That's lovely. And it was. So what if it put her a week behind financially, right? At least Dr. Payne and his wife would get to live out some romantic fantasy. What was a mortgage payment on her tiny condo when love was on the line? Not to mention, she needed a new battery for her car. Starting it was a craps shoot. Okay, sarcasm was not helping. She smoothed her hands over her hair and then tugged at her ponytail. I'm not going to lie, this is a bad time for this to happen for me. Kelly's round face filled with concern. I'm sorry. What about cataloging extra hours at your other job? Petra pressed her lips together. 
she made a small sum from an online company for distracting scammers. Even if she put in another 20 hours a week it couldn't come close to covering her normal paycheck. She did it for extra spending money and because she could do it from home after Taya fell asleep. But that wasn't Kelly's problem. I'll see what I can do. You're not the first one I've heard that from. She glanced at a list on her desk. Petra couldn't make out what it said but guessed that she was working her way through the staff, giving them the bad news. I'll see if there's another office in the area that needs some subs that week. Petra kept her face even. Subbing in another office was always tricky. Each dentist had his or her own way of doing things and it took a while to find your groove. It was better than nothing though. Thanks. Petra showed herself out. Just as she reached the reception area, she heard, Mom. Turning quickly at the sound of her daughter's voice, Petra was able to catch Taya as she jumped into her arms. What are you doing here? She asked with a smile she didn't feel. Taya clung to her and she clung back, knowing there were limited days when she'd be able to hold her child in her arms. They grew so fast. Behind Taya came Dylan. Her ex was a handsome guy, broad shoulders, tall, dark hair and fair skin. He could charm most of the women in her office, except Maddie. She was firmly in Petra's camp. Although the mediator for their divorce stressed that they not have sides, that they work as a parental team, sometimes Petra felt as though she was carrying the team on her shoulders. She had the sinking feeling that today was one of those days. Taya leaned back, shifting her weight so she could look up at Petra. Daddy says I get to visit you at work today and watch cartoons. Petra hugged Taya close again so she could glare at Dylan without her daughter noticing. You can't leave her here, she whispered. Dylan had the decency to appear sheepish which was more than he ever did when they were married. I've got a meeting with the district leader in sales. It's a big deal and I need this promotion. We agreed that we'd each take our turns Dylan. Petra grit her teeth. How was she supposed to chew out Dylan in front of her waiting patients and her daughter? He knew she couldn't. That's why he'd come into the office instead of called. Ugh. I know and I'll take an extra weekend when you need it. I promise. He stepped back, closer to the door, closer to leaving her in a bind, again. Most of the time, she was grateful for the divorce. The physical and emotional distance was a relief after she realized that their marriage wasn't built on a solid foundation. But that didn't mean Brad went away. They had a daughter together. So he was still around. Still not pulling his weight. Petra set Taya on her feet. Wait right here, okay? She followed after Dylan, grabbing his arm to stop his retreat. Dylan, we aren't allowed to bring our kids to work. Office policy. I could lose my job. He dropped his head back in irritation. You guys close in an hour. It'll be okay. You'll see. With that empty promise, he spun on his heel and left. Petra blinked after him. I'm going to kill our divorce mediator. Her hands fisted and she shook. The man seemed so sure the two of them could work as a team to raise Taya and had talked Petra into giving this a try. They had three more months before they went back to him for a progress update. She had half a mind to call him up and tell him to shove it. She'd rather have a judge who could lay down some rules Dylan had to follow. She'd probably get what she wanted too, considering he'd put her job at risk. A small, warm hand pushed open her fist and slipped inside. Instantly, Petra's anger disappeared. Oh, she was still upset at the world, but her daughter was innocent. As if she needed confirmation, Taya's big blue eyes stared up at her, trusting and yet worried. 
Petra lifted the five-year-old onto her hip. I'm so glad you're here, Dumpling. Taya giggled. You're silly. I sure am. Silly to marry your dad. She thought silly to believe he'd keep his word. Just silly. It was too late in the day to call her mom and have her get here in time to take Taya. Her sister was at work. There was no one to help and she had patients to take care of. Petra. Wendy, the receptionist, waved her over. I'll take her. She held out her tattoo-covered arms. I've got a puppy coloring book and a giant crayon box back here. We'll tuck her under the desk and no one will even know she's there. Taya stared at the ink on Wendy's arms, her eyes getting big. Did you color your arms? she asked. Wendy laughed. Yep. But you have to be 18 before you can try. Taya nodded and leaned over so Wendy could take her. Petra sighed. Stashing her daughter under a desk wasn't an ideal solution but it was the only one she had at the moment. Thanks Wendy. If you need anything. I've totally got this. Wendy opened her purse and pulled out a package of chocolate candies. If she gets bored, I'll set her up in the kids' room with a movie. They had an exam room decorated for children and stocked with the latest video games and DVDs. They didn't use it for adults because everything, including the chair, was smaller sized. If they didn't have little ones coming in, it would be the perfect spot to hide her daughter. Taya would love to lay back in a chair with her own headphones and a private movie showing. Anything with a princess and she'll be hooked. Wendy winked in response. Your next patient is in room three. Thanks. Petra hurried back, grateful for Wendy's help. She opened the cupboard and retrieved a new mask. Somehow she'd managed to crumple hers in her hand. Gee, wonder how that happened? As she secured the bands behind her ears, she glanced down at the man in the chair. He wore a Texas Titans jersey and ball hat. She sat down and smiled. How are you doing today, Troy? I'd be doing better if the Titans weren't talking about trading felts. She stuffed down her groan. Sorry, I don't follow the team. She pressed the pedal to lower and recline the chair at the same time she reached for a probe. Let's take a good look at that tooth that's been bothering you. I. She didn't wait for him to go on, but stuck the probe in his mouth, forcing him to open wide or get stabbed. His gums were swollen. That doesn't look good. Like my day today, she thought. She didn't like a downward spiral and hoped Dylan's little trick didn't start one. Maintaining the status quo was the key to a happy life. After clocking out, retrieving her adorable daughter who had colored quietly for almost an hour, and making a box of mac and cheese for dinner, Petra pulled out her laptop. Are you going to message? asked Taya twirling her brown hair around her finger. She had on a long nightgown with a picture of a princess on the front and a ruffle around the bottom. Her hair was still damp from her bath and she smelled like watermelon. Petra tucked a piece of hair behind Taya's ear. Do you want me to come read to you before bed? Although she could really use the extra time and therefore pay, Taya came first. I want my CD story, she said, referring to the latest book on tape they picked up at the library. Taya adored her CD player, dance parties and audiobooks were a thrill. She threw her arms around Petra's neck. Love you. Love you too. Petra held her extra close for one second more than she should. She watched her walk down the hall to her bedroom and let out a sigh. Independence and in children was a double-sided blessing. Refocusing on her screen, she brought up her profile and checked in. She'd had a social media account under her maiden name but when she married Dylan, they'd set up a joint account. 
It was that one that she'd used to post the pictures after surgery and doctor visit updates. Then, when she started to realize that her marriage wasn't what she thought it was, that she and Brad had problems they'd glossed over because the NFL was on the horizon, she'd stopped posting. When she'd heard about this online job, pestering scammers, she'd had to open an account under Petra Silverling. She used an old profile pic from when she was cheering in college and pretty soon, she was knee-deep in crazies. There were new messages and ongoing conversations that needed her attention first. The longer she could string a scammer along the better. The whole point of this job was to tie up con artists so they didn't have as much time to steal from people who bought their lies. She had to get creative, but messing with them was kind of fun. It was an outlet for her mischievous side which she was constantly tamping down in her real life. A new message caught her eye. The man in the picture was gorgeous. His dark chocolate hair was a little longer than she preferred but he had the thick neck of an athlete and beautiful green eyes. His nose was a little broad for her tastes but it worked for him. She clicked on the icon to open the message. New guy, how's life? Oh. So it was one of those guys. She been he hit on plenty of times. Normally she didn't respond. This guy wasn't all that good at wooing the ladies, how's life? Really? Normally they started off with things like, hey, beautiful, or you're so pretty, or her least favorite. Do you believe in love at first sight? He'd chosen a great stock photo though, she hadn't seen that one before. Is that the best line you've got? She asked him in return. Someone had to call him out on that nonsense. She shook her head at his inexperience and moved on to answer the prince. Dear Ali Abdul Abraman, sovereign ruler of Aninka Stanza. I so enjoyed your last message and agree that the situation with your brother's half-sister's cousin is appalling. She snickered as she copied his spelling of appalling. She always included quotes around the word. Come on, if you're going to try and scam someone, at least run a spell check. She sounds controlling and manipulative. I would love to help you regain the throne, have you thought about offering her cake? When a person's blood sugar drops, they can become irritable. Let me know what you think of Operation Sugar Shock. Sincerely, Petra. P.S. I have an excellent recipe that I'm sure your entire family would enjoy. Let me know if you need it. Grinning to herself, she hit send and switched over to the new guy while she waited to see what the prince would say. New guy, I'm not sure what to say. I just wanted to know how you were doing. She squinted and leaned closer to the screen to make out his name. Brad. No last name. She checked his account. It looked like he'd set it up that day. No personal information, the bare necessities filled out. What an amateur. Well, if you really want to know. I'm a single mom with an ex who thinks his life is more important than mine. I'm about to be stranded without pay for a week, and my car needs a new battery. She glanced down at her scrub top and saw a smear of orange. And, as if that wasn't bad enough, I ate mac and cheese for dinner. It wasn't delicious. Brad, oh. Yeah, oh. She scoffed. Run away. Run far, far away. You're out of your league here, big guy. The prince hadn't responded. Sometimes he waited until the next morning. She wondered what time zone he was in. She opened up the ongoing correspondence with Tulu the Dalai Lama's campaign manager. She'd yet to learn what he was campaigning for but according to Tulu, that wasn't as important as getting the funds together for said campaign. Well, of course, she snarked. She scanned his note and then hit reply. Yes, free will and thinking is an important stance for any candidate, 
but has Dalai Lama given any thought to free chocolate? Everyone loves it and it can be served as a liquid or a solid making transportation and distribution a breeze. I hope he loves the idea. Let me know how much chocolate I should order for the rally. Yours, Petra. Oh my gosh they probably thought she was the biggest idiot. Sarcasm did not translate well in the written word. They always thought she was serious. That's why this job was so fun. She got to say exactly what she was thinking, be as snarky as she wanted, and she didn't hurt anyone. Sure, she frustrated scammers but they deserved a little of their own medicine. Brad, can I help? Petra stared at the words. Plot twist. No one offered to help. No one. Not unless the statement was accompanied by I'll need your bank account number. She drummed her fingers as she tried to find his angle. A glance at the clock on her screen said it was after ten. No wonder her brain wasn't working as fast. She stood up, shook out her arms, stretched and then sat back down. Senior Valdez's face popped up. She did a victory dance. Senior Valdez was live. Live chats were like pounding a dirty Dr. Pepper. She cracked her knuckles as she read his note out loud, We will send you Spanish coins valued at 100,000.00 US dollars. Of which you will receive 10%. She typed quickly. I'm confused. Am I getting 10% of the coins or 10% of the money? Valdez, money. Petra, so what happens to the coins? Valdez, they will be sold at auction. Petra grinned wickedly. What if I want coins instead of cash? Valdez, you can't have them. Petra, I can buy them at the auction though, right? Valdez, no. Petra, okay, I don't need the Spanish coins but what if you gave me the 10% in quarters? Valdez, we will put the 10% in your bank. Petra, I'm going to need a bigger piggy bank. Valdez, please send me your bank account number. Props to him for staying focused on his goal. That kind of dedication should be rewarded. Sure. But I'm worried about privacy. There are some bad people in the world and I'm pretty sure they're reading this message right now. So, I'm sending my account number in code. A201B102C012D. She grinned. He'll be chewing on that one for a while. He's probably putting it into a search bar right now. Her eyes went back to that beautiful profile picture of Brad's. Feeling sassy, she decided to call his bluff. You could buy a new battery for my car. Brad, done. Who's your mechanic? What? Her fingers hovered over the keyboard. Fine. If that's the way he wanted to play it. She did a quick search for the most expensive mechanic in Dallas, made sure the business wasn't located near her home and sent him the link. All was quiet for a moment and she found herself yawning, the thrill of the live chat fading quickly. Maybe it was time to call it a day. She closed out of the Prince, Tulu, and Senior Valdez. Just as she was about to click the X on Brad's window, a new message popped up. Brad, you can pick it up anytime tomorrow. Yeah, right. She thought. It was after 10. There was no way he set that up. Thanks. Brad, hope it helps. She closed out without saying anything. Strangely, she couldn't come up with anything to say. She must be worn out. It had been a stressful day. With one more wistful look at the model Brad used for his profile pic, she shut the screen. If only men like that really existed in the world. Chapter 3 
Brad called Luxury Auto first thing in the morning and gave them Petra's name and his credit card information. He told them to hook her up with anything she needed. She could max out the card on repairs, new seats, or buy a new car for all he cared. Of course, he didn't tell the guy that, the business would max out his card in the blink of an eye. He just didn't want Petra to have to worry about something like a dead battery. He couldn't believe the way she'd opened up to him last night, telling him about her ex and her boss like that. She was under a lot of pressure as a single mom and probably needed a lesson on internet safety. He made his way to the gym in his basement where his personal trainer was already waiting. They worked his lower body and then he hit the pool for a swim. The water felt great after sweating so much. When he was done, he ate, showered and dressed quickly. A look at the clock told him it was around 11. Petra should have gotten her battery by now. He decided to head to Luxury Auto and see how things went. He could have called, but he wanted to talk to the guys and find out if they treated her right. The GPS on his phone said the shop was in his area of town, which surprised him. He didn't think the Silverlings made that kind of money. Maybe Petra's family was well off. He strode into the building and was assaulted by the smell of leather. It was a rich smell, and not at all authentic as there was nothing leather in the lobby. The chairs were modern, heavy-duty plastic and glass. The coffee table had thick iron legs and a glass top and the reception desk was the same. Photos of vintage Camaros, Ferraris, and hot rods adorned the gray walls. They acted like beaded jewelry around a woman's neck giving a splash of color. He nodded to the older gentleman waiting on one of the funky chairs and headed for the man in a polo shirt behind the glass desk. He stood quickly and held out his hand. Welcome to Luxury Automotive. I'm Scott. What can we do for you today? His handshake was firm and confident, all salesmen. His skin had a leathery look to go along with the leather air fresheners. Maybe it was caused by the air fresheners. The thought had Brad's breaths coming in shallow. I called earlier about a battery for a friend. If he didn't have to give his name out loud to the waiting room, he wouldn't. Scott's eyes widened and the recognition clicked in. Brad braced himself for the fan craze but it didn't come. Scott shuffled through a couple of post-it notes. Petra Silverling, was that right? Yes. She hasn't come in yet. Did you say Petra? asked the man with the silver hair. Brad half turned his direction. Petra's name was unusual enough that this man might know her. Especially if they lived in the same area and shared a mechanic. Do you know her? He nodded. She works at my dentist's office. Sweet girl. Brad's shoulders fell. So she doesn't live around here? He'd asked for her mechanic. I don't think so. He lifted a shoulder. I saw her yesterday. Tried to set her up with my son. Oh. Brad only halfway heard what he said about setting her up because he was more worried about why she hadn't gotten her battery. And the fact that she'd picked a mechanic across town. This was a nice place, but still. An attendant scuttled out of the shop, holding out a pair of keys. Scott took them. Looks like your car is ready Mr. Brockman. Brad stepped away from the counter so Mr. Brockman could pay his bill. He pulled up the app and reread the back and forth from last night. Petra said she'd come. He decided to send her another note. He lifted the camera and took a quick photo of the lobby and Scott with his head bent over the computer. Scott said you didn't come in this morning for the battery. It's here for you. I hope everything is okay. Petra, sorry about that. We had a root canal gone wrong. The guy almost lost his nose. 
Brad stared at the text. Was she serious? She couldn't possibly be. The older man stopped beside him. Brad glanced up in time to see him read the message on the phone. He laughed, is showing his healthy back teeth. Petra must be good at her job, thought Brad. That Petra, said Mr. Brockman. She's such a kidder. He eyed Brad. Maybe you can get her to go out on a date. I've been trying for a while now. You asked her out? Me? No. For my son. Like I said earlier. He sighed heavily. A woman like that could give a man ambition and heaven knows my tray needs it. He patted Brad's shoulder. Good luck. Brad stared after him for a minute. So, she was kidding him. That was kind of, cute. The soft whoosh of the automatic doors reminded him of where he was and he typed a quick reply. I'm so sorry to hear that. It must have been difficult for the patient to face the possibility of life without nose hair. Her response came quickly. A nose is a person's identity. I beg to differ. Petra, explain your differ. Brad's cheeks tugged up into a smile. She was sassy. Brad, the police don't take nose prints. Petra, then what are mug shots? His grin widened and he turned away from the open waiting room. Fingerprints are used to open bank vaults and even my phone. Petra, facial recognition software is the new wave, Grandpa. He chuckled. Hang on, I can't hear you over the sound of my fax machine and rotary dial phone. Texting is horrible on this thing. She sent him a laughing so hard it was crying emoji. He pumped his fist. Scotty cleared his throat making Brad look up from his phone and realize where he was and why he was there. The reality of what he'd just done crashed down on his shoulders. He'd flirted with Petra Silverling. That crossed a line he hadn't even known he'd need to draw. How had he fallen into that? He glanced back over the messages, shaking his head. Sobering, he typed. I'm sorry I bothered you. I gave Scotty my credit card number. You can come in any time this week when it's convenient for you. I won't be here. He tucked his phone into his back pocket. A quick conversation with Scotty explained the situation and assured that she'd have until the end of the week to figure this out. If she didn't, Scott would shred the paperwork and that would be that. Brad walked out, one ear tuned towards his phone, hoping for a beep that said Petra had responded. His head kept telling him to knock it off. He didn't need to get mixed up with the ex-wife of the man he'd flattened. He'd be better off keeping his distance. Whatever made him think understanding her situation was a good idea anyway. Right Doc said he needed closure. He searched himself, looking to see if he felt any closure. He didn't. If anything, he wanted to spend more time with Petra. That wasn't going to happen. Petra's phone dinged and she hurried to grab it, worried that Dylan was going to back out of picking up Taya after school. She'd called her mom and put her on standby but she really didn't want to have to drop Taya on her again. Not that her mom didn't love her granddaughter to the ends of the earth, it just felt like a lot to ask and she asked more than she should have to. Instead of a message from her ex, she had one from the new Brad. She glared at the picture he sent of the lobby of the repair shop. He was there? She snorted. What's up? asked Maddie. Petra tucked her phone into her pocket. I picked up a stalker last night. Really? she asked as she continued to clean the room and ready it for the next patient. Maddie's lack of reaction showed how crazy Petra's online life was to the outside world. She shook her head. Yeah, 
but he totally sucks at it. I almost want to give him pointers the poor guy doesn't stand a chance. Maddie laughed. Let me see. Petra handed her the phone and went back to counting boxes of gloves. She needed to get the supply order in before they all went on break for a week. For a half second, she wondered what it would be like to have someone whisk her off to Paris. Not just anyone, but the love of her life. As frustrated as she was with Dr. Payne for putting her out of a job for five days, she could admit that the trip was terribly romantic. Maddie handed back the phone. You should call his bluff, really teach him a lesson. Petra considered the idea. Most of the time, she just bugged these guys until they dropped her. Could she really stop some perv before he took advantage of a lonely lady? That would be epic. I'm calling the garage. She looked up the number and called. This is Scotty, how can I help you? Uh. She gestured wildly to Maddie asking for help. Ask if he's still there, whispered Maddie. This is Petra Silverling. Is Brad there? I'm sorry. Mr. DeGrand has left the premises. However, we are ready to install a new battery at your convenience. Would you like to make an appointment? Her heart thumped wildly against her chest. She had a last name. DeGrand. It felt familiar but she saw so many names online and in the office that it could be anyone. She never, never, took her online job into the real world. Um, we have an opening tomorrow at 8.30 a.m., he prompted. Crap. That would be fine, she agreed to get out of the call. We'll see you then. She pressed the end button and dropped the phone on the shelf like it was a thousand degrees. What the heck? Maddie flapped her hands. I can't believe you did that. What was I supposed to do? He was totally legit. She flapped her hands too. The movement helped calm her down. When her energy was spent, she leaned against the cabinets. You should go. She gave Maddie an are you crazy look. What? You need a battery and he's willing to buy you one. Right. She straightened. And when they ask for my credit card I'll just hand it right over. If they ask, you walk. You're not locked into this. Petra blew her hair off her forehead. You're the one always telling me that miracles happen and God is watching over us. Maybe this is your miracle. If this is my miracle I'm going to write a complaint letter. Maddie bumped her hip. Come on. Aren't you at least curious? Petra clamped her teeth together. She was curious. Ugh. You know me too well. We should stop being friends. Ha! <laughs> like you could get rid of me that easily. Want me to come with you? Petra shook her head. You're on at 8 tomorrow. I'll be lucky to get here by 10, if I decide to stop. Wendy stuck her head in the door. She'd added a streak of pink to her black hair the night before making her look like a night pixie. Maddie, you have a patient in room two. Thanks. Maddie put the bag of water picks back on the shelf and headed out. Petra waited until her footsteps receded before pulling out her phone. She took a deep breath. Her courage didn't build like she'd hoped. Her phone dinged and she about dropped it. Holy cavities, Batman, she muttered. The ding wasn't from Brad, it was from the prince. Her body sagged with relief. Brad had her all done up. She just couldn't figure out his angle. If he really was a stalker, then why did he hand over his credit card information to Scotty? And why did his last text sound like he was giving up on her? 
she needed a shot of confidence. Deciding to go after the prince first, because he was the type of guy she could handle, she tapped on his picture. Cake won't work. Must hire a lawyer, need funds, send money to. With a nod, she tapped the reply button. My dear Ali Abdul Labraman, sovereign ruler of Anin Costanza. I'm certain if you used my recipe, your troubles would be over. You can find it below. I'm certain it will sweeten up your brother's half-sister's cousin. Ingredients include. She finished typing and put her phone away. She had a patient in 15 minutes and she needed to get the ordering finished before then. On her way past the receptionist's desk, Wendy called for her to stop. So, she propped her chin on her hand. Are you going to the mechanic? Petra held back her eye roll. Of course everyone in the office knew about her online exploits, she was usually the one sharing the stories. This guy was no different than the others. Except, she couldn't quite get his angle. I'm thinking about it. Well, it sounds like he's a nice guy. That's weird, right? She laid her arms on the high counter. I guess. Wendy dropped her hand. I mean, who offers to pay for a stranger's car repair? Petra drummed her fingers on the countertop. Rich people with too much time on their hands and good hearts. Or psychos who want to draw you into their web so they can lock you up in the basement. Wendy widened her eyes and drew her finger across her throat. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Petra deadpanned. Wendy laughed. He doesn't know who he's messing with, you have a spidey sense stronger than anyone I know. Petra laughed. I'm just cautious, too cautious sometimes. My mom says I see gloom around every corner. Wendy shook her head, her short hair whipping her cheek. Not true. You checked the garage out though. It's on the up and up? I picked it, not him. If he was trying to scam me then he would have sent me to a place he chose. You should ask them for info on the guy. I don't know, it was one thing to toy with the bad guys online and another to open her life to them. I've got to get this order in. I'll see you later. Even as the worries floated around her head, she knew she was going to go. There was something about Brad's texts, something real that she couldn't put her finger on. If he was a scam artist, he was horrible at his job. She wanted more information and the best way to get an impartial evaluation would be to go to the garage. Ugh. She was going to do it. Her co-workers would kill her. How many times had she admonished them against meeting people in person they'd met online? Technically, she was picking up a battery, not meeting Brad. He wasn't supposed to be there. And dang it! She needed a battery. If things weren't so strapped. Okay, that was it. She was going. She must have talked herself out of the trip across town a half dozen times over the night and then talked herself right back into going. Sitting in her car, her hands gripping the steering wheel, she studied the outside of the building. It looked all right. There weren't any shady characters hovering around the glass doors inside or out. The cars in the parking lot were all empty. No one waited to jump out and tease her. Her gut said everything was fine and since she had one of the world's most sensitive guts when it came to sketchy situations, she headed inside. Scotty greeted her, introducing himself and shaking her hand. Once he realized who she was, the star treatment began. He whisked away her keys, promising to have the job done in enough time for her to get to work. Then, he offered her a drink. She decided on a bottle of water with a designer label that stated the water had never been touched by human hands. Once she was comfortable in the waiting area, Scotty came by with a tray. Would you like a pastry? 
Petra held back her giggles. They looked like donuts to her, but if Scotty wanted to call them pastries, who was she to argue? Besides, his kindness was warming her heart. The customer service was far and above the usual stale popcorn she got at her mechanics. Thank you. She selected a chocolate cake donut with chocolate frosting and a healthy dose of sprinkles. Melting into the back of the chair, she relished the feeling of being taken care of for once. She was always taking care of someone else, on call 24-7 for her daughter and pampering her patients. The relief of not having that responsibility on her shoulders washed over her and sucked her under bringing tears to her eyes. Being a strong person was a positive attribute, but just because she could carry the weight of the world didn't mean that she should be asked to do it day in and day out. She swiped at her tears. Ma'am, are you okay? asked Scotty. She laughed and held up her donut. This is the best pastry I've ever had. His eyes widened slightly in a she's cuckoo look. I'm glad you like it. Any other day, she would have taken out her phone and seen what the Dalai Lama's campaign advisor was up to. But she just couldn't bring herself to step into that role. Not now. Now was fulfilling her reserves. She sipped her breathe on by Angel's water and closed her eyes. Can't help falling in love, crooned through the speakers, low enough not to encroach into her zen but loud enough that she could make out the words. Luxury auto may not be heaven but it sure felt like it and she was having a hard time not falling in love with the place. Too bad she'd never be able to afford it on her own. Ma'am? Petra blinked her eyes open and found Scotty standing in front of her. Your car is ready. That was fast. Scotty grinned. We aim to please. She checked her frown. She wouldn't have minded if they'd taken another twenty minutes or twenty years as long as they kept bringing her sweets and clear water. With a mental push, she managed to gather her purse. Scotty held out her keys. She swallowed. This was the moment of truth. What do I owe you? Scotty smiled, revealing a gap between his bottom front teeth. It's all been taken care of. Really? She hesitantly reached for her keys. Scotty dropped them into her hand. Really? She pressed her lips together. I'm sorry to bug you about this, but the guy that paid for the battery. The desk phone began to ring. Yes? Scotty looked over his shoulder. Is he normal? She held her breath. As soon as she realized she was hoping Brad was normal, that this wasn't some twisted, sick way attempt to scam her, she forced herself to breathe normally. His head whipped back around. Normal? I mean, he's not like, a convict or anything, is he? Please. Please don't be a convict she silently plead. She already had an ex-husband to deal with, she didn't need more on her plate. What she did need, was a miracle. A small one like a new, free battery from a decent guy would be just fine. I can assure you he is not a convict. He took two steps towards the ringing phone. If you'll excuse me. Of course, she replied. Tucking her purse close to her side, she hurried out to where her car waited. It started right up. She rubbed the dashboard. I swear you're purring. She checked her mirrors before pulling out of the parking lot. And I can't say I blame you. If they treated her car half as well as they treated her, the thing would hate her when she took it back to Joe's for an oil change. She scanned the road and her rearview mirror to make sure she wasn't being followed. Somehow, she couldn't imagine Scotty being in on anything shifty. There were no weirdo vibes making the hair on the back of her neck stand up. Which meant that Brad had done a really nice thing for her. Oh no. 
that meant she had to thank him. Maybe that was his angle. Make her feel indebted to him. Well, he had another thing coming if he thought she was going to do him any favors in return. The battery was a gift, gifts didn't have to be repaid, they were free. And she wasn't going to let him twist this. She was, however, going to say thank you. It was the polite thing to do. She spent the rest of the drive to work coming up with the perfect way to say thanks, now scram. Her life was too busy to let this go any deeper than it already had. Chapter 4 Brad stepped off the treadmill. He'd just completed a series of sprints meant to mimic time on the field. Going all out for 45 seconds and then walking for a minute over and over again for a half hour was difficult, if he didn't stay in shape. The team doctor told him he had horse's lungs. He assumed that was a good thing. Sweat dripped down his face, chest and back. The smell coming off him made him wrinkle his nose. He grabbed a white towel and wiped himself down before grabbing his phone to see what he'd missed. Petra, thanks for the battery. That was really nice of you. Bye. He blinked. Bye. His sense of well-being tipped precariously. This couldn't be. Goodbye. He hadn't even come close to easing his guilt or finding closure. Happy to do it. Did they treat you well? Petra, better than I deserve. Brad, I doubt that. You deserve the best. Petra, what are you, some rich guy with nothing better to do? Yeah, but he wasn't about to tell her that. And, it wasn't that he didn't have better things to do, it was that he needed to finish this, whatever this was. The accident on the field that day was like a bookmark in his life. There were pages before that and pages after, but, every page after was influenced by that event. He couldn't play to his full potential without hearing Silverling's cry of pain when he tackled a man. He couldn't date without feeling bad that the Silverlings were no longer married because of what he'd done. He couldn't relax. And, he couldn't tell her all that. I'm more of a fairy godfather. Petra, snort. Not according to your profile pic. Brad's heart skipped a beat. Uh, did you just snort at me? B, that's my daytime look, don't knock it. Petra, uh, yes, I snorted. And I'll do it again if the need arises. B, how could I mock that look? Muscles for days, dreamy blue eyes. Seriously, what did you have to pay for that stock photo? Brad stared at the screen in disbelief. She didn't know who he was. She didn't know he had knocked her ex-husband out of the NFL. She didn't know he was a titan. She didn't know. The anonymity was exhilarating at the same time it added a layer of guilt to his conscience. Warring with those emotions was the satisfaction that she found him attractive. If that wasn't a bowl of mix-up soup, Doc would tell him to stop this whole thing and get some clarity. He couldn't. What he'd seen in Petra intrigued him. Her texts made him smile. Real smiles that tugged at his heart, trying to lift it from the low place it had lain for the last five years. Still, he should tell her. He started typing his confession. Petra, never mind. That was rude. I don't trust anyone online these days. Occupational hazard. Brad blew out a breath. She shouldn't trust him. He wanted her to though. He hit the back button, deleting his hasty revelation. That's smart, he replied. Petra, tell me something about yourself that's true, anything. He glanced around his home gym, taking in the weight bench, the rubber mats on the floor, and the inspirational quotes accompanied by football images. I love football. 
There, it was truthful and it would open the door to a deeper conversation where he might be able to tell her more about himself and about what had happened. Petra, this is where our friendship must come to an end. Frowny face. Several thoughts popped into Brad's head. The first was that she called him her friend. That was huge. Granted, they weren't friends in the normal sense of the word but they were online friends and that was fantastic. Second, she hated football. That sucked. Third, if she hates football, then she'd hate him. He couldn't let that happen. He still wanted to make up for what he'd put her through and he couldn't do that if she cut him out of her life. Sending money didn't assuage guilt. He'd found that out after years of sending checks to her ex-husband. He needed to find out how to make her life easier, no, better. Instead of broaching all the hard topics, he kept his response light. Oh, you thought we were friends? He added a smiling emoji so she'd know he was kidding. She sent back one with devil horns. He laughed. The three dots blinked indicating she was typing. Petra, we could be. There are rules. Brad, more than one? Petra, three. Brad, fire away. Petra, no football. No talking about it. No sending pictures. No updating scores. Nothing. He didn't hesitate. Fine frowny face. Petra, no kissy-faced emojis. Black. Brad, double black. He read over his reply after he hit send. He was such an idiot. Petra, honesty. I can't be friends with liars. How much pain was behind that statement? He hesitated answering. Following rule number one necessitated breaking rule number three. The only way he could justify playing along was by promising himself that, if she asked, he would tell her everything. His phone beeped, telling him his downtime was over and he should start lifting. Deal. I have to go, my break is over. Good luck with today's root canals. Petra, thanks. Try updating your profile pic, that guy needs a haircut. Brad's hand flew to his hair. He pulled his phone closer to his nose, squinting to make out the picture. His hair was long in it, as long as it was now. He tossed the towel into the dirty basket. With a quick call, he had an appointment for a haircut. He could get there right after he finished lifting and took a shower. His conscience pricked him for not telling Petra the whole truth. He added another 20 pounds to the bar for punishment and began his first set. He'd tell her. One day. In the meantime, he'd just have to do his best to make her happy. That was his new goal. Do whatever it took to make Petra happy. Maybe by the time she got to know him, she could forgive his past and they could really be friends. Because, he could use a good friend. He had some guys on the team he got along with and they hung out, but no one knew what he was really dealing with inside. Maybe, if they could get to that point, then Petra could be that person. Chapter 5 You can't cancel, I have work. Petra shimmied into her black scrub bottoms while keeping the phone tucked between her shoulder and her ear. Dylan was supposed to pick Taya up after school today. She was glad that he was finally showing some drive in his life. She hadn't seen him this determined since his playing days. It was good that he was finding his way again, and bad that he had to slack in other areas to make it happen. She'd struggled with this when they were married but she'd always blamed it on football. Football was all-encompassing, it swallowed their lives. She'd been supportive back then, not realizing that Dylan had no idea how to balance life. She didn't find that out until he'd stopped playing. 
Put her in the lobby, there's toys. She bit back a long-suffering sigh. Dylan wasn't a bad guy, he was just wrapped up in himself. She thought after he left football the ego would leave too. It had, to a point. But there were still times when he made her want to pull his hair out. Male pattern baldness might take him down another notch. Then again, this was Dylan she was talking about. She can't stay out there unattended. She'll be supervised, you're in the building. Petra shuddered at the amount of neglect her daughter probably suffered when she was at Dylan's. However, Taya had come home unharmed and in good spirits after each visit. She and Dylan had different parenting styles, neither was right nor wrong. Even if his felt wrong. At least Taya was past the stage where she stuck everything she found in her mouth. That had been a heart attack waiting to happen. It's still against policy to bring your kids to work. She grit her teeth. How many times would she have to tell him? Well, it's better than getting run over in the parking lot at the dealership. At least with you she's off the road. Petra glanced at the clock. He wasn't going to budge and she had to get a move on or she'd be late. She made a mental note to make a real note in her phone when she had a chance. Documenting the times he was late or didn't show would give her a stronger case when they met with the mediator again. Partners? Ha! <laughs> what about your mom? she asked. He needed practice looking for a solution that didn't involve her. She watched Taya twice last week when I went out. Went out, yes, there was an accusation in her voice and she didn't care. Dylan. I've met someone, came his soft reply. She's a school teacher with two kids and she's just amazing. The soft worship in his tone brought Petra to a stunned halt. Is it serious? She did an internal scan, checking to see if she cared about the answer with more than concern for how this would affect Taya. Nope. No jealousy there. Phew. It's getting there. I can hardly stand to be away from her. Are you kidding me? She wanted to scream. So you're ditching Taya? No. He was properly offended. Good. I'd take her with me. Evie has two daughters and Taya is right between them in age. They get along really well. Petra rubbed her forehead wondering why she hadn't heard about these playdates from her daughter or from her ex before now. I'm happy for you. Thanks. I knew you would be. You're really sweet. She bit her lip to keep her sarcasm from seeping out. If she hadn't learned that little trick, their divorce would have been pretty nasty. One of them had to be the adult and take the high road. So, about today, he prompted. I'll try my mom but if she can't, you'll have to figure something else out. Your mom will jump at the chance to take Taya for some princess time. I'm sure she will. And Taya would have a new princess outfit to show for it. It wasn't that Petra didn't appreciate her mother for spoiling Taya, it was that she wished she could be the one to spoil her. She said, Goodbye, and hung up with Dylan. As she headed for the kitchen, she dialed her mom. Look! I made breakfast. Taya knelt on a chair at the table, a half cup of milk spreading across the tabletop and a full box of cereal sprinkled about the floor. You sure did. Petra grinned as she reached for a kitchen towel and just laid it across the puddle. It could soak up the mess while she found the broom. Was it delicious? Yep. Taya's grin lit up the room. Petra bathed in her sunshine. Her daughter was worth all the headaches Dylan brought into her life. Hello, said her mom in her ear. Petra shook herself and remembered why she was calling. Just as Dylan predicted, 
Mom was ecstatic for the chance to spend time with her granddaughter and arrangements were made in no time flat. Petra would pick up Taya after work at her parents' house. It would mean a longer drive home and would cut into her time for her second job but at least she'd know Taya was safe, and someone was watching her. She said, goodbye, to her mom, slid her phone into the front pocket of her scrub top and reached for the milky towel. You're going with grandma after school today, she informed Taya. Taya threw both arms over her head. Can we play nail salon? Her daughter's idea of playing included filling up the massaging footbath and splashing in the bubbles. You'll have to ask grandma. Go grab your backpack and let's get going. Okay. Taya threw her plastic bowl into the sink, showering the backdrop with cocoa-colored milk, and ran off to her room. Petra rinsed out the towel and used it to wipe down the tiles. She had a few minutes while Taya looked for her backpack and shoes so she set her phone to read her messages to her. She could really use a chance to vent her sarcasm into the world. Ali Abdullah Brahman, the sovereign ruler of Aninka Stanza, had written back, his tone urgent. Or, maybe that was just the British narrator's voice that read it through the speaker. My dear Petra. The situation with my brother's, half-sister's cousin has escalated. I have uncovered a super-secret plot to have the family assassinated, including me. Please send $1,000 US dollars so I can get out of the country and escape her tyranny. My very life may depend on your assistance. Sincerely, Ali Abdullah Brahman, sovereign ruler of Aninka Stanza. Petra smiled, already feeling better about life. She clicked on the talk-to-text feature and replied. Dear Prince Ali Abdullah Brahman, sovereign ruler of Aninka Stanza. I'm so sorry to hear your life's in danger. That's the pits. And, I'm extra sorry the cake recipe didn't soften her heart towards you. Perhaps, and hear me out on this, perhaps she isn't a fan of vanilla. I mean, if I was a chocolate lover and planning to kill someone and they offered me vanilla cake, I'd still go through with it. But, a chocolate strawberry shortcake? We're talking forgiveness on a fork right there. Try the chocolate and keep me posted. Sincerely, Petra. I'm ready, Taya announced from the front door. Petra groaned. She needed some quality time with her laptop if she was going to make minimum wage this month. She closed the app and headed for the front door. Let's get going. Taya ran ahead of her to the car and she hit the button to unlock the doors. The school was a block away and she pulled into the carpool lane. With a kiss and an I love you, Taya trotted off, joining up with a couple of friends. Petra breathed a sigh of relief. Those first days of having to drop her off and drive away without seeing her get all the way into the building had shredded her mama's heart. Even today, she scanned the playground for any bullies or nefarious characters before forcing herself to pull away from the curb. Her older sister, mother of two, swore it got easier as they got older but first grade was a killer. She made it to work with all of three minutes to tuck her purse into a cupboard and wash her hands. Her first patient, Mrs. Clark, was already waiting in room one. Morning Mrs. Clark, how's life in the corporate world? She pulled on a pair of gloves and retrieved a tray of tools. Mrs. Clark wore her signature pencil skirt and suit jacket with a soft blouse underneath. She ran the local paper. Boring. How are things with the Baron von Blod? Petra smiled. That was one cyber case she'd wrapped up nicely. Well, he didn't raise the funds he needed to help the victims of the tsunami that took out half of East Germany. Mrs. Clark scoffed. Where do they come up with these things? Petra pressed the foot pedal and the chair leaned back. She laid a bib over Mrs. Clark's chest. I think they make them outlandish on purpose. The people who actually respond to the crazy offer or charity are the gullible ones. 
Except for you. Thanks. Petra slipped her mask into place. Do you want the massage feature on? Their new chairs had built-in heat and massage. The patients loved it. Please. Mrs. Clark clasped her hands over her stomach. Who are you irritating these days? She laughed good-naturedly, hopefully, she was annoying these guys. If he hadn't before, then the prince would surely blow a gasket over the chocolate cake response she'd sent this morning. Just once, she'd like to be there when these guys opened her messages. She brought Mrs. Clark up to date as she scraped plaque off her molars. Her thoughts soon turned to Brad and she couldn't help but share a little about him. But then there's this other guy. I keep thinking he's going to ask for my credit card number or something, but he doesn't. Wa oese say? Petra rinsed off a tooth and sucked up the water. He's just nice. And kind of flirty. Ee could ee for real. I guess, but how many people are real online? I don't know this guy from Adam. Mrs. Clark said something Petra couldn't make out. She suctioned her mouth and then waited for the woman to repeat herself. My brother met his wife online and my secretary has been dating a guy for six months she met on a dating site. Petra twisted her mouth. Mrs. Clark took in her disbelief and pressed her point. Meeting online is the way to go these days. It fits your schedule, it's only there when you want to deal with it, and you don't ever have to go past chatting unless you're ready. Petra held up her tools, indicating she wanted to get back to work. Mrs. Clark obliged and Petra continued talking. I read an article about online dating. It said that 49 million people have tried it and 17% of marriages have started online. I don't know that I buy it though. Petra's phone buzzed in her pocket. They both paused. Mrs. Clark stared at the outline of Petra's phone in her front pocket. Are you going to answer that? It could be Mr. Wright. Petra laughed off her comment. It could be the prince too. I don't answer when I'm at work. Her patient settled deeper into the chair. Fine. But if it were me, I'd be open to more than a few flirty texts. You're young and beautiful, you should be kissing a dozen guys and flirting with a dozen more. Petra's cheeks warmed as Brad's profile pic flashed in her head. She may have studied it a little last night. The model was gorgeous. He had great lips too. If Petra was going to fantasize about kissing someone, it would be someone that looked like him. He was the type of man a woman could swoon over, if she was the swooning type. Her phone was burning a hole in her pocket. The text could have been from anyone. It could have been her mother for the love of Pete, and she was half drowning in curiosity to find out if it was Brad or not. Mrs. Clark checked out, no cavities. Petra's next two cleanings crawled by and it was all she could do not to run to the bathroom and check her phone. Finally, her lunch break came and she ducked into the supply closet clutching her phone to her chest. Her breaths came and went in quick huffs. Brad, what do you think? He'd attached a picture of the same model with a haircut. She squinted, trying to see the Photoshop hack marks. If he doctored the picture, he did a good job. The background was different and he had on a red shirt instead of a blue one. His head was even turned a little more to the right. Okay, she'd spent much too long staring at his old picture if she could pick all that out. She typed her reply. Not bad for a stock photo. Wink? He sent back a laughing emoji. How's work? She paused. Continuing this conversation was insane. She should cut ties with him and move on to her next scammer. But there was something so real about Brad that she believed she could hurt his feelings if she brushed him off. 
Besides, the experience at the car dealership showed her that she needed to take a minute for herself every now and again. Brad was fun. She needed fun in her life. Good. I had an elderly patient who was scared spitless, pun intended, and I was able to help him relax and get a good cleaning. Brad, sounds like you made a difference for him. Petra, call me Super Scraper. Brad, isn't oral health tied to heart disease? You're a lifesaver. Petra, flattery will get you everywhere. She was used to men pandering to her, telling her she was beautiful and loved and special, anything to get into her wallet. She didn't want that from Brad. What did you do today? Study up on gum disease? Brad, that, and I got a haircut too. Petra, that's all you did? Brad, I worked out, answered emails, did a jigsaw puzzle and helped my buddy pick out a pool. Petra, how many pools did he have to choose from? Brad, 14. Petra, no wonder he needed help. Brad, he went with egg-shaped, in case you were wondering. Petra, I wasn't. I mean, is there really any other option? A laughing emoji popped up. You're funny. I know. She grinned, biting her bottom lip. The door flew open and she hid her phone like a 13-year-old. Maddie. What do you need? Heat rose up her neck and made its way to her hairline. Maddie lifted one eyebrow. I'm out of gloves. Petra reached to the side and plucked a package off the shelf. Here. Maddie took the package, her eyebrows still up. You going to stay in here all day? Petra smiled, tipping her head. I'll just be a minute. Okay. The door clicked shut behind her. Petra whipped out her phone. Lunch break is over. He sent back a waving hand. She held her phone to her chest for a minute before putting it in her pocket and rearranging her face. Somehow, it had gotten into a dopey, star-eyed girl shape. Which was silly because she couldn't crush on a guy she'd never met before, Johnny Depp and Zac Efron excluded. That night, before she fell asleep, she reread their texts. If they did meet, and she wasn't saying she was open to that in any way. But if they did, and they had this much chemistry, she'd have a hard time walking away. Which is why they couldn't meet. She had responsibilities. With Dylan bringing a new woman into Taya's life, she needed to be all the more stable. It didn't matter that her heart fluttered like butterfly wings at the thought of Brad's hand on the small of her back or cheek or in her hair. She was the responsible one. With that, she flopped over on her side and squeezed her eyes shut. Chapter 6 How was your vacation? Brad stretched his long legs in front of him, the heels of his Nikes hitting the gold line in Doc's carpet. Good. Relaxing. Doc looked like a lobster just coming out of the steam. His face was bright red, all the way up to his hairline. There was this aura of heat radiating from him that kept Brad on the other side of the room. He might very well be radioactive. So, the beach, right? Doc grimaced as he shifted in his seat. Right. If his back was as red as his face, wearing a shirt had to be killing him. He sat an inch away from the back of his chair. Hopefully he wore swim trunks and not a speedo. Brad smirked at the image. He had a hard time picturing his counselor as fun. Doc flipped through the yellow legal pad he used to take notes of their meetings. Were you able to make progress with your special project while I was gone? Special project, there was a title. Petra's funny, tough, pretty. Wait, Doc held up a hand. I thought you were going to look into her situation. 
cyberstalk from a distance. What exactly have you been doing? Brad's hand protectively covered his phone in his pocket. Texting, mostly. I bought her a car battery. Doc leaned back in surprise, yelped, and sat straight. I'm sorry, you what? Brad spilled it all. Everything from the first contact where she'd unloaded her troubles to the last three days full of texts that brightened his existence. There was no sense holding back from Doc, he was here to help Brad get over the mental roadblocks. And, he was the only person on the planet who knew the backstory. Any player worth his salt kept these issues close to his chest. Revealing bad cards would only mess with his chances of a bigger salary or worse, get him traded. Yes, Doc worked for the Titans but his client-doctor confidentiality policy was unflappable. Whatever Brad said in this office stayed in this office. I'm getting to know her, Brad explained. Really? Really? So she knows you're Brad DeGrand? Yees. He drew out the word. Doc waited, his fingers steepled. Okay, she knows my name and everything but she has no idea I'm a titan or that, you know? He slumped. Do you think that's fair to her? He studied the gold stripe in the carpet, his shoulders pulled forward. His not answering was his answer. Let me ask you this, are you holding back from telling her to protect her or to protect yourself? He ran his hand over his face. Both. She doesn't want to talk about football. In fact, she made it part of the whole deal. No football or she cuts off communication. Sounds like she has some unresolved issues. He nodded because. Yeah, who doesn't? And you're protecting yourself because? Doc was going to make Brad spell it out. Brad was no stranger to honesty, not here anyway. He drew in a breath, lifting his chest. Her texts are the best part of my day. She makes me laugh and smile and lifts my spirits with just a few words. I see. Brad brought his chin up. What do you see? You're becoming attached, or you may already be attached. Brad scoffed. I don't do attachment. Not with women you date. But, this one is different. Have you met her in person? No. Doc tapped his fingertips together. Do you plan to? It was Brad's turn to shift around in his seat. Ah, Doc's eyes brightened. You want to but something's holding you back. Could it be that you're afraid of losing her if she knew the real you? Brad lurched to his feet, propelled there by the dart of truth that hit his conscience. I like her, okay? She's interesting and she makes me think of more than the past. Doc got up much slower. So what are you going to do about it? He could always count on Doc calling him out on his crap. I don't know. He deflated. Nothing. Does that make me a coward? Doc capped his pen. It's common for someone in the early stages of a relationship to falter, there's a lot of feeling your way along in the dark. This isn't a relationship? Isn't it? How often are you in contact during the day? Brad ducked. Six or eight times. More like ten to twenty if he caught Petra on her lunch break. Doc shook his head. I talk to my wife four or five times a day, and that's if she calls to ask me where we're meeting for dinner. But your relationship is in the new stage. Courtships are fraught with constant contact. I'm not courting her. Brad dug his fingers into his hair and fell back onto the couch. Doc looked meaningfully at Brad's newly tamed mane. As if a guy getting a haircut meant he was trying to impress a woman. So what if he had been trying to impress Petra? Doc also sat and waited. 
It would be bad to court her, right? I mean, I messed up her life. I have no right to make a play for her, not after what I did. If you had met her in another way, if you'd gone to her place of business and shaken hands three weeks ago, having no history, would you ask her out? That was a no-brainer. Brad nodded. Doc checked his watch. I want you to think on that for a while. We'll meet up again in a couple weeks. They shook hands and Brad left. He didn't have to think about Doc's question. He already knew the answer. If Petra hadn't been in his past, then he'd make her a part of his future in a snap. But, she was wrapped up in that fateful day and he couldn't unwrap her, no matter how much he wanted to. Maybe meeting her now, liking her as much as he did, was karma coming to bite him in the butt. He deserved it. And he'd take it. Because seeing how amazing she was and not being able to have her for his own was sweet torture. And he was a master at punishing himself. Chapter 7 It would just be for a few days, maybe a week. Petra stared at Dylan. He'd taken Taya for a daddy-daughter dinner and walked her to the door, asking to speak to Petra in private. She'd sent Taya off to take a shower. Disney? Her stomach churned at the thought. The crowds. Dylan's lack of helicopter attention to their energetic almost six-year-old. With Evie and her kids. She blinked several times as the information downloaded and processed. Wow, that's a family vacation. Are you two engaged? Not that he had to tell her these things, but a heads up would have been nice. Not yet. He tugged at his tie. The trip is her way of testing the waters. We'll be in separate rooms. Taya will stay with me. And Evie is bringing her girls. If it goes well, then I plan to propose right after we get back. Petra took in the confident slant to his shoulders. You already bought the ring, didn't you? He smiled, his cheeks wrinkling. You know me, when I see something I want. You go full steam ahead. She finished for him. That trait had been romantic when it was Petra he pursued, or football, but he had a tendency to spend money with that same mindset, not caring about credit limits. Yet another benefit to being single. If only she'd seen the warning signs before they'd said I do. The trade-off was that she had Taya so it wasn't like she could regret the time she'd given Dylan, not completely. She could wander off. She sticks to Amber like glue. The two of them are peas in a pod. Amber was Evie's oldest daughter. Or so Taya had informed Petra once she started digging for information. Two grades ahead of Taya, Amber played soccer and had a boyfriend. This made her a superstar in Taya's eyes. She knows more princess songs than you do, prodded Dylan. She shifted her feet and cocked her head. Taya would give her nail polish collection to meet Cinderella or Belle in person. Brad's cheeks twitched. No doubt could sense her resolve faltering. Technically, he didn't have to ask her permission to take Taya since he was entitled to two weeks out of every year. The fact that he had asked, meant he was trying to be considerate. Trying and succeeding. She gave him some points for that one. Her heart was torn. She'd always wanted to take Taya on a princess mecca to the theme park, but she wasn't in a financial place to book the trip. If she said no, then her daughter would miss out on an amazing experience. If she said yes, then Taya would experience it without her. She hugged her arms around her body. Life stunk sometimes. The timing of his trip couldn't be worse. She actually had days off thanks to Dr. Payne's Paris getaway and had been looking forward to some major supermom moments. She wanted to go to the indoor water park. 
Taya had been asking to go for over six months, ever since she saw that darn commercial of the mom and daughter going down slides together. It would have made Petra's credit card situation worse, but the memories would be worth it, right? She grabbed a hold of her selfish side and wrestled it into submission. Okay. He leaned as if he hadn't heard her right. Okay? His eyebrows climbed his forehead. Yeah, okay. She can go. I'll help her pack. Dylan's smile grew. Thanks, Petra. She held up a palm. Don't say it. I know I'm the best. You are. You really are. Dylan gave her upper arm a squeeze and then let himself out. Petra hung her head. Dylan had been through a lot, they both had. Because she's been married to him, everything he'd gone through after the accident, she'd gone through too. No, she didn't have the pain of a broken elbow or the rehab to make it work again. The pain she'd experienced was physical, her heart had slowly shattered with the realization that they weren't meant to be together. She'd thought Dylan's had too. Apparently, he'd been able to put his back together quicker than she had since he was already ready to jump back into marriage. But then again, why wouldn't he be? He'd gotten all the best out of her. She'd been so proud of her husband. It was natural that he'd want that again. She got Taya out of the shower and busied herself getting ready for bed. Her eyes didn't need to focus on anything which was good because old memories and new thoughts floated around her like heavy clouds. Her mother once asked if she'd done everything in her power to salvage her marriage. Her first reaction was anger, of course she had. But when she really took time to examine herself, she realized her tank was empty. She'd poured herself into Dylan and their family and found that there was no love left inside of her for him. Their differences were too big. Even before the accident, she'd been worried about them. The broken elbow threw a spotlight on the issues they'd both swept under the rug. She wasn't right for him either. He needed someone less driven, more chill. Her conscience was clear. That was the day she decided to file for divorce. She wasn't upset at Dylan for finding someone to love. In a weird way, she was proud of him for being mature enough to want a family. Maybe the reason she couldn't get comfortable in bed wasn't because her ex had moved on, it was because she hadn't. The restlessness came because she hadn't chosen a new road to travel. She'd stopped moving ahead, spread her feet apart, and planted herself right there in the middle of the intersection. She was jealous of Dylan's ability to cruise on and she didn't like that about herself. Smashing her pillow over her head, she let out a scream. She wasn't even dating. A relationship would take effort. She checked her tank again and found that it was half full. She didn't have much to give someone but then again, she might not want to. Her first marriage had been heavily one-sided. If she got married again, she'd need a man who put just as much time into them as she did, maybe more in the beginning. Her thoughts bounced to Brad. He messaged her more often than she messaged him. And he made her smile. She sat up and threw the covers off. She couldn't date Brad. He'd thrown a lame pickup line at her on social media. Although, with Taya leaving town for a few days, this would be a good time to meet him in person. No! Her brain screamed. Think! You don't meet up with strangers. Brad wasn't really a stranger anymore. They spent so much time chatting that they practically spent their days together. She started counting backwards from a thousand hoping that she'd fall asleep before she reached one. This whole thing would make more sense in the morning. Petra? I have great news. Petra paused in the hallway at work, her gloved hands out in front of her. What's that, 
she asked Kelly, the office manager. Her chest swelled with hope. Maybe the doctor had cancelled his Paris vacation and she wouldn't have to eat freeze-dried noodles for dinner this week. Kelly held up a finger. First of all, I want you to know that I heard your concerns about not working for a week, and I appreciate you feeling like you can talk to me about those types of things. Petra smiled. If Kelly didn't hurry, her patient's teeth would glow in the dark. She was only supposed to leave the whitening agent on for 20 minutes and they were pushing 19. So, I called a temp agency and they have a gig that will last a few days. After that, you can earn some hour here by deep cleaning the office, Kelly bounced on the balls of her feet. Petra swallowed. Deep cleaning the office was fine, but temp work? What's the gig? Oh. Kelly laughed like she couldn't believe she forgot to tell her. It's for a catering business. Apparently they're doing an auction for the Texas Titans. Day one is setting up tables and chairs and training, day two is serving the meal, which will be in the evening. Day three is a breakfast. I can't remember what she said but that one is outdoors. I need to know if you're in. She clicked the top of her pen. Petra glanced at the timer hooked to her pocket. She was out of time and frankly out of options. Her credit card bill would come any day now. I'm in. Great. Wendy's going too, if you want to carpool. Kelly wrote down Petra's name in the S column on her pad of paper. I have a few more girls to talk to so there might be more of you. Sounds like fun. It didn't. She'd waited tables in high school. It was hard work that left your feet aching and your triceps sore. But, she wasn't above digging her hands in and working hard for a paycheck. If she needed to wait tables then she'd wait tables. She hurried into the room and rinsed the whitening agent off her patient's teeth. They were several shades lighter but still darkened with age. I think we could try another round, if you're interested, Bev. Bev smiled into the handheld mirror, turning her face from side to side. The mouth guard that held her lips out and away gave her a clear view of every nook and cranny. I can't believe it. Petra smiled. She loved seeing patients happy with her work. I look ten years younger. Well, her teeth did. Maybe once they took the whitening tryout for a second time she'd be able to see the years melt away. Bev nodded. Let's go again and see if we can get another five years. Petra giggled. You got it. As she painted on the paste, her phone vibrated in her pocket. She couldn't pull it out while working on Bev. Her leg bounced and she had to force herself to focus on teeth and not wonder what Brad's message said. Because it was Brad. She knew it all the way down to her padded running shoes. Finally, she had everything just right. She touched Bev on the shoulder to get her attention. She was watching a rerun of the middle on the screen that hung from the ceiling. I'm going to duck out while that sets. Enjoy your show. Bev nodded in response. Petra slapped off the plastic gloves and dug out her phone. Her heart jumped at the sight of his profile picture on her screen. She stared at him for an extra second, her breathing shallow. She was stupid to think she wasn't falling for this guy, a guy she'd never met. Which meant she was doing exactly what she'd cautioned every girl in the office against doing. She was falling for an online scammer. Well, Brad wasn't the suave, silver-tongued scammer she would tell her friends to run away from. He was sometimes awkward and mostly funny. Brad, how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon? That was random. And, he could have googled the question. But she kind of loved that he asked her. Three, I think. Why? Brad, I'm making salad dressing. 
Can't find my tablespoon. Petra's lips tugged up. This was his third attempt at salad dressing this week. He'd send a picture of the ranch and she wouldn't have left it out for wild dogs. Give it up and buy some hidden valley. Brad, never. This is my Everest. I will conquer the salad dressing and then I'm moving on to barbecue sauce. Petra, snort. You're determined. Brad, ignoring snort. Yes, I'm determined. Determined to take you to lunch. How about it? Petra's heart stopped beating. There was the creepy invitation from the stalker, except it wasn't sinister or frightening. It was sweet and a little on the smooth side and not unexpected. They'd been messaging for three weeks now and had fantastic chemistry, an invitation wasn't a surprise. She closed her eyes and the image of her in the middle of a four-way intersection popped into her head. She had to make an effort to move forward. Had to. If she stayed where she was, she'd start to wither. The holding pattern had been enough to re-establish herself, to feel safe. But, it wasn't enough to build a life on. Squeaky footsteps on the tile floor had her eyes flying open. Kelly grinned as she came down the hall. Here's the contact info for your temp job and the schedule. She handed her a half sheet of paper. Petra looked down at it. She'd been blocked out for afternoons and evenings, the opposite of her schedule at the dental office. It would have been a problem if Taya was in town but since she was going off to a magical land where princesses truly exist, Petra could stay here and be Cinderella. Looks great. Good. I'm glad we're all set. I've got to deliver these to the other girls. Kelly hurried off. Wait. Petra called after her, a little too loudly for their tight-quartered office. Kelly turned, her eyebrows pinched. Yeah, thanks for putting this together. You went above and beyond the call. The pinch disappeared and Kelly's face lit up. My pleasure. She squeaked her way into room four. Petra blew out a breath and her attention turned back to her phone. Looks like I'm booked for the next little bit. Brad, boyfriend? What if I said yes? She'd wondered about this situation. A lot of people cheated online with someone, emotional affairs were common on social media. Maybe Brad was the type of guy that preyed on lonely divorcees who were vulnerable because their ex-husbands were getting engaged. Not that she was one of those women. Brad, then I'd bow out gracefully. Was there any better answer? Brad was quickly becoming the man of her dreams. The idea was scary and yet, it made moving on seem doable. And what if I said no? Brad, well, I am determined. She giggled. No smiling face. Brad, good. Want to go to lunch? She laughed. Yes, but I'm working lunch and dinner shifts for the next few days. Ask again? Brad, IDK. U plus rejection equals scary. Petra, trust plus strangers equals scary. Brad. Ha! <laughs> I'm the least scary guy I know. She couldn't help but tease him. Says the cyber stalker to his next victim. Brad, hey, you started all this. I did not. Brad, did too. If you hadn't been so entertaining and fun, I would have walked away weeks ago. You drew me in like a spider with a fly. This time she snorted out loud. He wasn't going to turn this on her. He was also kidding and she knew it. It's your profile pic. I can't get enough of that stock photo. A moment later a picture came through of the same guy making a peace sign. Then another with him grinning. And a third with him shaking a bottle of homemade salad dressing. 
Her hand flew to her mouth. She yanked her phone up to her nose and stared at the clock in the background. The time was accurate. That was really him? She'd totally made fun of that picture for weeks. Brad, have I stunned you speechless with my good looks? Petra blinked. She couldn't let him get away with that. With a wicked smile she typed. Sorry. I was distracted by a video of a puppy eating ice cream. Have you seen that one? Brad. Oof. She laughed. All right. You're gorgeous. Is that better? Brad, much. I'm off to buy a new suit for a work thing. See ya. Petra scrolled back up to the pictures, her mouth going dry at his huge muscles and square jaw. Holly Molly. He looked amazing in the polo shirt but a suit? She could only imagine, and imagining was making her whole body heat up. She needed a picture of that. Petra, if you need help deciding which one, let me know. I'm pretty good at spending other people's money. Brad, will do. The timer beeped. Petra dropped her phone into her pocket. Where had the time gone? When she was texting Brad, she was in a whole other world. And his picture was truth, that was, huge. A guy like that would have no reason to use a false picture, but still. She expected someone, not amazing to look at. Okay, Bev, let's see what we have here. Her hands shook as she started the water syringe. She told him honesty wasn't an option and he'd exceeded her expectations and soothed her worries over walking down a new road. In no time, she had Bev's teeth sparkling. Well. She brandished the hand mirror in front of Bev's face. Bev bounced in her seat. I love it. I love it so much. Petra grinned as she took the mirror back. I'm so glad. They turned out beautiful. Now, you might have some sensitivity to cold and you'll want to use this soft bristle toothbrush for the next week or so. She handed over a small gift bag full of supplies. There's a care card in there with instructions. If you have any questions please feel free to call the office. She walked Bev to the front door, a happy feeling in her heart. Bev did look younger. The teeth whitening had done the trick. Or, perhaps it was the huge smile on her face. Either way, Petra had played a part in it and that felt amazing. Her pocket buzzed. She pulled out her phone, keeping it below counter level so no one would see her texting. Brad had sent a picture of himself in a tux. Her knees went weak and she leaned against the desk for support. In the background was a man with a tape measure slung around his neck who didn't look too happy that Brad was taking pics. Brad was smiling, his eyes not quite looking into the camera. He was probably looking at the button to take the picture. His hair was nicely trimmed, a little longer than the guys she used to date but styles were different now. Gag. That made her sound so old. Wendy leaned over to glance at the screen, her shock of pink hair taking up Petra's peripheral vision. Wow. Yeah, wow. Petra sucked air through her teeth. She sent back a thumbs up. Buy it. Brad sent back a smiley face. Kelly glanced up at her. Are you dating him? Petra panicked. What was the answer to that? She spent most of her free minutes with Brad and even some that weren't really free. Defining a relationship like theirs was difficult at best. She'd call him a friend but she didn't have a clue where he lived. She'd call him a boyfriend but they hadn't so much as held hands. No. We just talk online. Can I date him? Petra snatched up her phone and held it to her chest. Kelly burst into giggles. 
I'm teasing. But judging by your reaction, one of us had better start dating him. He's too hot to leave on the market for long. Does it make you wonder what's wrong with him? asked Petra. She bit her lip. The question was hypocritical and cynical and she knew it. Just because a person was online and looking for love, or something, didn't mean that something was wrong with him. Wendy guffawed. You would think that. Yes. Something is wrong with him. Petra's nose wrinkled. She braced herself for the inevitable explanation that Brad was a player or married or a boozer who wanted to live on her couch for free. Wendy flipped her short hair off her face. Everyone has something wrong with them. Everyone. If you're waiting for the perfect man, then you're going to be alone for eternity. The fear trickled out of Petra like a slow draining sink. She nodded in agreement. You're right. No man is perfect. But is it too much to ask that a man be perfect for me? She paused as the ideas formed in her head and she worked to put them into words. He could have flaws. I could live with a guy who didn't wipe down the glass shower door or use coasters. Someone who failed at making salad dressing wouldn't be horrible. Her cheeks warmed at the reference to Brad. Wendy wouldn't get it but the fact that she'd included that factoid said her subconscious was rooting for the guy. The office phone rang and Wendy reached for it without looking away, allowing Petra time to sum up her point. Just so long as he isn't some football fanatic, I'll be okay. I hope you find him. Wendy winked and pulled the phone to her ear. Dr. Payne Dental, how may I help you? Petra hurried to her next appointment. As much as she'd love to stand around discussing Brad and the possibilities of Brad all day long, she had work to do. And if she had a spare minute? She was going to order a poster-sized picture of him in that tux. Chapter 8 I'll take it. Brad pulled the jacket off and handed it to the attendant behind him. The measuring tape around his neck swung from side as he hung that jacket and began dusting off invisible lint. But it's the first one you tried on, protested Lion Henry. He was a second-string receiver for the Titans and would be the call-in if any of the guys couldn't make the big bachelor auction. Every year the team joined forces with a local charity to raise money for a good cause. This year the money was going to help foster kids. Part of Brad's contract with the team was that he'd do appearances at different events with the kids and sometimes with the execs. Every three months so it made sense to include him in the lineup. Although, he wasn't keen on the idea of auctioning off a date as he had been before. But then, when they'd first asked, he didn't have Petra. The other bachelors, Dax, Ryder, Chaz, and Max were on the offensive line. He didn't know them as well as he knew the defensive players. Chaz was chill. He hoped he'd get to hang with him. It would be nice if London was going to be there but he'd gotten married as was officially off the market. Come to think of it, London's wife was the MC for the Titans auction last year. The two of them had been high school sweethearts and lost touch. Being together on stage had set things in motion for them to get back together. Maybe the auction would hold some of the same kind of luck for Brad. Yeah, and maybe I'll grow another two inches. If he had his way, he'd send Lion in his place right now and track down Petra. She'd sort of said yes, to lunch and, with a little more work on his part, she might just say yes. Lion's eyebrows came together creating a fierce look. He said when he was a baby, he came out looking like a lion and the name stuck. When he lowered his brow, the resemblance was easy to see. Dude, I can't decide that fast. He glanced down at the blue tux he'd put on that showed too much ankle. He'd asked Brad to show him the ins and outs of tux shopping seeing as how this was the first time he was going to shell out some major cash for a suit. 
He'd been in the NFL, always second string, for two seasons now. With any luck, he'd get some playing time next year and his career would finally take off. Brad owned three tuxes already. Two of them didn't fit because he'd added another 15 pounds of muscle last season. He could have had them altered, but he'd eventually fit that size again and it was just easier to buy a new one. Lyon stepped up on the raised platform so the attendant could let down the hem on one leg. Brad checked his phone to see if Petra had texted again. He did that a lot lately. It was easier to go back and forth when she wasn't at work. He tried, he really tried not to bother her during the day but she was so darn cute, he couldn't help himself. Besides, she gave him a hard time and for some dumb reason, that made him feel special. Who's the chick? Brad's head came up. What? Lion jutted his chin towards the phone. You're grinning like an idiot. Who is she? He pocketed his phone. No one. Come on. Brad rolled his eyes. Still, maybe he was blowing this interest in Petra out of proportion. He had a great life, full of family and friends, and yet, all he could think about was Petra's next joke, or sarcasm, or the way she'd called him gorgeous. He glanced in the mirror as if he could verify her words with a look. He wasn't ugly, he knew that, but women could be as attracted to an ugly man with a lot of money as they could a good-looking guy. He huffed at himself. Rich people problems, he thought degradingly. His mom would make him move the railroad ties in the backyard from the east to the west fence if she caught him thinking like that. After a quick internal debate, he pulled his phone back out and brought up Petra's profile picture. She's pretty, Lion admitted. Uh... Stunning is more like it. Is it serious? He snorted and immediately thought of Petra. She was the one who got him doing that. We haven't even met. We just chat. But you want her. Brad pressed his lips together. The phrase was much too simple to encompass all that he felt and desired when it came to Petra. He liked her. A lot. He also craved her. Not her body, she was cute in all her pictures but there was more to the attraction than that. She filled a huge void in his life. One that he'd had his back to until she showed up. He couldn't even think about who she was or what he'd done to her. If he did, then all that they were doing, all the flirting and the laughing, would fade away. He pushed all the past to the back of his head and threw dirt over it as fast as possible. I guess you could say that. So ask her out. I did. She's busy this week. Lion's face clouded over. Is she stringing you along? No, he paused. He didn't think so. Then again, he was the one who sent the first text almost every day. Maybe she was too nice to tell him to go away. There was also her online job. She'd explained how she pestered scammers to keep them away from innocent people with huge hearts. Was that what she was doing with him? Did she think he was an internet weirdo? This whole thing could be hugely one-sided. If that was the case, then why would she agree to go out with him? She didn't, came a small voice. She put him off with just enough hope to keep him coming back. He cursed under his breath. Lion took in his scowl. Look. You deserve a great woman. If she's not it, then cut the bait and recast. Lion fingered the sleeve of his jacket. What do you think? Brad forced his mind away from Petra and onto the navy fabric. It's a box suit. You can buy one of those anywhere. He bit off the rest of his response when he heard his tone. Lion had been defending him and ticked him off at the same time. 
They spent another 45 minutes looking at five more suits. The attendant was the epitome of patience with Lion. Much more so than Brad. Every suit Lion dissed meant the longer Brad had to wait to text Petra. Finally. Finally. Lion made a decision on a tux and they parted ways with a fist bump. Brad landed behind the steering wheel. A soft puff of leather scent greeted him. He breathed it in, trying to calm his racing heart. He knew what he had to do, but it could mean the end of everything with Petra. And then where would he be? He wouldn't be any closer to making her life better like he'd wanted to do when he started out. And he certainly hadn't made restitution for the trouble he'd brought into her life. The problem with the whole situation was that his heart was mixed up in things, not just his conscience. If she turned him away for good, he'd feel lost, adrift in a world where he was just starting to feel like he'd found a good fit. Suck it up, he muttered as he tapped on the icon. Hey, I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable by asking you out. If you want to meet, let me know. If you think I'm a weirdo creep like the scammers you take down, I'll leave you alone. I'm really not a bad guy though. Okay, that sounded needy but he didn't care. He was needy. I like you. You make me smile and forget the bad things in my life. When something happens, you're the first one I want to tell. I hope that counts for something. He hit send and then reread the message six times while he waited for her reply. His heart stumbled when the three dots began to fade in and out. Petra, I must be crazy because I like you too. Yes. Brad punched the top of the car. Then he typed out his exclamation. Petra sent back a smiley face. Brad, so, now that that's established what's next? He'd let her call the shots if she wanted. He wasn't going to push her any faster than she was comfortable going. He would be happy to jump right to exclusively dating status, but he had a feeling she'd be a little hesitant, and since it was kind of his fault, because he'd messed with her first husband's dream, he pulled back his assertiveness. Petra, I guess lunch, in a public place so you don't have to worry about me taking advantage of you. He laughed. If only she knew. Sounds great. Tomorrow? Petra, I'm working. I think I have time on Friday. He scrambled to find a place where they could meet. Los Tios was the first restaurant to come to mind. The Mexican food was dang good. However, it was a popular hangout for Titans and he wasn't ready to blow his cover quite yet. If she asks, he promised himself. He picked a chain restaurant, nothing too special but Italian so it was likely she'd enjoy it. She agreed and he texted, goodbye, driving home with a huge grin on his face. He just had to get through the bachelor auction and then he'd see Petra, in person, for the first time. His blood tingled at the thought. Chapter 9 Are you insane? asked Maddie. Petra held up both her hands, each one carrying several silverware and napkin bundles. I totally deserve that. Especially since last year she'd followed Maddie to a bar to meet the man she'd been dating online. Turned out the guy was an accountant and more boring than broccoli. Petra beat him in an arm wrestle at the table. It wasn't her finest moment but still, you can never be too careful. Maddie shook her head, her ponytail flipping back and forth. You know what they say about payback, right? Hey, if I wasn't there, you'd have spent the whole night researching matching calculators, and you hate math. Maddie pouted out her lip. He was going to do my taxes for free. Petra laid the silverware across the salad plate which was stacked atop the dinner plate. They'd switch out the smaller plates for ones containing actual salad once the guests were seated. Because Wendy had experience in food service, 
she'd been assigned to make salad plates and didn't get to hang out with Petra and Maddie. Of course, Wendy's tattoo-covered skin may have been a reason they wanted her in the back. Wendy was the sweetest girl on the planet but she looked like a motorcycle gang leader. A few of the other girls from the office had other jobs throughout the kitchen and dining room. Petra and Maddie had lucked out getting an assignment together. At the front of the room, a blonde woman with more grace than an angel was setting up the head table where the bachelors were going to eat. Petra felt for them, on display like that. She hoped they had good table manners because every eye in this place would be trained on them for the duration of the evening. Fate was funny. Had Dylan pursued a football career, she'd be the one at the spa getting ready for a night in an evening gown. Instead, she was in a pair of black slacks and a black button-up shirt and her comfortable shoes setting the tables. Conversation dropped off as they distributed the rest of the place settings. Since she and Maddie had worked together for so long, they fell into a rhythm and managed to stay out of one another's way as well as move fast. When the rolling cart was empty, they headed back to the kitchen for their next assignment. The cart clanked noisily along the tiled floor making conversation difficult. Oh, there you are, said the caterer's assistant. He lifted his chin, looking down on them as if they had been slacking off. The man's nose was so high in the air he sniffed airplane exhaust. Petra decided to give him the benefit of the doubt that maybe temps he'd worked with in the past weren't that interested in working hard. The place settings are done, Maddie chirped. She gave Petra a look that said he's just like an angry patient. Petra widened her smile. What would you like us to do next? He let out a long-suffering sigh and pointed to a large box on the floor. Those are the paddles for the auction. There needs to be one by each place setting, and they should be in numerical order. He put his hand to his earpiece and his eyes unfocused. I'll be right there, he told whoever was on the line. Can you two handle this on your own? No, because we're brainless women who can't do a thing without a man there to oversee them. Of course, Petra ground out. Maddie elbowed her in the side. She grunted. We've got this, she added brighter. He eyed them for a moment, not quite believing them. His phone beeped and he hustled away. Why don't you arm wrestle him? Maddie asked as they each picked up a side of the box and set it on the cart to wheel back to the dining room. Set it up. I'd love to take him down. They laughed and some of the tension Mr. Busy had started began to evaporate. They made it to the carpeted ballroom and flipped open the box to dig for the number 001 paddle. So what changed your mind about meeting this guy? Maddie found number 004 and number 006 and set them aside. He's handsome, nice. And, she took a deep breath, lifting her chest, Dylan is engaged. What? Maddie slapped her with a paddle. You're finally having a rebound fling? No. It's not like that at all. I swear. It just got me thinking that maybe it was time to put myself out there. Maddie nodded. Petra placed the first three paddles next to three plates and went back to the box. It wasn't organized. Whomever cleaned up after last year's auction must have thrown them in. Probably to get back at Mr. Busy. Okay, fine. You want to put yourself out there. I'm all for that. But, you are the one who has the whole office scared spitless to join a dating app. I know. Petra hung her head. She preached more about online safety than any person she knew. Your second job is protecting people from online predators. I know. You send emails to the whole office with news articles and then tell us how the victim could have avoided the whole thing if he or she hadn't agreed to meet up with someone they met online. I know. Petra buried her face in her hands. 
Everything Maddie said was spot on and ratcheted up her guiltometer. Maddie's shoulders dropped. You're still going to meet up with him, aren't you? Probably, she moused. At least tell me it's not at the end of wharf at midnight or behind the Walmart at 3 a.m. Oh my gosh. I am not that dumb. Maddie leveled her with a look. Well, I thought you were smarter than to fall for some guy's smooth talk. Her face went from harsh to imploring in an instant. You're not in a great place right now, with Dylan and everything. Maybe you aren't thinking this through. That's all I've been doing. Petra grabbed the cart and shoved it to the next table. I can't stop thinking about him, about my decisions, about where I'm at in life. It's like I'm in some crazy movie where I can see disaster coming but I can't stop it. Don't follow the sound of chainsaws into the basement. Yeah, except there's no chainsaws. My danger needle is all the way to zero. And yet you're still not sure about this. No, she lifted her chin. But at some point I have to be brave. I guess. Maddie gave her a half hug. But I'm signing up for DallasSingles.com and you're going to stay out of it. Fine. She bit her lip. Please be safe. Maddie held her palm up. I'll follow all the rules. Promise. Mr. Busy Speed walked through the open double doors. Photographers are here. The salads are being assembled and you two are chatting. Petra held up paddle number 038. But we're already in the 30s. He groaned. You two are assigned tables 24 and 25 in the back. If you can't stop talking then I'll have to move you. Because we're 12, Petra mumbled. Maddie sucked in her lips to hide her smile. Thanks. We'll be done before the first guest arrives. I doubt that but you're all I've got. He flipped his head to the side to get his bangs off his forehead. Petra patted her pockets feeling sassy. I have a hairband if you need it. A what? He wrinkled his nose. She pulled out her extra elastic. We can put your hair up so you don't have to keep flipping it off your face like that. You're going to get whiplash, she teased. Really, this guy could use a smile. He glared. I don't need that. Put it away and go wash your hands before you touch anything. With a stomp of his foot, he was on his way out. Maddie giggled. Here. She held out a small container of hand sanitizer that she'd kept in her pocket. I doubt he'll bother us for the rest of the night. Petra used it and handed it back. I shouldn't have said anything. Not everybody gets my sense of humor. I was just trying to make him smile. You'll get him next time. She glanced back at the tables near the windows. Figures he'd stick us in the back of the room. What does that matter? Maddie wagged her eyebrows. I'd like to get a good look at the Titans on display. Ugh, you can have them. Hey, not all football players are like your ex. Besides, it's not like I could get too close to them. I just like to look at all their muscles. An image of Brad in a t-shirt, his muscles straining the fabric came to mind. Petra shrugged. No amount of muscle is worth the ego these guys come with, trust me, I know. Hey, it doesn't cost anything to look at the merchandise. Ew. These are people. Maddie laughed. Come on, I'll start at number 200 and go backwards. Maybe we'll make more progress that way. They dug into the box with renewed determination to finish before the official start of the evening. She glanced once more at the head table where the football stars would soon take their place. Her life may not have turned out the way she planned, but that was okay. 
She had made her life into something to be proud of, she had a beautiful daughter, and she wasn't at the mercy of a football schedule. The tables would soon fill with hopeful ladies and Petra would cheer them on in their bidding without one ounce of jealousy. Chapter 10 Brad ended up being the first player to arrive. Which was ironic considering he didn't want to be there in the first place. He waded through the photographers, feeling out of place without a date on his arm. Usually, for appearances like this, his agent would set him up with a career-minded woman. And by career-minded he meant she was an actress interested in furthering her career by being on his arm. He'd long ago come to understand that what they wanted from him had nothing to do with him, and everything to do with his position on the field and the jersey on his back. That was okay. He had to take it as part of the job or he'd go nuts thinking about it. He was met at the doors by a woman in a silver dress. She smiled easily, as if escorting football players was all in a day's work. Thank goodness she wasn't one of those giggling types. He never knew quite what to do with those women. Hopefully the woman who won his date tonight wouldn't be a giggler. He settled into his seat and was quickly joined by Chaz Chaz Description Dollar. They shook hands. Good to see you, man. You too. What have you been up to? They spent a few minutes catching up on the off-season. The team scattered after the final game. Some to be with their families in other states. Some to Europe giving their wives or girlfriends much-needed attention. Others, mostly the single guys, stayed in Dallas. While they talked, the room began to fill. Women in all colored gowns walked in front of the stage, waving, smiling, winking. Brad's neck grew warm under the attention. Kind of makes you wish you had on a helmet, doesn't it? He joked with Chaz. Are they this brazen at games? Chaz blinked and looked quickly away as one woman bent over to pick up her dropped auction paddle, revealing more of her private life than either man cared to know about. If they are, we don't see it. All I see is football. Chaz nodded. Max and Dax were next to arrive. Just before the lady in the silver dress announced the MC, Ryder came in. His eyes were locked on someone in the back of the room. Brad squinted, a flash of familiar hair being flipped catching his eye. He half rose out of his seat. It couldn't be. Petra, he breathed her name like a prayer from a starving man's lips. That was her. He'd stared at her profile picture for, well, cumulatively, hours. Chaz looked at him out of the corner of his eye. Did you say something? Just then, Ryder jumped up from the table and took off. The room went silent as he had a quick word with the silver dress lady and then bolted. Brad exchanged looks with his fellow titans. What was that? asked Max. Ryder shrugged. Out of the corner of his eye, Brad saw Petra headed for the door the servers used to bring out trays of food. She had an oval tray tucked under her arm and a determined step. He got up and moved to intercept her, the need to talk to her overwhelming his senses and his good sense. He'd march right into the kitchen if needed just to see her smile in person. He'd had this voice in his head for that was rich and soulful. The desire to hear his name on her lips grew with each beat of his racing heart. Somewhere in the euphoric haze of seeing her, came the thought that he was at an auction for football players. He'd need to explain that, soon. Silver dress lady stepped in front of him. She held up a palm. Can you please retake your seat? We're about to start the bidding. I'll only be a minute. I just need to talk to someone. Please. I'm already short a bachelor. She rubbed her forehead. This hasn't happened before. I could lose my contract with the Titans. It's my business. And this is for the children. 
Her blue eyes pleaded with him to understand. Aww. Crap. She had to bring the kids into it. Guilt, his old nemesis. This woman could rival his mom in sending him on a guilt trip. He assured her he would wait out the bidding and play nice for the rest of the night. She needn't worry about him running off. He sat down and drummed his fingers on the table, the steak dinner churning in his gut. What would Petra do when she heard his name announced? There was a problem with being half honest, the other half could get him into some real trouble. Chapter 11 Mr. Busy had stayed out of Petra's hair for the salad and main courses but he was all instructions when it came to the dessert. The chocolate dollop should be at nine o'clock. Got it? Yep. She lifted the full tray over her shoulder and above her head. Half the servers carried them on their hips but Petra had perfected the proper form long ago and enjoyed showing it off in front of the know-it-all. Her arm was going to scream at her in the morning but his blank look of surprise was so worth it. She watched her steps on the way out. Karma would love to trip her up and send the food crashing around her right about now. Scarlet something or other was at the microphone, welcoming the guests. She was a big Hollywood actress full of grace and a sexy voice. Bodies shifted in anticipation of the bidding wars that were sure to come. The chocolate mousse in a white chocolate egg filled the whole room with the scent of chocolate. No doubt, this only added to the women's desire for a romantic valentine's with one of the beefy guys up front. Petra had done well keeping her eyes off of them. She had no interest in them or their preening. And now, you lucky ladies, we have a real gentleman for you to bid on. Will you welcome to the stage, the Titans cornerback? Excuse me, Petra leaned over the shoulder of a woman in a white sequined gown to set down the plate. And, ladies, I have it on good authority that Brad likes to make his own salad dressing. That factoid managed to break through Petra's concentration. Her feet didn't move with the same rhythm, her mind having caught the announced name and tripped right over it. She managed to salvage her tray before losing a hundred dollars worth of chocolate art and turned to stare up at the stage. The lights were so bright she had to squint. It was him. It was her Brad. Their eyes met for a brief moment across the long room and her whole body went numb and froze in place. Brad's attention was taken when Scarlet placed her hand on his arm and asked him his specialty. He leaned into the mic and said, I make a mean ranch. Better than Hidden Valley. Petra dropped plates in front of guests in record time and ran back into the kitchen just as the first bid, $10,000, came up. She had no desire to know what Brad sold for, there were so many other questions running through her mind. I'm so stupid. She berated herself as the kitchen staff reloaded her tray. Maddie sidestepped up to her. What? Petra quickly explained what was going on. Maddie ran to the door and listened for a moment. She craned her neck to see the guy on the stage. It's him. I know it's him. He saw me. Maddie rubbed her hands together, this could be a good thing. A chance encounter is much less stressful than a first date. Maddie, she hissed. He's a titan. Maddie's lips formed into a small O, well, at least he's not an axe murderer. She grinned. Uh, uh. I don't do football players. She scrubbed her face. This is a mess. I can't talk to him. Good, said Mr. Busy who appeared at her elbow, a wicked gleam in his eye. Because you're taking up their dessert. Petra's mouth dropped open. You can't make me. I can fire you and you'll be out of a job for the rest of the week. He grinned over his clipboard. Oh how she wanted to take out her hair elastic and flip it in his smug little face. Fine. 
she yanked the newly filled tray out of the prep cook's hands. The woman glared in return. Make sure you smile, Mr. Busy held the door open for her. She grimaced and moved towards the front of the room, feeling Brad's eyes on her. Dropping the chocolate egg on him would bring some satisfaction even though Mr. Busy would know she did it on purpose. She set the first dessert in the empty spot on the end. Ryder had been there earlier but he ran out, along with a woman from the back of the room. If Petra was the type to care about gossip, she could sell the story. She wasn't that bad off for money, yet. She continued to serve dessert, none of the players giving her any notice. Until she got to Brad. She did her best to keep her eyes down but she could feel his gaze like a caress on her cheek. Her knees wobbled. Strengthening them took all of her willpower. Her head was in a fog and when she finally made eye contact, the room, the spotlights, and the auction paddles all faded away. Petra, he said her name, his voice slow and gravely. Holy Hannah, if she could have picked any voice to go with that face and body, that would have been it. He was even better looking in person, of course wearing a tux could do that for a guy. Still, he smelled like expensive cologne with a hint of something that was all man. His milk chocolate eyes were so deep she almost fell into them. Almost. The organizer appeared and reached past Petra to tap Brad on the shoulder. Brad de Grand, I'd like you to meet your date for Valentine's Day, Miss Cynthia Silverspoon. Petra was pushed out of the way by the organizer, the spell Brad's gaze had cast breaking like a hard candy with a loud crack. Brad reached for her arm and managed to stop her from retreating. He ignored the organizer and the woman who had paid a large sum for his attention. Petra looked down at where his hand rested on her skin. She couldn't feel the point of contact but there was a current running between them. It was almost like, with his touch, he'd closed an electrical circuit and allowed the energy to flow. I'll be there tomorrow, he said low, please come. She stumbled back from him, her eyes wide. Her heart hammered. Her legs were ready to collapse at any moment. He let her go but didn't take his eyes off of her. She felt them all the way back to the kitchen where she fell against the counter. What did he say? Maddie demanded. He, he, Petra gulped. He wanted to make sure we were still on for lunch. Are you? Now that she was away from him and that crazy buzz that had gone through her receded, she could see clearer. I can't. He plays football. That's a deal killer. I've already told him that. At least hear him out. If you told him no football then he couldn't really tell you about this, could he? She waved her hand towards the dining room. Petra stood and tugged on her black shirt. The more she thought about the whole thing, the more angry she got. He shouldn't have let her get this deep when he knew she had rules. Why should I? Maddie softened. Because you've smiled more since you met him than you have the whole time I've known you. He's going out with another woman. It was Petra's turn to point to the door where they'd been serving people all night. People who paid more for this dinner than she made in a month. Once. And it's for charity. Petra's anger began to melt. Shazam he looked so good in a tux. She had shut him down about football in the beginning. He'd said he loved it and she'd flat out told him to knock it off. Still. This was big. If he knew her at all, he'd know how big. Not that she'd explained her past in great detail. Fine. I'll go. But only so I can explain why this won't work between us. It's better to break it off in person, doing it through a text would be the chicken way out. Hey! Mr. Busy snapped his fingers. Time to bus tables, you too. 
Petra and Maddie exchanged a look before heading back to the dining room. The moment she set foot on the floor, she could feel Brad's gaze, like he'd been watching the door for her. She lifted her empty tray up a titch higher to block him from her view and focused on getting the job done quickly. The sooner the guests were out of there the sooner she could go home and be away from those milk chocolate eyes that made her want to melt. Breaking it off was the right thing to do. She'd been open to taking things slow, figuring out if their friendship could be more, taking it to the next baby step. But, one look into those eyes and she'd lost all rational thought. And his touch? She'd never experienced anything like it before. Not even with Dylan. They'd had an attraction but nothing this overwhelming. The heady sensations and her heart palpitations showed her that she wasn't ready to handle a relationship yet. She just wasn't ready. And, the sooner she told Brad, the better. When she looked up to see if he was still at the table, she found his seat empty. Oh well, she'd have to wait until tomorrow. Maybe that was for the best. She could use the next twelve hours to shore up her nerve. Chapter 12 The Italian restaurant was empty for a Friday afternoon, a fact that Brad was grateful for even as he wondered if the food was bad. He was nervous enough meeting Petra without having a gaggle of fans watching. Or worse, filming him with their phones. He ran his hand down his face and checked the door for Petra. He was several minutes early. He had sat at home for as long as he could before bursting from the house. He had to know where he stood with this woman once and for all. Had to know if she knew the role he played in her life. Maybe she'd googled him last night. He ran his sweaty hands down his thighs to clean them off. The door opened, bringing in a burst of sunlight and Petra. He jumped to his feet, holding up an arm like a kid in grade school. Realizing that he looked ridiculous, he dropped his hand to his side and cleared his throat. She lifted her chin to let him know she'd seen him and made her way over. He pushed the salt and sugar shakers to the side of the table. She sat stiffly. You look beautiful, he said before he thought better of saying anything at all. She had her hair down in waves with a few curls around her face. Her eyes were outlined in black which made the blue in them pop. And her lips, he jerked his eyes away from her mouth. Better not to follow certain paths. She pressed her lips together. Today was void of all the heat and passion that had passed between them last night in only a few stolen moments. She put up walls, thick ones. He smiled and held out his hand. Hi, I'm Brad. It's nice to officially meet you. She eyed his hand as if it could bite her before slipping her palm against his. Petra. Her lashes brushed her cheeks and a swirl of chemistry breezed around and between them. She dropped his hand. Listen, I, he began at the same time she said, how come? They both stopped and motioned for the other to go first. She huffed. You first. He threaded his fingers together and leaned over the table, wanting to be closer to her and wanting to keep their conversation between the two of them. I play defense for the Texas Titans. Football is my life. That may be a sore point for her but he had to lay it all out there. Well, most of it anyway. He'd wait to see how she took this news before adding the rest. It always has been. My first toy was a football and my first word was hut. I'm sorry I didn't tell you that right off. I should have. She toyed with the napkin ring by her plate. I think I know why you didn't, but I want to hear it from you. Rule number one. She nodded. And, I was being selfish. He added. Her head came up. I enjoy our time together. It's nice to be with someone who didn't see the jersey. 
She tipped her head to the side, pondering his answer. Their server came giving them a break in conversation and they placed their drink and meal orders all at once. He took it as a good sign that she ordered food. That meant she was planning to stick around for a while. At least one meal. He'd take it. When they were alone again, he worked up his courage to ask the question that scared him most. Why do you hate football? She laughed uncomfortably. That's a long and twisted story. He splayed his hands out. I have all lunch. She took a breath, drawing her shoulders up around her ears and then dropping them quickly. I, uh, you know I was married. Yeah, crap. Here it comes. He leaned back, folding his arms and bracing for her to validify every guilty thought he'd ever had. My ex was a running back, on his way to the next level. I was a cheerleader when we met, if you can believe that. He nodded, he knew all this. But also, she had a pretty great body. I can believe it. Anyway, I quit the squad when we found out we were expecting a baby. Which meant that I lost my scholarship too. It wasn't supposed to be a big deal because he was going to make tons of money and I could go back to school, when our baby was in school full time. She unwrapped her napkin and laid it across her lap as if she was laying a burden there. Life doesn't always go as planned. My ex got hurt in a game and that was it. No more football for him. No signing bonus to put towards tuition. Life got real for us real fast. Brad almost choked on the words he'd longed to say. I'm so sorry. A bead of sweat went down his back. The word guilty may as well have been written across his forehead. Petra lifted a shoulder. The whole thing was kind of a blur. I don't remember much about that day specifically, except watching him get carted off the field. Dylan, my ex, went into a deep depression. It's common for athletes when they have that kind of injury. He'd freak out if a game was on. It was like, since he couldn't be a part of football, the sport should have died. He never spoke about what happened, not to me anyway. We just, stopped talking. Which was when I realized we didn't talk about the important things. Not before the accident, not after. She heaved a breath. So I cancelled the dish, took down the trophies and the pictures, and focused instead on our daughter, on the future. My mom and sister stepped in to help and it's been hard but worth it. It was as bad as Brad had feared. He'd ruined their lives. And you blame football, the team? Me? No, she scoffed. Football comes with a risk. We knew it going in, but you just never think it will happen to you. She gave him a sad smile. He said we weren't the same without football. I guess when our lives changed, we didn't know how to make things work, even on the poor level they'd worked before. Their food came and it took a moment to get situated and smile at the server. Brad was grateful for the reprieve, the chance to process the information and the emotion swirling inside. They took a few bites of the food before he worked up the nerve to keep talking. So, if you don't blame football, then why do you have rule number one? Because I like me better without it. You're going to have to explain that one to me. He relaxed a little, in his seat. The lasagna was spot on and the bread was warm and buttery. And, Petra hadn't screamed, thrown his drink in his face, or blamed him, or even football, for how her life turned out. The longer they talked, the easier it became and he hoped that they might be able to make this work. Petra chewed thoughtfully. The date was going better than she expected. She thought she'd be meeting a stranger but Brad wasn't a stranger to her. She knew he was going to ask her to explain her comment. 
Even though she was about to tromp all over his career choice, he would understand. That's how easy it was to talk to him except that she needed a moment to gather her thoughts. You're asking a question I know the answer to in my gut but my gut doesn't know any words. She smiled ruefully. And, I haven't really talked to anyone about this before. Not even your mom or sister? She'd told him about her family in texts and had mentioned them a moment ago, but it was oddly comfortable to have him ask. She shook her head as she took another small bite of food. We all went into survival mode. When I needed to rant, rave or scream at the heavens I went for a drive by myself. I don't let people see my crazy. He smirked. You should talk to a shrink. They love seeing crazy. She laughed. I'm sure they would. She eyed him thoughtfully as she took a sip of water. His eyes darted away and she knew, she just knew that he saw a shrink. Although what deep feelings he needed to get out she had no idea. She should have googled him but something in the act felt like spying or cheating in this whole getting to know you process. What was out there on the web about her was mostly from the accident and she'd avoided reading those articles then and wouldn't go back and read them now. The glass was cold and her fingers were wet from the condensation so she wiped them on her napkin. I think I can explain. When my life revolved around the game, the game took over my life. It dictated everything from when we visited family to what we ate for lunch. My social group was the team and their significant others and I always had to look the part of a future NFL player's girlfriend or wife. Now, I have a group of friends outside of football. Some of them are from church, some from work, and others from my childhood that I've reconnected with. I see my family about four times a week and I can eat this pasta without counting carbs. The best part is, my free time is mine. I can spend it fighting spammers and con artists while wearing pajamas and dirty hair. I like this no-pressure version of me and I don't want to go back to being so, selfish. She dropped her eyes to the table. The delicious meal had turned to cement in her stomach. She should have kept her mouth shut. Now Brad would not only think she thought he was selfish, he'd think she'd told him there was no future for the two of them. She wasn't sure how that would all work out but she wanted there to be a chance, no matter how slim of a chance it was for them to work through this bump in the road. Go figure that the first road she decided to take has bumps. And what exactly did she mean by working through this? She had no idea. It wasn't like she could ask Brad to quit his job and leave the league. He'd already made it plain that he'd been born and raised to play. Her back curved and she sank lower in her chair. Maybe this is hopeless. Brad's large hand covered hers, sending electrical currents up her arm. The hum was mesmerizing and dissolved the concrete block in her stomach much too easily. Not that she didn't have her doubts, they were there, like spots on a white shirt. It would take more than a simple touch to make them go away. A kiss? Well, that was all too much to contemplate right now. Too much happiness, too much anticipation, too much chemistry. She was barely dipping her toe into the world of dating again, was she ready to throw her lips in there as well? I'm sorry. She went to pull her hand away. Leading him on was a crap move and she didn't want anything to do with being the kind of woman who toyed with men's emotions. And men had them all right. She'd seen enough of them in her ex to know that they were just as real as women's hormones. Brad gently tightened his hold, keeping her hand in his. Maybe it doesn't have to be like that. Not with us. She stared down at his hands. So big. So capable. As she let the word us open above her head like an umbrella, protective, inclusive, beautiful. As much as her heart said jump. Her head cried proceed with caution. You can make big promises now because it's the off-season. 
Once the season begins, you belong to the Titans. No matter how much you want to be with me, they take first priority. And I get it. I do. It's the nature of the beast. Brad hooked a finger under her chin and lifted her face until their eyes met. I say we go for it anyway. He grinned wide, his white teeth so beautiful, his mouth the perfect size for kissing. She rolled her eyes. You would. Her words were sarcastic but she leaned closer, relishing the fact that he was fighting for her and not letting her push him away. He'd have to be strong because she was still learning and would probably pull back more than she pushed forward, at least at the beginning. She blinked realizing that she already thought of this as a beginning. He rubbed his thumb over her knuckles and she shivered pleasantly in response. Heaven help her, she was a goner. If he ever did decide to kiss her, her head would empty out and float away. Hey, his voice was low, husky, and darn right sexy. I think we have something special here and if we let it pass us by because of something that may or may not happen in the future, then we're acting out of fear, not faith. She turned her hand over under his. Are you a man of faith, Brad? His answer was important. Jesus had gotten her through her darkest days. She wanted a man who had turned his heart to God. She hadn't made that a priority in her first search for a husband and realized, too late, that kneeling together as a couple was essential to her. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. I prayed all night you wouldn't stand me up. His head cocked teasing, and yet the honesty of his answer rang through her heart. Truly, there wasn't much more he could have said that would have melted her wall to a level that made her comfortable enough to say, okay, we'll try this. But, I'm not making any promises. We're casually dating. Got it? Brad's cheeks twitched charmingly when he checked his smile. If you insist. She playfully smacked his arm. This one's on you. I'm amazing under pressure. She shook her head at his lack of modesty. His confidence was attractive though. There was a lot about him that was attractive. Sheesh. He was way too much man for her own good. Chapter 13 Brad parked his car in a small spot in front of Petra's condo. Whoever did the striping in the parking lot was not concerned about door dings. He was concerned. His car was one of the first things he'd bought when he signed with the Titans and he took good care of her. With a quick glance around to make sure no kids threw a baseball anywhere near his windshield, he jogged to Petra's door in an effort to get some of his nervous energy out. He couldn't remember a time when he'd been so tense picking up a date. He swiped a dab of moisture off his temple. Casual dating meant they could go out to dinner and a movie, hang out together, spend time getting to know one another, and basically move past just texting. So he'd asked her out and here he was, feeling awkward in his own body. His shirt rubbed his back, making him itch. His shoes felt too tight even thought they'd fit fine the day before. He slowed down as he neared her door, not wanting to break out in a full sweat. That wasn't the impression he wanted to give. She needed to think he was calm, collected, and confident over this whole casual dating thing. When in reality, he was jumpy and afraid he'd mess it up before they got back to his car. Petra was reluctant to date. He got that. People got burned and she'd been burned badly by her ex. He couldn't imagine giving his whole heart to someone, until death do you part and then have that person turn away. Granted, he wasn't judging Dylan Silverling. The man had faced Brad's worst nightmare and lived. He'd managed to pull his life back together after it all fell apart. That earned him Brad's respect more than anything else he could have done. The whole thing was a circle that always pointed back to Brad's decision on the field to hit Dylan with everything he had. 
Sure, he was supposed to take the guy out, but he'd lost control and pounded him into the ground. He wiped another drop of moisture away. He shouldn't be thinking about all of this. When he and Petra were at lunch, he'd managed to push the memories, all the guilt, to the back of his head. It was almost as if the story belonged to two other people, perhaps the couple sitting three tables away. Not him and Petra. They didn't have a past. They were brand new. He knocked on the door and stood back, waiting for her to answer. He didn't have to wait long before she was standing there, grinning up at him. Hey! Her tone was relaxed, her face void of the stress that had accompanied her to the restaurant yesterday. His shoulders went down in response. Hey, yourself! She motioned for him to come inside. I didn't know what shoes to wear. What do you have planned? Something extreme. He pumped his eyebrows, teasing her. So no heels? He glanced over her skinny jeans and black loose-fitting top with lace around the hem. The black was sophisticated, and the lace lovely. He mentally gave himself a shake. He wasn't the type of guy to think in terms of lovely. No heels. Okay, then. She headed down the short hallway. I'll be right back. He turned and found a wall full of pictures. Several different sized frames were hung in a nice pattern with inspirational sayings interspersed between them. Most of them had pictures of Petra and her daughter. Taya had Petra's brown hair and olive skin, but her eyes were a completely different shade of blue. Petra reappeared. Brad's eyes went right to her feet to see what she'd picked. She wore a black pair of suede zipper boots that came just above her ankle and had a half-inch heel. Perfect for what he had in mind. Instead of letting his eyes drift back up her delicious curves, he turned back to the picture wall. Taya got your good looks. Thank goodness, she joked. My ex's nose is worse than Ryan Seacrest's before his surgery. Brad widened his eyes. Ryan had plastic surgery? Inquiring minds want to know. She shoved him towards the door. Stop. I work in a dental office, we get all the trashy magazines. I'm in the know. She flipped her hair over her shoulder and shut the door behind them checking to see if it locked. Tell me more. About Ryan? No, he scoffed. About your job. He opened her door and they paused the conversation while she settled in and he went around to the driver's seat. Well, I fight plaque. She lifted an arm, showing off her muscles. Sounds dangerous. I'm dangerous with a water pick. She mimed shooting a gun and blowing on the barrel. And just like that, they fell into the easy banter they had while texting and his nerves evaporated in the Texas humidity. He followed the instructions on his GPS and soon they pulled into Zero Gravity Fun Park. He'd always wanted to come here but the opportunity hadn't presented itself until tonight. And, when he thought about a fun place to take Petra, somewhere that would let them both let loose, this was the first idea that popped into his head. She leaned forward, straining to see the top of the attractions through the windshield. Isn't this out of your contract? He nodded. Bungee jumping is for sure. But, the slingshot, isn't mentioned. He feigned innocence. I don't know how that slipped through the cracks. She laughed. You're shameless. He grabbed her hand. No, I'm excited. Her eye widened and she gripped his hand back for a moment before letting go so she could take off her seatbelt. He did the same and hurried around to open her door. The short walk was enough to make him doubt his decision. He'd get a kick out of the adrenaline rush, but maybe she wasn't a daredevil type. Are you sure you don't mind? 
She laughed easily. Are you kidding? I love this stuff. Give me a roller coaster that goes upside down and backwards and I'm in heaven. He grinned. That's what I'm talking about. Without thinking, he grabbed her hand and held on. She glanced down. Her brow crinkled. He was pushing her with the physical contact but it was as natural as playing catch to warm up, his muscle knew that they were doing, if he thought too hard about it, his head would get in the way. We're casually holding hands. No pressure. She nodded, her lips clamped together. He swung their hands between them like little kids do and she relaxed a fraction. He forced back the grain of doubt that rubbed at his thoughts. Just because she was somewhat reluctant didn't mean that she was ready to run home and lock herself in a tower. She was here and she was trying. He'd have to be patient with her. He knew all of that coming into the date, he just didn't realize how hard it was to be patient. Especially since they could talk so easily. He wished it all came that easy. An hour later they were seated at Los Tios, enjoying the in-house chips and salsa and great conversation. Since the cat was out of the bag about his football career, he didn't see any harm in going where the Titans were king. Petra rubbed her ear. You okay, he asked, concerned that something was wrong. Yeah, I just, this little girl screamed in my ear tonight and it's still ringing. He tickled her side, easy enough to do around the small table for two that barely had enough room to hold their chips and drinks. She giggled and scooted away. I did not scream like a little girl, he growled. She pulled out her phone. The video will speak the truth. He covered her screen with his hand. Curse the ride operator for offering her the freebie. The guy was flirting with her hardcore and more than happy to provide proof that her date had screamed. Which he hadn't. I yelled like a caveman. A manly caveman. She snorted, which he was extremely happy to find she did in person just as much as she did in text. But, she put her phone back in her purse. Fine. I'll watch it later. Because you'll miss me so much, he quipped. Bika, she started. Excuse me. A man with a mop of curly red hair interrupted. I'm sorry to interrupt, but my son is a huge fan. Do you mind? The kid held out a napkin and a pen. Brad glanced at Petra. She forced a smile, her eyes tight. Hadn't he thought that being recognized was a good idea, a way to work her into the football lifestyle? Casually, of course. One look at the boy's bright brown puppy dog eyes and Brad couldn't turn back. He put on his public face. No problem, what's your name? He only half listened to little Spencer talk about last season and his love for all things Titans. Brad's mind was on Petra and how she would take this pause in their evening. He'd hoped she'd realize that celebrity life wasn't as bad as she'd made it out to be in her head. Her face softened a fraction as he talked to Spencer. A fraction. He'd have liked to see it soften 100% but he'd take what he could get. There you go. He handed over the napkin and ruffled the kid's hair. The dad's face was full of gratitude. Thanks, man. He needed that. Brad smiled for real and the two went back to their table where the mom exclaimed over the napkin. He turned his attention back to Petra and apologized. Don't. She held up a palm. It's all part of the job, right? She quipped, lifting her chin. And, I'm a mom too. Her eyes misted over as she watched the boy sit up tall in his seat and shovel food away like it would disappear, if he didn't get to it first. A thousand thoughts flitted across her face and her eyes clouded and cleared and then became steel before she blinked away the tears that hadn't fallen, and turned back to him. 
Where were we? You were about to tell me about that. He circled his finger indicating her almost tears. She pushed a bite of enchilada across her plate with her fork. Taya's going to come home with all sorts of memories and I'm not a part of them. It's tricky. Because you want to be with her and Dylan? Maybe some part of her wished they were still a family. Maybe he was getting in the way of all that. He could, quite possibly, be the world's biggest jerk. Not the two of them. She gripped her fork in a fist. Not like you're thinking. It's triple-sided. I want to be the one to take her to the princesses because that's our thing. We play dress-up. We go to the movies. We have dance parties to the soundtracks. We're total girly girls. So this is a big moment in her life that she'll remember forever and I'm not a part of it. Suddenly Brad's thoughts cleared and he said, and he took it away from you. She sighed and released her grip on the fork. Not on purpose. He doesn't even know princesses are our thing. So it's good that he's supporting what she loves. But you want to be there. She lifted both her palms. I want to see her face when she meets Elsa. I get that. And I'm sorry. He reached out and trailed his fingers down her face, slowing time with the movement and contact. Thanks, she whispered. Would you like a refill? asked their server, hurtling time back to normal speeds. Brad was done with the crowds, he was ready to have Petra all to himself. I'm good. You? She smiled. Can I get a box? Sure, sweetheart. The twenty-something server trotted off. Brad reached for Petra's hand again. He couldn't help it. Their hands fit so well together and he liked being near her, with her. If I could pause this moment, I would. Her lips spread, the heaviness of the last few minutes lifting as she started to tease him again. This moment? Yeah, when we're sitting here waiting for a to-go box and the check. She was mocking him and he loved it. Yeah, this is a great moment. PFT. What? The moment when a woman buys me dinner is always a great moment. Her mouth dropped open and he couldn't hold back his laughter giving away the fact that he was baiting her. This is a problem. He wagged his finger between them. When I text you, you can't hear me laughing. I have a hard time keeping a straight face. Her hand went to his cheek. If she could reach him, then the tables really were small. I like your crooked face. She smiled, all innocence. He tickled her side again, loving the way her laugh washed over him. Their server returned and they went about the business of getting out of the restaurant and to the car. When they were seated and buckled in, he mustered up his courage. He was going to offer to extend their time together but it could backfire on him. She might have had enough. She might have had her fill of them and decided this wasn't worth the effort, even though it had hardly felt like an effort for him. With a clench of his gut, he turned to her and asked, Do you feel like going for a walk? She glanced up at him from lowered lashes. I'd like that. Well, all right then. Chapter 14 Petra had been on the walking paths at White Rock Lake before but never with a guy and most definitely not holding hands with said guy. The experience was, nice. Normal. Their measured steps and the beautiful scenery brought on a feeling of slowing life down. She could use more time like this, time to just be quiet and content. That was it. She was content. Sure, her daughter was thousands of miles away and things weren't perfect in her life, but at this moment, it was all okay. She gave Brad's hand a squeeze. 
he smiled down at her and directed them to an overlook. The sun was just going down and the water was on fire with light. The view was spectacular but all she could see was the man next to her. Brad was exactly like she'd expected him to be and yet, there were things about him that surprised her. Like the way he'd talked to Spencer at the restaurant. He hadn't talked down to the kid and he hadn't given him empty praise. He treated him like he was worth while to talk to and yet she knew it had cost Brad. He'd worried over her reaction and she couldn't blame him because, while she had kept her cool on the outside, her insides were flashing red and blue lights. They screamed this would be your life, no privacy. He belongs to the fans. He'll never be all yours. And all her fears rose to the surface like those icky-looking sticks and sludge that bumped against the shore every now and again. He picked up on her mood change but had been gracious to Spencer and his dad. She admired him for that at the same time she fought resenting it. She'd promised herself that she wouldn't come in second again. That the next time she got married, she would be her husband's top priority. It was the word married that had stomped her out of her own head. They were casually dating, this being their first date and already she was worried about the M-word. That was either crazy or ambitious. She went with crazy and dismissed her worries. As the sun continued to drop and the few clouds in the sky danced in a breeze that only they could ride, she was grateful she hadn't let her crazy take over. This moment with her hand in Brad's and being close enough that she could feel his body heat through her sleeve was worth the effort. They watched the sunset, felt the temperature cool, and still they stayed put. Petra leaned against him and let out a satisfied sigh. She didn't know him, not as well as she should to behave as if they were familiar, and yet, she knew him better than she knew most of the people in her life. She'd shared thoughts and feelings with him that she hadn't told her family. Do you come here a lot? she asked. He chuckled. And you thought my pickup line was bad. She giggled. It was so bad. I'm afraid the girls at the office think you don't have game. And yet, you're here. He released her hand and turned so he could place his hands on her hips. Who's got game now? His eyes dropped to her mouth and her heart skittered before picking up speed. He was going to kiss her. The air was thick with expectation and temptation. Her body became hyper-aware of his hands on her hips, like the point of contact was more sensitive than the rest of her. Or maybe it was more alive because of his touch. Heat built just below her belly button and her back arched without a conscious thought from her, lifting her face to him in invitation. With a jolt, she realized she wanted his kiss. She wanted to feel the intensity in his gaze course through her. Brad leaned down, his hand sliding to her lower back to bring her body flush with his. For a brief second, she thought about running away, about breaking contact with him and ripping open a hole in their bubble for the attraction to spill out so she could breathe normally. As it was, she couldn't get enough oxygen making her knees weak. He caressed her lips with his in one brief, gentlemanly entanglement. Petra gasped in pleasure as every nerve in her body tingled. Like a firework that bursts to life and then fades, she was left with this feeling of, ooh, but she wanted to, ah, too. Wrapping her hands around his neck, she brought her mouth up to his, closed her eyes, and gave herself over to the experience of soft booms followed by appreciative sighs and quiet exclamations of wonder. Brad returned her kisses, cautiously at first. He was trying not to push her too far but he didn't understand that she wanted his kiss. She wanted all of the relief that came after weeks of texting and falling for someone she couldn't touch, couldn't kiss. She wanted to let go, just for a minute, of having to be the responsible one in life. Adulting was necessary and draining. Brad's kiss filled her back up. 
The bucket she held at that crossroads, the one she'd filled halfway by playing it safe and surviving, filled to overflowing as he too stopped playing it safe. When she finally pulled back, gasping for air and yet feeling like she was made of the stuff, he kept her close. She ran her hands down his chest and leaned into him, taking a deep breath of his musky cologne. Her lips had a heartbeat and she was sure they were swollen but didn't care that evidence of their wild abandon was visible on her face. That was, Brad swallowed. Intense. She giggled. Come on. We should move on and let someone else use make out point for a while. Petra's cheeks flamed. This is not called make out point. He nodded seriously. Itis. All the kids who grew up in my old neighborhood knew about it. She hid behind her free hand. Do you bring all your dates here? He threw his head back and laughed. Just you, babe. She smacked his arm, his big, beefy arm. Her face warmed for a whole different reason. Are you making that up? Nope. He didn't crack a smile. Either he was getting better at keeping a poker face or it was true. She threw a look over her shoulder and saw another couple headed to the alcove. With a toss of her hair, she decided not to stress about being seen making out with Brad in a public park at dusk. Anyone who knew her wouldn't believe it. Speaking of casual dating, Brad hedged. Petra tensed. One great kissing session did not mean they had to jump to the next level. She couldn't take it if he pressed her to be more, not now. She needed time to process all that had happened tonight. Yes? His eyebrows pinched together creating two lines between them. I'd love to take you out for Valentine's Day but I'm obligated to the auction winner. She tripped over a lip in the grass and he helped steady her. Sorry. She brushed her hand down her shirt as if brushing off grass even though she hadn't gotten anywhere near the ground. Well, what are you doing for the date? She mentally rolled her eyes at her inability to act cool. She needed space but she wasn't exactly thrilled knowing Brad would be out with the five-foot-seven leggy blonde who had paid more money to spend an evening with him than Petra paid for her condo. That kind of thing gave a guy a big head. She has tickets to a gala at the Dallas Museum of Art. He tugged at his shirt and ducked his head. She wants to show me off. Petra laughed. He was so cute when he was uncomfortable. Who can blame her? She reached up and gave his huge arm a squeeze. Well, it's a good thing you're busy because I have plans. With who, he demanded, his face pulling back in shock. Relax, big guy. Taya and I watch Valentine specials and eat conversation hearts. Sounds like fun. Petra considered what a night at a gala would entail. Yes, the dress and makeup would be a blast but being arm candy wasn't all that fun. She'd been there several times as a cheerleader. People tended to look through you rather than at you. Her quiet evening at home sounded much better. It is. They reached the parking lot and he opened her door. What are you doing tomorrow? She chewed her lip as she wrapped her head around the idea that there was a tomorrow. Brad had a way of making her get lost in time. I'm working a breakfast and then I was going to catch up on laundry and a backlist of Hallmark movies. He shut her door, went around, and climbed in. A movie sounds good. Let's do that. Wait, what? Was he asking her out again or assuming they'd be together? She narrowed her eyes. She would not be trampled into a relationship she wasn't ready for. That pep talk she'd given herself when her hormones were on alert, about this just being a first date and all, had sounded good when she was craving kisses, but now, she wondered why every step forward felt like a leap of faith. It had to be because this was her first date after the divorce. 
Some women did rebound flings but she hadn't dared. She kept to herself and became a recluse. You said you wanted to see a movie. He lifted a shoulder. I said I was going to watch Hallmark at home. Do you have movie theater popcorn at home? Well, no. Because who needs that temptation in the pantry? It's not a movie without a half cup of butter, so, we gotta go. She shook her head at his logic but really, the idea of spending a night at home alone became less appealing the more time she spent with him. Still, that leap. He was already scrolling through movie times. Hey, Scarlet has a new one out. There's a showing at 1.30. That was tempting. She rarely got to see one of Scarlet's films in the theater because she usually had Taya in tow. To be able to go to a movie where people and forest animals weren't singing would be a treat. She was warming up to the idea but needed more convincing. The only people who see movies at 1.30 in the afternoon on weekdays are retired people. We'll be the youngest ones in the theater. I can make friends with anyone. He glanced down and the back up. I just bought us tickets. You're crazy. She leaned into the door, away from him. You know you want to say yes. I want to have clean underwear for next week. He scoffed. I'll buy you new underwear. Petra stared at him for a full ten seconds, letting the awkwardness grow and grow as he realized what he'd just said. A blush crept up his neck and then his cheeks. His eyes grew wide and his hand reached for the door latch. He shifted. I didn't mean that. She couldn't hold it back any longer and burst out laughing. Oh my gosh. You should have seen your face. She wrapped her arm across her stomach and leaned forward, her shoulders shaking. He wilted in his seat and rubbed his forehead. I did not mean to imply that I would take you underwear shopping. She swiped at the moisture in her eyes and gasped for a breath. I was more worried you were buying new underwear every week instead of washing it. He shook his head but a small smile tugged at his lips. So the movie? She took a deep breath. It was just a movie. The kiss was just a kiss. A date was just a date. All the right excuses came up but the one that hit home was the thought that Brad wanted to see her again. Brad was good. He was a nice guy and she'd be insane to run away from him. Sure. She settled back into her seat and he started the car. The morning shift with the caterer was much better than the auction, mostly because Mr. Busy didn't work the morning shift. The manager over the breakfast was a woman in her fifties who talked and hugged like a grandma but moved like the Energizer Bunny. Petra finished gathering the last of the plates and turned in her apron. With a quick change in the bathroom and a spritz of perfume to cover the smell of bacon and sausage, she was off to pick up Brad. He'd offered to come get her but his car was ostentatious and the last thing she needed was to draw attention at her temporary job. He spent the morning working out with his friend and fellow teammate, London Wilder, at a gym not far from the breakfast venue so she drove there to pick him up for the movie. She sent him a text, letting him know her ETA before pulling out of the parking lot. Her GPS told her she would be there in less than 20 minutes. She turned the radio up and blasted music she didn't listen to with Taya around through the speakers. Ruining her eardrums like a teenager and not caring. By the time she pulled up to the curb where Brad and London waited, she was rocking the minivan and feeling like a rebel. Brad's eyebrows went up, no doubt he could hear the bass from the other side of the window. She flashed him the rock-on sign and hit the unlock button. Music spilled out of the car and she turned the volume down enough to hear over. You need a ride, she asked London. He wore loose shorts with the Titan star just above the knee and a tight workout shirt. His whole persona screamed football player. 
I drove him here. London jerked his head towards Brad who was hesitating, the door hanging open as he scanned the interior of her car. His nose wrinkled. Sure there was a french fry on the floor and a car seat in the back but Petra didn't care. Such was her life. London punched Brad's shoulder. You're such a car snob. He bent down so Petra could see his face and extended his arm over the passenger seat. It's great to meet you. She shook his hand. You too. At this moment, she wished she'd followed the Titans enough that she could compliment him on a game or a play, because that's what football girlfriends did when they met the other players on the team. Not that she was a girlfriend. Her mind was a complete blank so she skimmed her eyes over him and felt stupid when the first compliment that popped in her head was, Nice deltoids. London saved her from blurting ridiculousness by grinning mischievously and saying, If you can put up with this guy for more than a movie, we should double sometime. Hey, Brad shoved him and London banged his shoulder into the doorframe making the whole van jolt. Petra's hands flew out to brace herself. No horseplay in the van, boys, she admonished them in her I'm the mom don't mess with me tone. Funny, she rarely used that tone with her daughter. She had a feeling that little boys would hear it often. Of course, little boys wouldn't knock her car across the parking lot. These two were the size of rodeo bulls. They dropped their hands immediately. Brad whistled as if he hadn't done a thing. London ducked his head and muttered an apology. She laughed at their antics. There was no way they were that sorry nor contrite. Get in, she motioned for Brad to climb into the passenger seat. If we get through this date, we'll set up a dinner or something, she said to London. Beautiful. Maya's touring since it's the off-season but we have some stopovers. Maybe the two of you could join us on location. He stepped back so Brad could shut the door, waved, and headed to the parking lot. As soon as the door closed, the vehicle filled with the fresh scent of soap and men's deodorant or body spray or whatever the guys wore these days. The aroma was foreign in her mom mobile and yet, enticing. She turned to get a good look at Brad and bust out laughing. His knees were practically up to his chest and his arm hung over the armrest, his fingers brushing the floor between their seats. His head scraped the ceiling. He'd scooted his bottom forward and curled his back. She snickered. Comfortable? He reached down in front and pulled the lever to scoot the chair all the way back. Had someone been in the rear seat, they would have lost a knee or maybe two. Why do you drive a clown car? She laughed. It's not a clown car. Normal people fit just fine. Normal-sized children maybe. Even above-average-sized children. She wrinkled her nose at him and pulled out of the parking lot and into traffic. He'd texted her the location of the theater the night before. She'd been there several times and knew the way. Seriously, you have one kid. Why not a nice sport utility vehicle? He placed his palm on the ceiling and glared at it. I may only have one kid but I haul a gaggle of children to playdates, birthday parties, and the occasional field trip. The extra seats come in handy. Besides, she winked, a minivan is a mom's ultimate accessory. She leaned her elbow on the door and her wrist over the wheel, gangsta style. And, I make this van look so good. She flashed him the peace sign earning a loud guffaw. I like this bad and bold side of you. He copied her posture. Is this a play date? She giggled. Do you want to play dress up and let me do your makeup? Um, no. Then it's probably just a date. She swung into the theater parking lot and hopped out. He frowned when she didn't wait for him to get her door. Sorry, I'm not used to someone getting my door when I drive. 
You probably have to unlatch a car seat, he speculated. Taya's past that stage. She can get herself out. But getting out of the car is still a process. She paused for just a moment. Getting in the car is a process. Going into the store is a process. Buying gas is a process. Going to the bath. She cut off, feeling as though she'd shared too much already. There was no reason to explain that she rarely sat down without Taya in her face, bathroom or not. It's not that I'm not grateful to have her. She tucked her hair behind her ear. Brad opened the door to the theater and the smell of fresh popcorn grabbed her by the nose and pulled her inside. I get it, he said. Kids are a lot of work. Thank you. She managed to keep up with his long strides as they headed for the concession stand. He ordered frozen mints and asked if she wanted anything. She'd eaten at the breakfast. The stuffed French toast was to die for. I'll just have some of yours. He paid quickly. The teenager behind the counter handed Brad back his card, his mouth hanging open. Petra got the sense that he recognized Brad and would be social media blasting this encounter before the previews started. Brad, oblivious to the hero worship going on right in front of him, slipped his hand into hers and laced their fingers together. Sweet. I like sharing. Sharing's good quality in a playdate partner. I earned high marks in preschool. Just so you know, I was top of the class in finger painting. Really? You'll have to show me your work sometime, she said seriously. Most of it is in a private collection, he quipped. Her insides got all gooey. Being here with Brad was fun. Just plain fun. And she couldn't remember the last time she'd had fun when she didn't still have to be the adult. They entered the theater and took a moment for their eyes to adjust to the lower lighting. Brad consulted his phone for their seat assignments and then motioned for her to climb the wide stairs first. Petra glanced around as they took their seats. There were five elderly couples sitting in front of them. They had all chosen seats that were closer to the bottom of the stairs. She was about to point out to Brad that they were, indeed, the youngest people in the theater when the surround sound kicked on and the lights dimmed. Petra settled back, content not to talk while the previews played. She loved seeing what movies were coming up. Brad continued to hold her hand, his palm warm against hers. His arm was also warm. Which was nice considering the chill in the theater when the central air kicked on. She made it through the first third of the movie before goosebumps broke out on her arms and she shivered. Are you cold? whispered Brad. A little, she confessed. He lifted their hands and pushed up the arm rest. Then he dropped her hand and put his arm around her shoulders, pulling her into him. She stiffened, not resting fully against him. Relax. I have more than enough body heat to spare. She poked his side. Are you bragging that you're hot? He chuckled, the sound deep in his chest. She felt it more than she heard it and her body relaxed as if it had recognized a voice. Is it working? he asked. She nestled into his side. There was more than enough room for her there because he was so muscly and just plain big and warm. He wasn't joking when he said he had body heat to spare. Soon, she was comfortable in all the right ways. A few minutes later, his arm went down to her back and he pulled her even tighter against him. She breathed in his scent, feeling heady and reckless. With a slight lift of her chin she could see his profile. She reached up and ran her fingers over his jaw. As if she'd flipped a switch, the room got warmer. The light coming from the screen might as well have been laced with electricity with the way her skin buzzed. Brad's breathing sped up and his chest lifted and fell under her hand. 
He turned and caught her gaze with his, his eyes full of heat and fire. She slid her hand into the hair at the back of his neck and pulled him down for a kiss. As his warm lips took control of hers, she was transported, no longer the mom with the minivan, she was an attractive woman who stirred passion in a man so hot he could have his own calendar. Bits of her old self had surfaced all week but this part of her, the part that had wanted to be a loving wife, had been buried for so long she thought her lost, Brad was able to revive her with a kiss. Just as she was about to turn the moment over to that desire, she yanked back and buried her face in his chest, shaking with fear. He wrapped her in his arms and held her close. Maybe he was afraid she'd run away. Maybe she would. The show was over five minutes later and they made their way out of the theater. Once they were on the sidewalk, Brad ran his hand through his hair. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get so intense. No, Petra placed her hand on his chest, feeling his heart beat strong beneath her palm. It wasn't you. He narrowed his eyes. If you give me the it's not you it's me speech right now, I'm going to dent your van. She burst out laughing. Just like that Brad had managed to diffuse all the frustration and the worry that had chased her out of that kiss. Well it is. She leaned her head on his chest, not wanting to run away but wanting to talk, as long as he was willing to listen. I have these moments when I'm with you that I forget about being a mom, about Taya. And it scares me. Oh. He made circles on her back with his palm. I used to be cool, you know? Confident. I could walk into a room and not be scared, I could flirt with guys and I was good at it. I'll bet. I lost a lot of that, a lot of me. But, she lifted her face and rested her chin on his chest so she was gazing up at him. He looked down at her, creating wrinkles around his chin. I've seen the old me this week and while that's fun, I'm not sure how to balance her with who I've become. He brushed a piece of hair over her shoulder. You are a different person to different people. We all are. I'm not the same with you as I am when I'm on the field. She giggled. Thank goodness. I don't want to be knocked down all the time. He smiled. And those guys don't want a kiss. He pressed his lips to her forehead, spreading tingles through her body. Let's hope not, she joked. He leaned down so he could whisper in her ear. I'm starving. Do you want a sandwich? She shoved him away, but she was smiling. He'd made her feel better. I bear my soul and you want deli meat. Well, I want something else. He lifted her hand to his lips and kissed her knuckles, never taking his eyes off her. Her skin flushed in every which place but I'll settle for a sandwich. There's a great shop down the street. She nodded, entranced by his stare. Good. He straightened and took her hand once again. Because someone ate all my mints. She covered her face with her free hand. She had eaten them all, right at the start of the movie when she was nervous about everything. Sorry. He tugged her along and they made it to the deli, ordering quickly since they were the only ones eating at 3 p.m. The small shop had four tables in the dining area. There were several office buildings close by and they probably thrived on takeout orders. They sat down at one of the tables away from the window. She wouldn't have thought anything of it if their last meal hadn't been interrupted by Spencer and his dad. Brad probably didn't think about it either, keeping to himself must be second nature at this point in his career. So, what do you do for fun, he asked once they had unwrapped their food. Who has time for fun, she picked up a pickle that had fallen on the crinkly paper wrapper and popped it in her mouth. Come on, you must do something on all those dates you go on. She lifted an eyebrow in disbelief. He mirrored her expression 
somehow adding sarcasm and a bit of mockery. She rolled her eyes. Okay, confession time. You're the first guy I've dated since the divorce. He dropped his sandwich with more drama than Taya could muster after staying up too late. What? No way. Way. He gulped and his face went pale. You mean to tell me that I'm the first guy you've kissed in over three years? He groaned. And I took you to make out point. I'm such an idiot. She laughed. Who said I hadn't kissed anyone? I only said I hadn't dated. Have you kissed someone? He leaned forward, hopeful. Which was weird because most guys would be jealous. She drew out the pause for maximum effect. No. He slumped in his chair. I've failed at wooing you. You should be wined and dined and I've given you a Mexican dinner, a movie, and a deli sandwich. He shook his head in disgust. You're being weird. I'm fine. She'd had a great time when they were together. Heck, she'd grocery shop with him and laugh her way down the aisles. The image of Brad pushing a shopping cart while she and Taya filled it was a compelling one and she had to mentally shake herself out of the daydream. He wiped off his fingers with a napkin and sat tall. Petra Silverling, would you do me the honor of accompanying me for a lovely dinner? She pressed her hand to her chest and gasped. Are you asking me out, like for reals? For reals, he echoed. Okay. When? She fished her phone out of her purse and pulled up the calendar. I'm working for the caterer Friday and Saturday so no can do those nights. He pouted. Sunday I teach a class at church for five and six-year-olds. Get out. She leveled him with a look. Has anyone said that since Back to the Future? Great Scott. I don't think so. He smirked. She laughed, her heart light. Why did he have to make being together so easy? If he could just be a jerk, in some little way, she could make an excuse to lock her heart away and be fine. Well, maybe not fine but she could go back to surviving instead of all this growing he continued to force upon her. With him, it didn't feel forced. Nothing was forced. Not conversation, not silence, not kissing. In fact, kissing was the most natural thing for them to do. They moved as if they'd been kissing their whole lives. Maybe waiting their whole lives to kiss one another would be a better description. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday I'm deep cleaning the office and then Thursday you have a date. She didn't like the taste of those words on her tongue and took a sip of her diet soda to wash it away. His phone buzzed and he glanced at it, a frown marring his beautiful face. He turned it off and flipped it over. You're free in the evenings after you clean aren't you? She was free. She also really wanted to ask what made him frown at his phone. Bad news? An ex-girlfriend? She refocused on their conversation. Taya will be home on Wednesday and Monday night I have a spa night with my mom, sister, and nieces. You guys really take this princess thing to heart, don't you? This time, she smirked at him. How else should we take it? Touché. Can I come? He wanted to meet her family. No way. Not yet. Meeting the family was a big deal. Plus, she'd like him to get to know Taya before she unleashed their relationship, whatever it was, on her parents. Family life was tricky. There was a balance of need to know and pertinent information. She hadn't told anyone she'd been on one date let alone two. They were going to freak out. Only if you enjoy a good charcoal mask, coconut oil hair treatments, and getting your nails painted. His twisted his lips. 
No thanks. That's what I thought. She patted his hand. She was actually glad he said no. Not just because she wasn't ready for that big step in introducing him to her family, but because she liked being the girl in the relationship. Some of her friends' husbands would highlight their hair and get manicures and her friends loved it. Her dad had always made himself scarce during girl time and gave the girls bathroom, a wide berth claiming he didn't need to know what all that stuff on the counter was for. She wasn't sure she could handle a guy who wanted to insert himself into the princess part of her life. Tuesday evening you're all mine, deal? She didn't even pause. Deal. Tuesday would be her last night as a single woman without responsibilities and she couldn't think of anyone in the state she'd rather spend it with. Besides, it had been far too long since she'd gotten all dressed up. She'd have to dig out her flat iron and really knock Brad's socks off. Chapter 15 Brad had been in plenty of locker rooms over the years but being backstage at a concert was a kick. Thanks for inviting me, he said to London. What he didn't say was that his mom had invited him home for the weekend. He'd been at lunch with Petra when the text came through and it almost spoiled his good mood. While he loved his mother, she could be intense. He never left her house without knots between his shoulder blades. It's good to have you. Things can get kind of crazy on the road. Brad nodded. He'd noticed. Screaming fans, mostly teenaged girls but the occasional full-grown male, had eyes for London's wife Maya. You know, when I said you could meet us at a venue, I meant you should bring a date. London drained a bottle of water. Sorry. Couldn't find anyone at the last minute. Brad tugged on his collar. The temperature in the green room was three degrees too warm for comfort. When Brad mentioned it, he was told that they did that on purpose to help Maya's voice stay warm. They couldn't have her throat going cold before she belted out a ballad for her adoring fans. And there were thousands of fans. She wasn't nervous. Heavens no. Across the Zoom, she casually answered questions, met the few lucky winners of a local radio station contest, and pretty much floated around as if she were on roller blades. He and London tucked themselves off to the side. This was his wife's show, her arena. As big as London was in the football world, he was just a blip on the screen for these people. It didn't seem to bother him though. He hung out and let Maya do her thing always being close enough to offer her a supportive smile or step in if a fan got too crazy. The way they worked their relationship, her taking football season off and him traveling with her for the off-season, was admirable. They made their marriage a priority. Brad took a big gulp from his water bottle. You're a jerk, you know that right? London ripped his eyes off his wife and glared at Brad. What did I do? You've got it all. He lifted his bottle and circled it through the air. You have the career, the girl, the whole bit. London lifted one side of his mouth in a corked grin. Yeah, I'm a total jerk. The pre-show band trooped in wearing coordinating clothing and looking like they stepped off a high fashion runway. Brad caught London's slight nod to the lead singer. I might have a solution to your problem, he told Brad. Brad's blood ran cold. I don't have a problem. You have a problem of being alone too much. Hey, London. The petite lead singer for Pineapple and the Three Tigers landed in front of them. She had dark brown hair, short and spiky. Her eyes were rimmed in black and purple makeup and she had on a t-shirt with a pineapple and beads paired with a black mini skirt. Even in her four-inch death trap heels, she barely came up to Brad's chest. She eyed Brad with interest. London said hello and introduced Brad. Pineapple, as she preferred to be called, shook his hand. 
I'm a huge Titans fan, have been my whole life. She licked her lips, slowly. The movement was supposed to be seductive or something but the meaning was lost on Brad. He couldn't help but compare her to Petra's easygoing smile and effortless beauty. Well, she obviously put time into her looks, but she didn't use them to her advantage. She was happy with no hidden agendas and that was the most beautiful thing about her. That's awesome. Brad smiled without showing any teeth. Well, I need more water. Do you guys want anything from the bar? asked London. Water for me, said Brad. He narrowed his eyes, silently telling London not to leave him alone with this woman. You sure you don't want something to help you? She trailed a finger up his arm, relax? I'm good. She sighed heavily. Water for me too. I can't drink until after the show. London nodded and took off doing exactly the opposite of what Brad had been telepathically telling him to do. So, Pineapple glanced around. What got you into football? He tucked his chin, readying the PR answer he'd given a hundred times. My mom. She cocked her head. There's more to it than that. He turned his full attention on her, like he would have a lineman he sensed was going to charge. What do you mean? When you say mom, there's grit in your tone. His eyebrows shot up. He scrambled to come up with an appropriate response. No way was he going to tell a stranger that his mom was a football mom in the worst sense of the word. What was the one thing people liked to talk about more than him? Themselves. There is a story there but it's boring. Her bottom lip pouted out. You know what would be an even better story? Telling the world that I met Pineapple backstage tonight. Can I get a selfie? He pulled his phone out of his back pocket. She brightened. I'll take it. Then I can brag about my friend Brad DeGrand. She held out her phone at the same time she snuggled up to his chest like the neighbor's cat who believed the world loved her. None of the warm feelings he'd gotten from being close to Petra surfaced. If anything, he had a strong desire to push her away and create distance between them. You're more like a backdrop. I can't get all of you in the frame. She giggled as she turned her phone sideways and stretched her arm as far out as it would go. I'll take it. He accepted her phone, careful not to make contact during the exchange. Putting it up in the air, he snapped the image. His face was long and out of proportion because of the angle but he didn't care. She didn't either because she looked great. London finally showed up with waters and passed them out. Brad gave him a you owe me look. He read it loud and clear. Sorry, pineapple. I'm going to have to steal Brad for a while. No problem. She cocked a hip. Message me sometime. With a wink, she was off to work the room. Brad waited until she was lost from sight before punching London. What the heck, man? London shrugged. Maya thought you might hit it off. She's really a nice girl. I think she was intimidated by you and copped an attitude. Besides, it's not like you're working that hard at dating. Minivan was the first woman I've seen you with outside of public appearances in over a year, and she's not here. She has a job and a kid. Brad growled. Besides dating shouldn't be work. It should be fun. Yeah. Well, you need more fun in your life. You're tight man, wound like a spring. I'm not saying I'm worried, because, you know, I'm a guy. But you're going to snap. Yeah, Brad rubbed his head. Is it Petra? Sort of, he hedged. You guys are really dating? Yeah, but? But she's too good for me. 
Brad blurted before he thought about his answer. The honesty of it surprised him. A man in black, wearing a headset came in and called Pineapple and her band to the stage. A general commotion broke out as people scattered off to do their jobs. Fans were herded out by security guards. Pineapple wiggled her fingers Brad's direction before disappearing in the swell leaving the room. Maya headed towards London, her eyes only on him. I've got to go to work, babe. Their gazes locked and there was a charge in the air. As much as Brad enjoyed those moments with Petra, being the third wheel was awkward at best. He headed towards a poster on the wall, showing the cityscape. Clicking a selfie, he sent it off to Petra with a text that read, Guess where I am. He hadn't told her he was leaving town. Hadn't even known it himself until this morning when his mom called to guilt him into coming over to the house. Some would say avoidance was a coward's way out. As a guy who often dodged a hit in order to make a play, he preferred to look at it as a strategic survival move. Thankfully, he dodged London's question about what was bugging him. Doc wouldn't have been that easy to get away from on any given day. They hadn't delved into his dating habits in his sessions. Now that London looked at it, he realized that he hadn't believed he deserved happiness if the Silverlings weren't happy. Who was he to fall in love and start a family when he'd ruined theirs? Maybe that was part of his motivation in seeing Petra laugh. He shook his head. No, enjoying her laughter and humor were purely selfish. Petra, L.A.? Brad felt his mood lift. You are good. Petra, it's not even that hard. He chuckled. Maya's manager cleared her throat, interrupting her in London's cuddle fest. Man, it would suck to have that job. Still, if Brad had the chance to hold Petra close, he'd take it. Too bad he had several days to get through until their next date. The plan was to woo her, slowly, and maybe give her a soft goodnight kiss. He wanted to her feel how special she was to him, wanted to show her that he cherished her. Can't wait to see you, he typed. She sent back a winky face. He'd take that. It was more than he deserved. He rubbed the back of his head where the hair was prickly. He enjoyed being with Petra, might even be falling for her. But, in the back of his head, was the fact that he was holding things back, hiding information. And why was he hiding it? Because he hoped that if she fell in love with him, she'd be able to look past what had happened, to forgive him, and they could live happily ever after. The last part of his plan was a dead giveaway that he was living in a fantasy. But, how, exactly, was he supposed to break out of it without losing everything? He wasn't quite sure on that one. So he'd taken the if she doesn't ask then I won't tell approach. Always a wonderful way to start off a relationship. London clapped him on the back. You look like you could use a distraction. Brad slipped his phone in his pocket. What do you say we rent jet skis tomorrow? London grinned. That sounds like a good distraction. Let's head out. I've got seats reserved on the right of the stage. In the crowd? Brad didn't like that idea. Crowds were unpredictable when it came to football players. They could be totally cool or there could be one son of a jack who thought he should try to take them down a notch. The last thing he needed was to end up in a brawl. Nah. It's next to the sound mixer. Sweet. Brad followed him through the maze of halls and around the stage crew busy at their jobs. Losing himself in the energy was better than facing his conscience. Chapter 16 Petra Brent, honey, don't kick Chelsea. Thank you. Petra smiled at the rambunctious five-year-old. Every week in Sunday school he did his best to bother Chelsea, a child's version of a crush. 
Hopefully, he'd grow out of his I want to annoy you but don't know why stage soon. Chelsea wasn't impressed. She was adorable in her brown mini pants suit with pink pinstripes and her hair pulled up in two messy buns. They looked like mini mouse ears and made Petra's stomach ache for missing Taya. Her daughter was usually in the class and she'd had to explain to the group of five why they were missing someone. Then she had to explain why she wasn't with Petra in Disneyland. An awkward moment at best. She had finally been able to move on to the actual lesson. Sitting on the floor with the children, she had a felt board leaned up against the wall. A hundred years ago, when her mom was a new mother, she had cut out a whole Bible's worth of scenery and stories. Thankfully, she hadn't thrown them away because the kids loved when Petra brought them to illustrate a prophet's story. She held up a felt David and Goliath. Can you see how big Goliath is compared to David? She placed the two of them on the board, their feet even so their heights could be compared. The image reminded her of how big Brad is compared to her. She tucked right into his side at the theater, like the space was made just for her. But, it's what you can't see when you look at David that helped him overcome Goliath. Do you know what that is? Rocks, shouted Brent. He has rocks in his pocket. She pressed her lips together to keep from laughing. Brent may have a lot of energy but it wasn't bad energy. He operated on a higher frequency. That's true. She managed to get out at an even tone. Rocks were involved in the process. What else? The kids sat in silence, staring at the pictures or the floor. Julie plucked at the lace on her dress. Finally, Petra answered her own question. Faith. His faith was bigger than Goliath. She put her hands out to the side, stretching them far apart. Bigger than a mountain. She picked up the mountain felt piece and put it next to Goliath. It towered over him. Because of his faith in God, he won the battle for all of Israel. Cooper's mouth hung open. That's scary. Her heart went out to the boy as he related to the little guy facing a giant. He was smaller than the other children, skinny even. And he didn't have the social graces to make life easier, but he was the one who stayed behind to help clean up every week. He'd get there, he just needed some love which Petra was happy to share. Petra paused to think of an answer. Well, Pastor Wilson says that fear and faith are opposites. She made two fists. If you have one, then you can't have the other. She had one fist bump the other aside and then it came back and did the same, but the two didn't occupy the same space. The kids were quiet for a moment, watching her hands. It's time, announced Brayden, their official timekeeper. He was always checking his watch so Petra gave him the job of keeping them on schedule. Okay, I'll see you next week. They scrambled to their feet and headed towards the door. Cooper stopped to help her put the felt characters back in their envelope before leaving. Petra praised him and thanked him until he glowed. She managed to get off the floor with some dignity and headed out the door too. The adult Sunday school class was just letting out and the space was crowded. Her sister, Nora, waved her over. Her daughters pulled at her arms to get out of there and the pastor was talking her husband's ear off. Andrew ran a concrete company and was a handy guy, if there was someone in the congregation that needed home repair. He could get things arranged or would be there himself within 24 hours. Nora had found a good guy. Nora rolled her eyes as she told her girls to hold still or they wouldn't get any dessert. They dropped their hands. Nora always followed through with her threats. Petra learned that one the hard way when she'd stared at the window at Nora as her prom date walked her to the door. Petra was thirteen and enthralled with her older sister's romantic life. Nora told her if she ever did that again, 
she'd throw out all of the nail polish in the whole house and never paint nails with her again. Since she'd pressed her nose to that window the very next week, it wasn't until after the divorce that Nora relented the ban and they started spa nights. I don't know how you do it, said Nora. By the time Sunday rolls around, the last thing I want is a classroom full of kids. Chelsea waved shyly at Petra as her family headed out the door. It was one of those waves that said I hope you notice me. Petra gave her a huge smile and a big wave back that said, I noticed you and I think you're amazing. I love them. They fill me with joy. Yeah, and you've had the week off. She moved Dee Dollar's hand away from her mouth as she chewed on her fingernails. Sometimes I think you have the best life. Dylan has to be an engaged father several times a week. She glared at Andrew back. He had his calendar app open on his phone and was typing something in. Petra knew Nora didn't mean what she said, or maybe she did but not the way it sounded. She wouldn't trade places with Petra for all the gold in China. Still, her comment grated on Petra's nerves. She fought to keep a Christian outlook on things. Marriage was difficult at times. Maybe Nora and Andrew were going through one of those times and it made her snippy. Before Petra could ask a few delicate questions, her phone rang and she dug it out of her purse, hoping it was Brad. He'd sent a few pictures of jet skiing and one of the giant burger he had for lunch but she hadn't talked to him in a couple days. She didn't miss the fact that she'd been happy to text him until the end of time before she actually met him. Now that she knew what she'd been missing out on, she preferred to hear his deep, melodic voice to reading texts. Instead of Brad, her ex's number came up. I have to take this, it's Dylan. Nora touched her arm in a show of support before Petra moved back into her small classroom to take the call. She didn't even say hello. Dylan? Is Taya okay? She's having the time of her life. Why? Petra sagged against the wall. I didn't expect to hear from you unless there was a problem. That was their arrangement. No helicopter parenting when the Taya was with the other parent. Petra hated it at first but the forced silence had allowed her learn to trust Dylan in a way she hadn't when they were married. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I should have texted that I was going to call to ask a favor. Petra cleared her throat. She let her bag slide off her shoulder and drop to the floor, feeling as thought she was about to be handed a burden to carry. A favor? I, uh... Well, things are going really well here. The girls get along great and Evie and I are doing great and I think that I'd like to move forward with her, them. Petra chuckled. Did you call to get permission? He chuckled too. No. I, uh... I called to get a babysitter, for Valentine's Day. The breath rushed out of Petra's lungs and she pressed her free hand against the wall. You want me to babysit your girlfriend's children so you can take her out for Valentine's? You get that that's twisted, don't you? I know it seems strange but I want Taya to be a part of this new family and, well, you and Taya are a packaged deal. I've already explained that to Evie and she's cool with it. What about her ex? Her husband died and his family is supportive of her moving on. Another sucker punch to the gut. Was he trying to rub it in that Evie's in-laws were better people? She slid down the wall and landed with a bump in her bottom, knocking over her bag in the process. Oh. The contents of her bag spilled out, David looking up at her as if asking, how big is your faith? She wrapped her arm around her knees. Is Evie okay, with me watching her kids? Because she didn't know if she'd be okay, with that kind of situation, if she could trust Taya to wait, she already had trusted this woman with her daughter. Even though she didn't realize that's what she was doing at the time. 
Crap. She should have interviewed Evie before sending Taya along on their family by trial vacation. What kind of a mother was she? Petra? Dylan's voice came through the line. Can you hear me? He must have been talking and she missed it. Sorry, you broke up. I'm still at the church. The old building was notorious for dropping calls. The pastor joked that it was God telling them all to pay attention to his word. I said, Evie is fine with it. Spending the week with Taya has shown her that you're an excellent mother. Those words. How many times had she craved them while she was married to this man? And he'd never thought to say them, or, if he had, he'd been so caught up in his own sorrows that he'd locked them away. Dylan was changing. He was becoming the type of guy that would make a good husband. An ache welled up that it was five years too late. But, at least he'd be there for his new wife. Hopefully they could have a stable, happy marriage that would be a good example for Taya. Thank you for saying that, she managed to get out around the lump in her throat. With a forceful swallow, she regained control of her voice. I'd be happy to take the kids. We'll have a Valentine's party. Thank you, Petra. That's really great of you. She began retrieving the items that had fallen out of her purse. Just text me the info when you get a chance. I'll start planning some fun crafts that'll keep the kids busy. Because if they were busy they would be less likely to miss their mom. They said good. Bye. And hung up. Petra picked up the felt David and shook her head. She told the kids that God prepared David for his battle with Goliath. I hope you've prepared me for this, Lord. Because it feels like a mountain. Watching children wasn't the hard part, the hard part was swallowing her hurt and her pride and putting them first. The hard part was being happy for the man who had made her cry out to the Lord in heartache. The hard part was turning the other cheek. The whole thing was just hard. If Brad hadn't been auctioned off for Valentine's Day, she would have had the perfect excuse to say no. There would have been so much satisfaction in telling Dylan that she had a date and was unavailable. It stung that he assumed she'd be free for the evening. Yep. She had a mountain to climb and an ocean of pride to swallow. But, she could do anything with the Lord. Even if it meant pushing herself to grow as a person. She gently laid David back in the envelope and then put the envelope into her bag. Her feet were steady beneath her as she made her way to the hallway. Nora had moved on to talk to the pastor and Andrew. As soon as they caught sight of her, Petra's nieces charged, wrapping her up in their hugs. Can we go home with you? N. Dollaress asked with big blue eyes. She was the oldest and the spokesperson for the two girls. You're the coolest aunt ever. Petra laughed at her obvious attempt to flatter her into doing their bidding. She cupped the back of her head. We'll have to ask your mom. The girls' faces fell. They usually had to take Sunday naps after church, a tradition Petra and Nora's mother instituted when they were young. Sunday nap time was a slice of heaven she used to say. Nora noticed she was back and excused herself from the conversation. Is everything okay? Her eyes were tight with worry. It's fine. He wanted to know if I would babysit the girls on Valentine's so he could propose. He didn't, she gasped, her hand splaying across her chest. Although Petra felt vindicated by her sister's response, she was staring down at her nieces. As much as she was buffeted by her ex's decisions in life, Taya also bore the brunt of them. And she was just a child. An innocent. As were these girls. Heck, they'd lost their parent. Didn't even have visitation with him. If Dylan could fill that place in their lives, 
who was she to hold him back or make their lives any more difficult? You know what? It's a good thing. These kids will be Taya's stepsisters. I want them to feel welcome in my home. Nora shook her head in amazement. You don't have to be nice. Petra clutched her purse strap. I think I do. I don't have to like it right now, but I do have to be kind. Andrew joined them. Are we all ready to go? Yes, the girls chorused in unison making him laugh. Well come on, I've been waiting for you forever, he teased. Grabbing their hands he pulled them towards the door, much like they'd tried to do with their mom earlier. Nora rolled her eyes at his antics. If you want to talk about this, you can call me. I'm okay. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow for spa night, though, right? I wouldn't miss it. Petra grinned wickedly. She was already planning her outfit and makeup for her date with Brad. Toes and fingernails to match as well as a mask to make her skin glow was a must. She checked her phone. It wasn't much past three. She could whip up some orange chicken for dinner and invite Brad over to share. Her kitchen was too small for the two of them. Then again, it was the perfect size for close encounters. She shot off a text. What time are you getting back? It didn't take long for him to reply. I'm staying an extra day with London. Why? Her heart sank. Just wondering. Brad, do you miss me? She bit her lip. It was more like she needed him. Needed him to look at her like she was something special. The realization scared her. She'd come a long way with being okay, on her own. Feeling needy wasn't comfortable. And, she couldn't help but wonder if she felt that way because Dylan's happiness shined a spotlight on her own single status. She couldn't seem to sort out her own heart. Missing Brad because he was entertaining and thoughtful and a fantastic kisser was one thing, but missing him because she felt stronger with him on her side was bad. Wasn't it? Maybe a little she admitted. Not wanting to give him false hope or say things that she'd have to unsay later. With a sigh she headed for her car. What she needed was one of those long, Sunday drives. The kind she'd taken during the divorce where she and the Lord had a pow-wow. Her life was about to become so much more complex, she needed to find some peace. Although she was beginning to wonder if peace was really something she could obtain. No matter how good things felt for a moment, it slipped through her fingers. At least she had her night with Brad to look forward to. Her last night before the other shoe dropped. She'd make the most of it and she'd throw herself into the experience. Be a free woman and enjoy it, because once Taya came back in town, she'd be back to being a frumpy dental assistant with a kid. Petra slathered green clay across Endolores' face and neck eliciting giggles. Her own mask had started to harden and her skin felt like if she smiled too big she'd crack. She'd need to wash it off before it became a permanent fixture. There you go. She patted the end of Endolores' nose with the pad of her finger. All set. Can I watch the movie now? Go right ahead. Let me know when it starts to feel tight and we'll wash it off, okay? Okay. N. Dollar trotted off to sit with her sister. Ella Enchanted played on the smaller screen in the kitchen. Petra's mom tricked her dad into putting a television on the wall so she could be inspired to make healthier meals for the two of them. She said tricked because every time she came over, there was a superhero movie playing. Mom loved her men in tight shirts and spandex. Thankfully, Dad didn't try to keep up. He was long and lean from running marathons, not a beefcake like the Captain or Bucky. So. How's your week off? asked Mom. Petra rolled her eyes. 
My week off was busy. Mom and Nora exchanged a look and Petra braced herself for the intervention that was sure to follow. You were supposed to take some time for yourself. Soak in a bubble bath. Attack that pile of romances on your nightstand, scolded Nora. Petra fought the grin that wanted to erupt. What? pestered Mom. Now was as good a time as any to tell them about Brad. Getting their relationship out in the open would be a relief. She hated hiding things from her family. Besides, they'd kissed twice and while she may be confused about her motivation for behaving less than adultish, she couldn't deny that she was happy when he was around. That had to count for something. I haven't had time to soak in a warm bath because I've been busy, dating. Her mom and sister froze in place. Their faces mirrors of shock and wonder. His name's Brad. Oh my gosh. You're not joking. Nora plopped into a chair at the counter. Mom placed her forearms on the countertop, leaning over it to ask, where did you meet him? That was the one question Petra didn't want to answer. She'd been swallowing a lot of pride this week not to mention the crow she'd have to eat when she went back to work and the girls found out she'd actually gone out with the guy she met online. Oddly enough, the task was getting easier. I met him online. On a dating site, asked Nora. No, social media. Nora's arm flopped to the counter. You're kidding me. Petra giggled. Nope. She put her hand over Nora's arm. And get this, he plays football. Mom gasped. Now I know you're making things up. Petra pulled out her phone and showed them the selfie she'd taken the night they rode the slingshot. I'm serious. Mom and Nora bent over the screen, examining every pixel. He's hot, said Nora. Mom shushed her and motioned to the girls. Keep it G, she warned. Nora waved her off. I think it's great. He'll make beautiful babies. Petra's neck flushed and she snatched her phone off the counter. We're casually dating. It's not like that. Nora stood up, organizing the nail polish bottles on the counter according to color and then from lightest to darkest. You're the one who said you wanted more kids. Petra threw up her hands. I said that one time, like two years ago. Mom nodded. That's what's had us so worried. You can't wait too long for these things. Okay, we've been on two dates. We're a long way away from a ring and baby making. Even saying the words out loud made her heart race. The chemistry between her and Brad was undeniable. So cool it. All right. All right. Nora backed off and went to check the girls' masks. Petra made her way around to the sink to get a washcloth wet so she could remove hers. Mom came to stand by her at the sink and put her arm around Petra's shoulders. I'm happy for you, dear. Thanks, Mom. It's still new, but I wanted you to know, you know? Thanks. Just, she rubbed Petra's arm. Be careful, okay? Nora has a point about my future grandbabies, but I don't want you to get hurt again. She held tighter. Make sure he's the right type of man before you lose your heart. Petra's own heart sank. Yeah, her first marriage had fallen apart but that didn't mean they were bad people. Dylan might not have been the right man for her, but he was right for someone. Obviously Dylan was a better person for what they'd gone through. She didn't feel like a better person, but maybe she was stronger. That had to count for something. I will. Good. Mom let her go. Hand me a washcloth will you? I'm cracking like the driveway over here. Petra laughed and handed over the cloth. 
She buried her face in her own, letting the steam and the moisture soften the roughness before scrubbing away the green clay. She was looking forward to pulling out all the stops for Brad. But, in the back of her mind was her mom's voice and a doubt in her abilities to recognize a good man. Maybe she did have bad taste in men. Maybe she was headed for heartbreak. And yet, a part of her didn't care. She might be making the biggest mistake of her life, falling for Brad and letting him into her life, but it was her mistake to make. Until Taya came home, who she dated didn't affect anyone but her. Chapter 17 The atmosphere at RE Doc Dollar was exactly as Brad had hoped. They dined in the library of the estate-turned-five-star hotel and restaurant. The walls were covered in dark wood paneling which absorbed sound and conversation around them, allowing for an intimate experience despite the clustered round tables. The stained glass windows and hand-carved fireplace offered an historical appeal and the black upholster chairs were comfortable, inviting them to settle in for a spell. They had settled in, enjoying the beef tenderloin and one another's company. Lingering over dessert was heaven in a chocolate torte laced with orange flavoring and dusted with powdered sugar. Brad reached for Petra's fingers, toying with them. Are you ready for a stroll around the grounds? She smiled. More than ready. Although you'll probably have to roll me out of here. I hear they keep a dolly in the kitchen for that exact reason. She smiled and his chest warmed with the knowledge that he'd done well with her tonight. They got up, and she collected her small purse, draping the thin strap over her rounded shoulder. She'd dressed up and she looked good, temptingly good. As they left the main entrance, he pointed to a path on the right. I think that goes to the gardens. She smiled again, lighting up the night. His night. He let his gaze dance across her features. You know, I think spa night looks good on you. She turned away shyly. You know what else would look good on you? She lifted her gaze. What? My arm. He draped it across her shoulders. She put hers around his back and leaned into him. You're pretty sure of yourself tonight. You're the one sending me I miss you texts. She snorted. I knew that would go to your head. Hey, a guy likes to know he's appreciated. You mean he likes his ego fed? I don't know about that, he lifted a shoulder. But I am sure I like you. He pressed a kiss to her hair. And I'm pretty sure you like me. She dropped her gaze. What makes you so confident? Because you're warm and real to me. I meet a lot of women who like the football player and not the man. They're cold, distant, and wear masks. You are none of those things. Well, according to my sister, I'm too nice. Two questions, is this sister older or younger and... What? She giggled. Older sister. So she loves to tell me what I'm doing wrong with my life. But, she's also amazing and watched Taya every day when I went back to finish school. She even vacuumed for me, which is Satan's chore I swear. She manages a credit union part-time and is an amazing mom. I can't say enough good things about her. He catalogued all the information she downloaded in that one statement, including her hatred of vacuuming. He'd never met someone who disliked it enough to give it a nickname. And yet, she drives you insane, doesn't she, he urged. She shoved his chest. Yes. How did you know? I have two baby sisters who weigh in on every Insta post and news release. It's like being constantly pelted with sock balls. He hadn't been very good at responding lately. The women in his family tended to be high-strung and their constant drama drained him. Sock balls? You know? 
You roll up a sock and, boom, instant amo. Wow, the things I missed out on not having a brother. Hey, I was the good guy. Sure you were. They rounded the last corner and soon were back where they started. Where to, she asked. He'd googled a list of fun things to do in Dallas. He had a preference for their next outing but tonight was about her. If she wanted to do something that would bore him, then he'd go for it. I have a few ideas but first, three questions. Oh, sounds intriguing. She rubbed her palms together. How do you feel about art? Like paintings and stuff? He nodded. It's okay. I can appreciate talent but I'm not a collector or anything. The museum was out. Thank goodness. He felt the same way she did and wasn't looking forward to an evening in the hushed tones of an art gallery. Besides, he had the art show on Valentine's Day to get through. Question 2, do you like the zoo? What kind of a question is that? She shoved him playfully. If I say no, then I'm a baby penguin hater. So you do like it? I've been three times with Taya this year. I like it. But you've been there and done that. Got it. Okay, last question. How competitive are you? Excuse me, I was a cheerleader. She cocked a hip and an attitude all at once doing a perfect imitation of the stereotypical mean cheerleader type. He doubted she was ever the mean girl but he'd bet his car she was fierce in competition. Go karts it is. He grinned. He was hoping they'd get to race tonight. Ever since he'd seen the ad on the website he thought it looked like a blast. She glanced down. I'm in heels. Advantage me. He shrugged. She snorted. You wish. Oh, it's on, pretty lady. He twisted his head to the side, popping his neck loudly. She made a face at the noise. Be prepared to be schooled. They headed for the car, trash talking the whole way. If he wasn't so aware of the fact that Petra was a woman, with beautiful curves and sultry eyes, he'd think he was hanging out with one of his buddies. Which kind of made spending time with her that much sweeter. As they pulled into the fun park, he stopped her for a kiss. What he wanted to be a quick moment to express how happy she made him turned into something more. There was a desperation in the way Petra clung to him, as if she thought he'd evaporate right out of her hands. He could taste the hunger and feel the fever in her trembling body. What's going on, he asked when they finally broke apart. She blushed deeply. Tomorrow, well, things are going to change with Taya back in town. I just, I wanted to enjoy every minute of this. He pulled her close, loving the feel of her body tucked next to his. It'll be fine. Nothing has to change. He kissed her hair before opening the door and ushering her inside the loud arcade. Her lips pulled down for a moment. When she caught him looking she brightened and slipped her arm through his. I'm going to leave you in my dust. We'll see about that. He paid for several races and they went outside to take their place in line. Petra did all she could to be close to him. While he liked the attention, her constant contact carried a sense of nervousness that made it difficult to relax. Maybe it was the auction date that had her worried. She shouldn't be, his heart was quickly becoming hers. Maybe it was time to tell her the truth. He could get it all out in the open and... Sir, are you coming? asked the attendant. He blinked out of his thoughts and saw that Petra had already chosen a bright green car towards the front of the line. He hurried to get the cart next to her. The conversation would have to wait until after he won the race. Chapter 18 Valentine's Day 
The day lovers should be together, gazing into one another's eyes, and feeding each other decadent chocolates. Petra tried not to think of all that as she scrounged in the junk drawer for a glue stick for Layla who was making a heart mogul, to hang over her bed. Her thumbnail connected with the bottom of the drawer and split right down the middle. She bit back a curse. So much for her manicure. She should be out, celebrating love and romance and all that crap. But she wasn't. She was in her yoga pants. The red nail polish dripped down the side a holiday accessory. I know it's here somewhere. She slammed the drawer and checked the one below, coming up with an ha when she found it. She checked her bad attitude and smeared a smile on her face before handing over the prize. Here you go, sweetie. Layla took it with a smile. The girl had white blonde hair and huge blue eyes like a little Elsa. Thank you, she said quietly. That was her hundred thank you for the night. The child was a model of perfect behavior. Taya wasn't a bad kid but Petra was beginning to feel like her daughter was a bad influence on her future stepsisters. Taya was loud enough for elephants to understand her but these two were like mice. So adorable though. It wasn't their fault that she was in mom mode and resenting it. She'd met Evie during the kid drop-off. Though she didn't say much, she was sweet and open. There wasn't an ounce of jealousy or competition in the hug she'd greeted Petra with which made Petra feel all that pettier for all the hard feelings she'd had towards Dylan moving on. It wasn't his fault that she'd chosen to batten down the hatches of her heart and keep it closed off while he'd made the opposite choice. Or, maybe there hadn't been much of a choice for him, Evie was adorable. She'd asked Evie how they met, curious and trying to make conversation while Brad moved car seats into her van in case they wanted to go for ice cream later. She wasn't promising anything to the girls. If they were content to be at home, there was no sense dragging them out in public. They'd been all over Disney for the last week, it was possible they wanted to chill for a night. With her eyes on the floor, Evie explained that she'd gone into the dealership looking for a used car. She didn't have much money to put down but she had a trade-in. Dylan had been sweet, giving her every discount and rebate he could come up with while her girls clung to her legs. When he called her a couple days later to ask her out, she'd reluctantly agreed and ended up taking her children because she didn't have a sitter. Her family was in Idaho and she was basically alone in TXS. She was thinking of moving back there but now. She didn't have to finish the thought. Petra knew the, but now, was Brad. And, she understood all too well the demands on a single mother's time. Hence she was babysitting on Valentine's Day and not fighting the crowds to get a table. Petra, asked Mila in her snow-white voice. Can I have some water? The uncertainty in the child's eyes grabbed Petra's heart with both hands and shook it hard. She squatted so she was on eye level with Mila. Of course. I have some sparkling cider, would you like some of that instead? She nodded, her lips clamped shut. Petra busied herself opening the fancy plastic wine cups she picked up at the dollar store. Sparkling cider was one of her and Taya's Valentine's traditions. Can we open the box of chocolates too? asked Taya from across the room. You bet. It's in the pantry. She jerked her head towards the door so Taya would get it out. Dr. Payne always gave the girls in the office a large box of mint truffles for the holiday. It was sweet of him, even if he had exiled them for a week so he could romance his wife. Being a good person was difficult sometimes. Petra wasn't perfect by a long shot by why did she have to let negative feelings get the better of her so easily. She replaced her feelings of frustration with her boss by mentally repeating he was being a good husband. He was being a good husband. While the girls were busy gluing and glittering, she checked her phone. She hadn't heard from Brad all night, 
didn't expect to because he was on a date with another woman. Not that it bothered her. They hadn't had a conversation about their relationship advancing past the casual dating stage. Unless you counted kissing as a conversation. Which it was, in a sense. His lips told her all sorts of things last night. Like, he wasn't worried about them like she was. Of course, it wasn't his daughter coming home after a week away. It wasn't him who'd found a piece of her old self that scared the dickens out of her. It wasn't Brad who had to come back to cleaning the toilet, washing dishes, and vacuuming the darn floor. She glanced at the small slivers of paper littering the tile under the table. At least they were on the tile. A quick sweep and she'd be done. There had to be a deep psychological reason she despised vacuuming. Unfortunately, with all her other issues at the moment, there wasn't time to delve into that. One Charlie Brown movie later and there was a soft knock at the front door. Petra disentangled herself from the kitten-like pile of little girls on her lap and opened it for Dylan and Evie. Evie's smile could have lit the Titan Stadium. And just like that she was missing Brad again. How was dinner? she asked quietly, wrapping her arms around her stomach. Her eyes darted to the girls on the couch, their blonde hair spilling over the pillows and blankets they'd used to make a nest. This should be easier. Long lines and great food, said Dylan. He cleared his throat. For all the joy on Evie's face, his was tight with anxiety as he too stared at the pile of kids, sleeping peacefully. It hit Petra that he was taking on a lot, two kids, an ex-wife and a child of his own. Not to mention the new job that he was just starting to succeed it was still demanding emotionally and on his time. For the first time in a long time, her heart went out to him. Evie pointed over her shoulder. I'll move the car seats and come back to carry one of the girls. Dylan nodded, softly touching her back before she left. So, how'd it go? asked Petra. Good. She said yes. He spoke in hushed tones. For all the time they'd spent apart, Petra could still read Dylan. You're stressing out, aren't you? He puffed out his lips. We started talking about where we want to live and having enough space for all the kids, maybe having another one in a while. I just wasn't thinking about all of that when. When you fell in love, Petra finished for him. I was going to say proposed. She smiled. I know you were. That's why I changed it for you. She glanced out the front window and could see Evie moving the second car seat to her vehicle. Brad if you love her. Petra, I loved you and that didn't work out. She sucked in. Not two hours ago she'd been patting herself on the back for being nice to an innocent child who had lost her father. Putting her in the position to help her ex-husband find happiness with someone else was God's way of testing her resolve to grow as his child. To be more like his son. All the words to make Brad feel better, more confident about his path, were right there in her head. But God was giving her a choice to say them or to hold them back, the power to choose who she wanted to be. Ah, growing up is so hard. She steeled herself against the massive sense that this wasn't a fair test and continued on, but this isn't like that, like us. We planned everything from the very beginning, right down to the months we were going to conceive children. Losing the life we envisioned was like losing a part of who we were. We identified with that life and when it was gone, we were both lost. What love we had for each other was conditional. And that kind of love can't last forever. As soon as the words were out, a giant sense of peace filled her like warm water filling a bottle. It wasn't about passing a test, it was about loving like God loves and sharing his love with everyone, even when it difficult. Brad nodded slowly. She nudged him with her elbow. I'm actually glad you didn't think that far ahead. 
That gives me hope for you too. You think? She nodded. Evie was coming back up the steps, her head low. I'm guessing you've been less than affectionate tonight. Maybe. He hooked his thumbs in his pockets and dropped his gaze. Well, you're probably making her second guess saying yes, so knock it off. Petra cuffed him on the back of the head. He scowled. Evie softly pushed the unlatched door open and poked her head inside like she wasn't sure of her welcome. We're all set. Petra headed for the couch and picked up Mila. I've got her. She headed out to the car to give the two of them a moment together. Mostly so Dylan could apologize. Mila nestled into her, sighing as softly as a squirrel. Petra cuddled her for an extra minute, remembering what it was like to have one this small. Her motherly instincts swelled and her eyes stung with unshed tears. Another child felt far out of her grasp. As she laid Mila in the car seat and buckled the latch, she blinked back the tears. There was no sense in bemoaning the unfairness of life. It was what it was and it would be what it would be. She'd just have to keep working on being happy no matter the circumstances. Did you see this? asked Maddie. It was their first day back on the job. Two days after Valentine's Day. Dr. Payne had a major case of jet lag and a dopey grin all over his face. France had been good for him. Petra glanced over at her phone to find a picture of Brad, his arm around the woman from the auction. The two of them were smiling for the cameras, looking completely at ease in their formal wear appearing in a who's who on Valentine's Day in the social section of the paper. Why do they even have those types of articles anymore? I thought we were in the modern age, not Regency land. She shoved the rolling chair aside, slamming it into the wall. Apparently, all the growing up she had done last night was undone with a good night's sleep. No, she was still happy for Dylan and Evie. They'd looked twitterpated as they drove off the night before. He must have apologized good enough to make things right. Plus, Evie seemed to have the patience and understanding that Petra was always trying to achieve. Maddie's eyes bulged at Petra's angry tone. You knew about the date. We were at the auction. I know. She swiped her moist hands on her hips. But he hasn't called or texted. Oh my gosh do you think he went home with her? I didn't until you said that. A panicked sense of insecurity welled up inside of her like a snake coiling tighter and tighter. She tried to swallow it down but ended up gasping for a breath. Maddie studied the picture. She paid a lot of money for him. She didn't buy him. She bought the date. Petra shoved the chair to the other side of the room, banging that wall too and leaving a scuff mark. She cringed. She'd spent the last two days wiping off walls and molding and light fixtures. Who cared when Brad had dropped her like an icky brown banana? She kicked the exam chair. Hey, Maddie grabbed her arm. Tantrum much? Petra shook her off. I'm not overreacting. He should have called. Even as she said the words, she conceded that she might be overreacting just a little and some of her anger dissipated. You know, you wouldn't be this upset over a rebound guy. Maddie wiped down the sink with a paper towel. Petra tipped her head back and considered the ceiling. I don't think he's a rebound guy. You like him? A lot more than I should. She tugged on her high ponytail. Especially since he hasn't called me. Call him. Yeah, because that's not desperate. Hi, I know you went out with another woman who has boobs like birthday party balloons and hair made out of spun silk, but I don't want you to forget about me, she said in a high-pitched, whiny voice. Maddie giggled. You're terrible. 
Petra buried her face in her hands. I know. Wendy from the front desk appeared, carrying a big package wrapped in paper with red and pink hearts all over it. Petra? This came for you. Her arms strained indicating the box had weight to it. The delivery man said he tried to bring it yesterday but since we were out, he didn't feel good about leaving it outside the building. Petra sat in the exam chair and Wendy laid the box on her lap. She pulled out the card. Been looking for the perfect gift. Anyone could send flowers. But I wanted something that you'd love. Love, Brad. She read out loud and then pressed the card to her chest with a sigh. He'd sent this yesterday. The morning after his auction date. He hadn't run off with Miss Money Bags. Her body sagged with relief. I'm officially smitten. You haven't seen what's in the box, argued Wendy. What if it's a puppy? Petra was sure it wasn't a puppy. She shook the box hard, making Wendy gasp in horror. As happy as she would have been with a text, she was thrilled that Brad sent something. A gift he'd put some thought into according to the card. The idea that he'd been thinking of her sent a thrill up her back. Open it, prodded Wendy. Petra slowly peeled back the first corner, drawing out the suspense for her friends as long as she could stand it. Then she went to town, ripping the paper off and revealing. It's a robot vacuum. She hugged the box to her chest. Oh my gosh, he gave me the gift of never vacuuming again. Her cheeks hurt from the strength behind her smile. Who does that? She grinned up at her friends who were also smiling. A man who knows the way into your heart, quipped Wendy. Does he have a brother, cause I could use one of those too? Petra tipped her head back and laughed. Maddie lifted one eyebrow. You know, he probably thinks you're ignoring him. Yikes! Petra scrambled for her phone. If he sent this yesterday, then he's been waiting for me to call him. While I've been waiting for him to call me. What a mess up. She dialed his number and drummed her fingers on the box while it rang. Do you hate it? asked Brad by way of hello. I love it. She hugged the box again. I can't stop smiling. Thank you so much. She quickly explained about the delivery mix-up. So I'm sorry I didn't call earlier. Were you totally sweating it out? He chuckled uneasily. I thought the vacuum could go either way. She laughed easily. I could totally see someone getting so mad. But not me. I love it. I'm going to charge it here so it can hit the ground running at home. Her whole insides were bubbling with excitement. He could not have sent her a better gift if he'd given her the Taj Mahal. Maddie flicked her with a rubber glove and pointed to the clock. They were due to have their first patience in two minutes. Sounds like a fun-filled evening. His voice dropped, when can I see you again? His question flustered her. There were so many factors to consider, her time was no longer her own. Soon. Taya's home. I've got to check the calendar. Let me know. I will. They said, goodbye, and she hung up the phone. Maddie swatted her with the glove again. He found the way to your heart. Yeah, I think he did. And that was the problem. As easy as the last week had been, it was a fake because that woman he'd taken out, kissed, wasn't the real her. She ran her hand over the picture of the vacuum on the front of the box. Keeping up with a boyfriend and everything else in her life would be a challenge. But, it was one she was willing to take on. After all, now that she didn't have to vacuum anymore, she had loads of free minutes in her day. Chapter 19 
Brad hung up with Petra, a smile on his face. He swiped away the sweat that had accumulated on his forehead. He wasn't literally sweating because she hadn't called him about the vacuum. Her call caught him at the end of his morning workout and he was drenched. Perhaps he'd put more oomph into lifting today, working out his stress in the gym. Doc would be proud of him for channeling his frustrations. Then again, Doc would tell him that this whole relationship with Petra was a mirage and until he came clean about the part he'd played in her past, nothing between them would be real. It truly sucked having Doc's voice in his head all the time. His phone rang again and he answered quickly, grateful for the distraction from his own thoughts. Miss me already, he joked, ready for one of Petra's quick comebacks. I'm your mother, I always miss you. Brad grit his teeth. He should have been paying more attention. Hello, Mom. Hello to you too. I assume by that greeting that you weren't expecting my call. Who were you planning to flirt with? Yeah, that conversation wasn't going to happen. No one you need to worry about. What can I do for you, he asked, because there was always something. Well, she heaved a sigh and he could see her checking her manicure as she spoke to him, your sister has failed all her classes. All of them, even after being put on academic probation last semester. Brad loved how, when Arya was in trouble, she was your sister. As if he was the one with the responsibility of making her turn out decent. Still, she was his sister and she had issues. Issues he could clearly identify as coming from their mother. It was a wonder he turned out as good as he did. I'll head over to campus and see what I can do. I'm not sure how much sway I have, they hired a new coach since I was there. You'll be fine, as always. I don't know what I'm going to do with that girl. She has no focus, no drive. If she had an ounce of your determination, she'd make herself into something useful. Mom, the spotlight's not for everyone. He'd seen that firsthand. There were guys who played ball really well but they didn't want the lifestyle, the attention, the drama, and they shied away from being their best so they didn't have to step up. Arya reminded him of those guys. She was too smart to flunk all her classes. Whatever was going on was in her head. I'll call you when I have news, he managed to get out before she could continue ragging on his little sister. He sent a text to Arya to meet him at the dean's office and called to make an appointment with the dean. They worked him in that afternoon. Apparently, his name held some sway at his alma mater. No doubt, they wanted a nice big alumni contribution this year. He'd have to talk to his accountant and see what he could do. Once Arya replied that she'd be there, he hit the showers and then was on the road. The drive didn't take long. Campus looked like it had the last time he'd visited. He should probably feel nostalgic about the good old days, want to wander around and gather memories of his time there. He didn't feel yearnings or turn sentimental, not even when he passed the dorms he'd lived in his freshman year. A seed of uncertainty planted itself in his mind. His college playing days were fun, but he didn't look back on them with longing like other guys did. He wasn't sure what that said about him. A few minutes after parking, he was walking into the administrative building when Arya stomped his direction. Hey, there, beautiful. How are you? He opened his arms and she fell into them for a tight, slightly angry, hug. I'm sick of school. I'm sick of mom breathing down my neck, and I tired of her sending you to fix me. She released him so she could put air quotes around the last two words. Brad would have argued, but he couldn't count the number of times he'd gone to her high school to bail her out of one mess or another. Hey, I'm not here to fix you. I'm here to help. He glanced at the door to the building. He knew how things would go once they walked through those doors. 
he'd play the celebrity, they'd pretend to be spellbound, or maybe they were actually impressed, he wasn't ever sure. They'd come to some sort of compromise with a slap on the wrists for Arya and everyone would leave with tight smiles and knots in their shoulders. He didn't want to go in there. He would for Arya, but, he really didn't want to. What do you want? He asked Arya. No one had ever asked him that question. Not his mom. Not his coaches. No one. They all pushed him towards greatness, towards being the best in his field. He was beginning to wonder what he would have said if someone had asked back when he was just another high school football player. She pulled on the ends of her long hair, twisting them around her hand. Do you even want to be in school? I hate school. It's hard for me. Her shoulders rounded. She'd struggled academically, needed tutors to make it through the basic classes. The Bicis dollar was a stinking genius. She could beat the pants off them in a math competition. No wonder she was mom's current favorite. He'd been her star when he was growing up shining on the field and earning mom praise right and left for having such a gifted son. Arya had lived in his shadow and then been shoved aside by Babysis Dollar who won science fairs and completed college-level courses, as a high school sophomore. So, what do you want? Her eyes turned red and swelled with tears. I want to be away from mom. She's slowly killing me, Brad. I swear. I can't do anything right. He hugged her again. He understood. Mom was intense. If he had a bad game, she was in the backyard, blowing the whistle and making him run the play over and over again until he got it right. He didn't think anything of it at the time. It was just how his life went. His mind cleared and a path laying out before him. Okay. You can live with me. She jerked back, her face alight with hope. He held up a finger. If you don't have a job, any job, in two days, you're out. Two days was a fast deadline but she worked best under pressure. I can find something, I will. Her eyes darted around the landscaping, her head spinning the possibilities. I know. His phone beeped. That's probably mom. He pulled out his phone and Aria leaned over to see the text. Petra, you've changed my life. She added a picture of the vacuum charging in an outlet. She'd made two eyes out of white paper and a blue marker and stuck them on the front. He smiled. Yeah, it felt great to make her happy. Who's that from? Aria asked. Ah, uh, he stuttered over the definition. Petra meant much more to him than a friend but she'd insisted they keep things casual. Woman. He mentally stuck his tongue out at himself for being an idiot. You bought a woman a vacuum? Dude, you have no game. He laughed. How many times had Petra told him that same thing? I'm pretty sure the vacuum was a touchdown. He glanced down his nose at his know-it-all sister. Can I make you dinner tonight? He typed. He'd already asked when he could see her but persistence didn't hurt. Besides, he missed her. I gotta see this. Aria folded her arms. He rolled his eyes, lifting the phone so she couldn't read it. He needed to explain this new situation to Petra. Arya moving out of her house and in with him was going to blow up the family. But that was for him to handle. He wanted someone to talk things through with, to bounce ideas off of and Petra was the perfect someone. She understood people, and she was a mom, she'd know how to handle this. He chewed his lower lip as he contemplated his sister's request. Things are still new with her. He left the implication that a little sister tag-along wouldn't be cool hanging there. Oh, Sakai. 
I'll call Dominique. Crap. Dominique liked to party, too hard for Brad's tastes. I'll ask her if she minds. He sent of the text. Petra, sure. Let's eat at my house. You bring the food. I'll make sure the carpet is clean. Wink. And just like that, Petra opened the door to his family. He was impressed with her hospitality. He only hoped she knew what she was getting into. Chapter 20 The caterer I tempied with was looking for a few more full-time people. If you're interested, I can give you the number. Petra finished off the freeze steak with a happy moan. Across from her, Brad's sister picked at her food. Her nose wrinkled. Thanks, but I'm not sure that's a good fit. Her words were nice enough but the expression on her face told a whole other story. She looked down on Petra for white dressing. Mentally smoothing down the bristling of her pride, Petra applied a smile. Well, if you change your mind let me know. She turned to Taya. Two more bites, sweetie. Taya scowled at the broccoli as she took a nibble from the tree end. She'd clamped her lips shut at the mention of steak. At five and a half, she had yet to learn to appreciate the deliciousness that was grade-A beef. If it didn't have chicken in it, Taya was a food snob. She should have warned Brad. Instead, she'd had to pull on her mommy panties and wage a battle with her daughter. Said daughter was in the I don't like it corner while Petra was in the you have to eat to live and for the love be polite corner. There were never winners when dinner became a battle. Instead of press the steak, Petra pointed to the steamed veggies which Taya normally ate with only half a prompting. Tonight her daughter was in rare form. And in front of Brad too. She turned to him with a weak smile. It's delicious. Thank you for cooking. He swiped his napkin across his lips. They still glistened from the steak and for a moment she was lost in the memory of the feel of them on her lips, of his hands on her lower back, urging her closer. If only that were possible right now. Like the ancient commercial for bubble bath, she wanted Brad to just take her away from this crazy life. I'm glad you liked it. Um, hmm, she moaned. Taya's giggle brought her back to reality. She and Arya were looking at her like she had broccoli for brains. Maybe she did, sitting here mooning over Brad with an audience. The sooner she got it into her head that she wasn't the glamorous woman who dated professional football players the better off she'd be. Picking up her plate, she made her way to the kitchen and opened the dishwasher. If there was any job that said average life it was washing dishes. Taya brought her plate over too. Can I be done? Petra barely glanced at the food left, sure that there was more than there should be and those two more bites hadn't disappeared. Sure. She took the plate and scraped the morsels down the disposal. Would you like to play beauty parlor? Taya asked Aria. I have pretty nail polish and stickers. Petra held her breath as the invitation hung in the air. Aria was the most glamorous person to enter this house in a long time. Her beautiful black hair was tousled in long waves, the kind commercials called sexy beach waves. She wore makeup like a My Heart Channel Pro, her shirt was tight enough to double as a corset, and her jewelry was bold and demanded attention. She wore it all as if she'd just rolled out of bed gorgeous. She probably had. Maintenance on a look like that was so much easier than creating it from scratch. Sure. Aria smiled at Brad as if looking for his approval. It'll be fun. Petra glanced down at her chipped nails before plunging her hands into the dishes stacked in the sink. She ignored the feel of something slimy and kept right on loading the lower rack. Thanks again for letting me bring her tonight. Brad set his plate by the sink and went back for another load. 
They kept their voices low so the girls, hunkered down around the coffee table with an army of nail polishes, wouldn't hear them talking. Petra appreciated his willingness to jump in and help with the dishes. Of course, since the alternative was painting nails, he'd probably figured he'd gotten the lesser of the two evils. You know what, it was a good thing, it kind of took the pressure off of you and Taya meeting for the first time. There was pressure? His forehead wrinkled. She nodded and smiled up at him. There was. And you handled it well. Wow, a compliment. Don't let it go to your head. He glanced over his shoulder and then pecked her on the cheek. Petra's skin tingled where his lips had been. She longed to toss the dishes aside and wrap her arms around his neck and get lost in one of his knee-melting kisses. But tonight was all about keeping it G, besides, she got the impression he was more worried about what his sister thought of the two of them than he worried over Taya. Attacking his lips wouldn't win her any points. She sighed. He sighed louder. She huffed and looked up at him. What? You're thinking too hard. Is there really such a thing as thinking too hard? I mean, what am I going to do, strain my temporal lobe? He chuckled. There's my girl. She leaned against him, soaking in his humor and his body heat. She needed to lighten up, her whole body felt heavy. What's going on? He nudged her out of the way and slipped the heavy frying pan he'd brought with him into the sink, covering it with way too much dish soap before he started scrubbing. She leaned her hip against the counter, careful to make sure Taya couldn't hear her. I don't know. I love being a mom. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. She paused, unsure what he would think about that. He didn't have kids. Maybe she was making a mistake bringing this up with him. He'd see her as unstable and run. Instead of interrupting, he found the scrub brush and went after the grease in the bottom of the pan. In for a penny. This is horrible. But, while Taya was gone, I felt such freedom. It was like, being a mom overshadowed all these other parts of my personality and I'd forgotten about them. He nodded. Don't you go acting like you know what I'm talking about. She grabbed the dish towel and swatted him. He splayed his hand, sending droplets of water all over her. Oh, I know. Police. She used the dish towel to blot at her face, laughter building up inside her body and pushing the tightly wound springs apart. It's like the last day of the season. For 16 games there's this pressure to perform, to be at my highest level. And the day it's over, I want to, I don't know, roll down a grassy hill or throw water balloons at my buddies. Petra bit her lip. And I get that it's only for 17 weeks and you have that little princess 24-7. I can see how that would weigh on you. She blew out her lips. So what do I do about it? He tipped his head back, thinking. She let him think as she added soap and started the dishwasher. When she was done, he placed a hand on her hip, squeezing gently. I think, when you see a grassy hill, you go for it. Seize the moment? His eyes sparkled. Find the joy in every day. Find joy in the journey, she lifted an eyebrow in challenge. Happiness is found in simple things. She paused because his words hit home. She'd been happy doing dishes with Brad. If that was all it took, then that was pretty amazing. Stumped, he challenged. She shook her head, took his hand, and pulled him into the pantry. He caught on pretty quickly and wrapped her in his arms. She pressed her lips to his, then let him take charge for a minute before pulling away. What was that for? he asked, breathless. I figured, a kiss was pretty simple. He growled in her ear. 
Your kisses are anything but simple. She laughed quietly, sure that their stolen moment would be interrupted any second now. I'm not that hard to figure out. Really? Because this is the most involved casual dating experience I've ever had. She tucked her chin. Um, Mom, called Taya. Her voice wasn't that far away. Petra jumped and shoved past Brad. He let her, that's the only way she could have made it past him. He trapped her in the pantry with his massive shoulders and tight torso but she hadn't felt trapped. She'd felt, safe, loved even. Loved. There was a scary word. Could she fall in love with Brad? Could she let herself? Taya held up her hands, showcasing a stunning manicure that would be peeled off before lunch tomorrow. There were polka dots and sparkles and each ring finger looked like a cupcake. Oh my gosh! Those are so cute, she exclaimed. Taya fanned her hands to help them dry. You're really talented, Petra told Arya who was leaning against the wall, her ankles crossed. You should go to beauty school. My mother would kill me. She scoffed. Beauty school is below us to grand women. I. Petra fumbled to come up with an appropriate response. Brad swooped in, frying pan in hand. If you ladies are done with your nails, it's time for us to head out. Aria has a busy day tomorrow. His warm hand brushed Petra's back as he walked towards the door sending fabulous shivers dancing across her skin. They all said, goodbye, and then it was Taya's bedtime. She'd gotten back into her routine fairly easily thank goodness. Once the audiobook was playing, Petra pulled out her laptop and caught up with the prince, the Spaniard with the treasure chest full of gold, and a new guy who only had a week to live. Wanna bet? she asked out loud. I'm pretty sure I can get you to go a month. Even as she typed, her mind went back to that stolen kiss in the pantry, a pint-sized moment of romance in her otherwise humdrum day. Maybe Brad was right, maybe the ticket to being herself and being a mom was grabbing those moments when she had a chance. She didn't have to let responsibility be a weight that dragged her down. Not when she could sneak into the pantry with a hot football player. She checked her grin and then caught herself and let the smile burst forth, taking a moment to enjoy a memory. When she'd stared off into the abyss, blissfully planning other places in the house she could sneak Brad into for five minutes, she cleared her mind and got back to work. Dear Mr. Carter, I'm sorry to hear about your chorus of the liver. At least Google the disease before you try and con me with it. It's not like cirrhosis is trademarked. Songs that rely on stock rhythms won't hold a listener's attention. Perhaps you should try something a little more hooky for the chorus, like a banjo. Give it a shot and let me know how it goes. Several days passed and Petra hadn't been able to see Brad. She found that she missed him, missed his touch. His hands were so big, they fit around her hip with ease, and yet so gentle. He had a way of looking at life that kept her level-headed. She knew she was crazy sometimes but didn't always know how to take it down a notch. He managed to make things seem manageable with just a few words of encouragement. They'd had plans to go out last night while Taya was on her weekly visit with Dylan, but Brad was sick. She'd talked to him on the phone and his voice was raw. She'd ended up spending the evening with her laptop. The prince had gotten fed up with her stall tactics, and called off the whole rescue attempt opting to take his chances with his brother's half-sister's cousin instead of read another cake recipe. The next day, she was at work, cleaning the teeth of a seven-year-old with an aversion to brushing. She'd managed to get him to rinse with mouthwash to help with the smell which was a plus. The poor guy's gums were swollen and sore. She hated to see kids in pain when the answer was so simple. Just as she was rinsing him off, 
Dylan poked his head in the exam room. She cringed, historically, surprise visits were a bad thing. Hi. What are you doing here? Wow. Nice welcome. His tone was light so she didn't get her hackles up. I was driving by and I know you don't answer your phone when you're at work so I came in to ask if I could borrow Taya tonight. Evie wants to take the girls dress shopping for the wedding. They'd set a date less than two weeks away. Petra was invited. She'd gotten an official invitation and everything. Which was weird and it wasn't. Dylan hated limbo. What time? I'll pick her up at school. Petra mentally ran over her to-do list for the evening and found that it was surprisingly short. She'd wanted to take Brad some soup but didn't want to expose Taya to his germs. A sick kid meant she was homebound too and that was no bueno. Sure. She dabbed at the kid's gums, trying to get some of the bleeding to stop. She'd have to talk to the dentist about talking to the mom about his gums. With a little effort, they could be healthy. Dylan patted the door jam. Thanks. You know, you've been really cool about this whole thing. The girls had a great time at your place. They keep asking when they can come back. Petra's first instinct was to think Brad was trying to flatter her into babysitting. She held on to that thought just long enough for another one to pop up. The girls were very sweet and they'd enjoyed making the Valentine's crafts. Even if Brad was working it to get a babysitter, she wouldn't mind having the kids over again. Yeah, we'll have to set something up. Sounds good. Thanks. He left just as quickly as he'd come and Petra went back to work. She cleaned up the boy's mouth and went to get the dentist, running into Maddie in the hallway. Dr. Payne was just finishing up in room 5 so she waited. Do you have any plans tonight? she asked Maddie. Maddie tightened her ponytail. I'm going to see that movie we talked about. Wanna come? Petra considered the invitation. She'd been worried about Brad all day. He was so big and strong that she couldn't imagine him laid low by something as little as a cold. Maybe he was one of those baby types. The kind who moaned and laid around until they felt better. Hmm. I'm spending the evening with Brad, he's not feeling well. But thanks for asking. Dr. Payne came out of the room and stopped at the sight of the two of them. Am I behind? Nope. Petra smiled and waved him in the direction of her patient. You're right on time. The rest of the day flew by quickly as she anticipated spending the evening taking care of Brad. Taking care of a sick muscle man had its perks. Maybe kissing was off the table, she didn't need his germs, but the chance to hang out with him, to just share the same space for a while, made her heart lift. Petra climbed out of her van and took in Brad's house. His extra-large house. She cocked her head. If she had to describe it, she'd say it was craftsman style. Dark gray with white trim and shutters on the windows, the home had a good feeling about it. Perhaps that feeling came from the large front porch with white slats and a railing. She could imagine afternoons in the shade, rocking and kissing. She jerked herself out of the daydream. Soup, lots of soup for the sick guy. That's why she was here. Not to plan out her future. They were still in casual mode, not that Brad hadn't tried to have the relationship up in conversation the other day in the pantry. Thankfully, they'd avoided that one and he hadn't brought it up since. She wiped her palms on her scrub bottoms. Yes. She was being cautious but her heart had already been through so much, she couldn't put it through that much pain again. Brad was just going to have to be patient. Unfortunately, like most football players she'd known, he was not patient. Her old self would have waved a hand down her body and said, 
how can he be patient when he could have all this? She shook her head at her crazy thoughts and retrieved the takeout bag from the back seat. The brick walkway was nice, a homey touch. The house could have been intimidating, because of its size. What did a single guy need with all this square footage anyway? She climbed the wood steps and knocked. A few seconds later Arya answered the door. Her brows pulled together. What are you doing here, Brad sick? Petra was taken off guard by her territorial tone. She smiled and lifted the bag. I brought dinner, for the two of you. Not really, but there was enough to feed them all so she might as well play nice. Whatever. Arya dropped her arm from the door and sauntered in the house. Not exactly an invitation but probably the best I'm going to get. She made her way inside, her steps quiet on the hand-planed flooring, and went the general direction Arya had disappeared to. That path brought her to the kitchen. Relieved, she set the bag on the counter and began unloading styrofoam containers of hot soup, crackers, and breadsticks. Arya slid onto the countertop, her legs swinging. Petra bit back how unsanitary it was to put her rear end on the counter where food was prepared. How's work? You're working at Max, right? Arya sat up a little taller. Yeah, you should come in sometime. I'd love to fix your eyeshadow. Petra laughed right out loud. Not only could she not afford the high-end cosmetics, she rarely had time to put on more than a base coat and eyeliner. I'm not even wearing eyeshadow. Arya narrowed her eyes. That explains a lot. She ran her finger along the chain at her neck. You know, I don't get you and Brad. Oh. Petra began opening and closing cupboards, looking for bowls. The man had thirty shaker cups but not one bowl? Ah. She pulled down three. Yeah, you're not his type. Like, at all. His other girlfriends didn't bring him soup? Petra quipped. She didn't want to have this conversation. She had a feeling it would involve a long list of her faults and deficits and she was keenly aware of those already. Not hardly. What kind do you want? She pointed to the containers as she listed them off. Minestrone, chicken noodle, or fiesta blend. I'll take minestrone. She poured the bowl and then put the lid back on the soup. Minestrone was her least favorite out of the three. She handed Arya the bowl. Arya held her hands and the bowl, keeping Petra from releasing it. I like you, Petra. And, for what it's worth, I'm sorry. For what? For Brad. He gets bored, dates. Then when the season starts up, he breaks up with whomever he's been with. It's a cycle. My mom says he has commitment issues but I think he hasn't found a woman he loves more than football. Petra's hands went slack and the bowl tipped slightly. Arya caught it. And you don't think I could be that woman? As soon as the words were out, she wanted to suck them right back in. Who did she think she was anyway? Besides, they were casually dating. Her heart shouldn't pound this hard while she waited for his sister's stamp of approval. It wasn't really Arya she wanted to love her, it was Brad. Arya lifted a shoulder. I guess. She leaned over and took a deep breath of the steam. It smells great. Thanks for bringing this over. Brad's in the living room. She pointed to an archway. Petra managed to keep her smile in place. Arya was not the expert on Brad's dating habits. Brad was. But it wasn't like she could walk in there and ask him why his sister thought she wasn't going to last past the first game of the season. Not to mention, she'd had that thought herself a time or two. 
football wasn't a sport that shared well. It was demanding, all-encompassing, and it played dirty. No offense to football in general. Then again, most players only had five years in the league. Handing over five years of your life in exchange for financial freedom seemed like a fair trade. She wasn't so sure. She wouldn't compete with football, she refused. And, she couldn't give Brad some sort of ultimatum. That wasn't fair to him. Especially since she wanted to avoid all relationship talks for the time being. Avoidance wasn't a good strategy but it was all she had at the moment. Chapter 21 Off-season workouts weren't meant to stress the body. They were a way for the trainers and coaches to evaluate players and for players to keep their skills up. A few of the guys were nursing wounds earned during the season. That's how it was for Titans. They pushed themselves to the point of breaking for 17 weeks and then spent the next few months recovering. Brad was one of the lucky ones. He'd made it through the season with just a few pulled muscles. Now that his cold was gone, he felt strong. Petra was the one to thank for that. She brought him soup, rubbed menthol on his chest, a process he enjoyed much too much, and kissed his forehead before she left. Despite her tender bedside manner, he had the feeling that something was wrong. She didn't hold his gaze, dropping her eyes behind her heavy lashes far too quickly for his liking. He'd sent several texts and received short answers. Since he was finally back to 100%, he wanted to see her, but she'd had an excuse every time he'd asked. Valid excuses, but excuses nonetheless. Add to that his growing unease that he'd picked football to appease his mother and his head was all over the place. He had this feeling that if he could just see Petra, talk to her, she'd put it all in perspective. You're looking good, de Grand, shouted their strength trainer, Hank. He never said anything, always shouted. Which was fine when he was giving you compliments but if he thought you were wussing out, the whole gym knew it. I feel good, he called back. Good. Hit the showers. He didn't argue. If he was lucky, he'd get to spend some time with a beautiful woman today. He sent her a quick text. Hey. How's the most beautiful woman on the planet? Petra, I rolling emoji, you're such a flirt. My day is fine. Yours? Avocado emoji, just to be dumb. Workouts done. Petra, rowboat emoji, because she's sassy like that. Are you buffer? Brad, wouldn't you like to know? He set his phone down on the passenger seat and headed out of the parking lot with the intent of finding food and lots of it. He hadn't been out of the practice facility for longer than ten minutes when his phone screamed, It's your mother, making him jump. He chuckled. Aria had installed that for him yesterday so he'd know when the crap hit the fan about her moving in with him. They'd waited and waited to hear about it. He hit the answer button on the steering wheel. Hi, Mom. What were you thinking? Just now? That I'm hungry. He flipped on his blinker and pulled over. Don't get smart with me. Do you want me to get dumb with you? Petra was starting to rub off on him. He needed to pull back on the sarcasm. Sorry. I just got out of a workout. I'm pumped up. A likely excuse but the only one that she'd let slide. Aria needs to be in school. Agreed. Then why is she schlepping cosmetics and not in class? Because she needs to find her own way back. If she goes back. His mom gasped. You're enabling her bad behavior. I'm giving her room to find herself. You should try it sometime. He clenched his jaw. What is that supposed to mean? Nothing. 
You're undermining me as a parent. I'll bet the two of you have been planning this for a while. Brad pinched the bridge of his nose. I'm not the bad guy here, Mom. And I suppose I am? No. There's not a bad guy. Aria's not the bad guy either. She has the right to make her own path, even if you don't like it. You never gave me such trouble. Because we had the same vision for my life. Thank goodness. He barely stopped himself from ragging on his mom. That wasn't his job. Look, I have to go. I have a lunch appointment. This isn't over. Sure. Sure. We can talk about it another time. He said, goodbye, and hung up before she could prolong the discussion. Brad, can I take you to lunch? Petra, does cereal taste better with milk? Brad, why yes, it does. I'll pick you up at your office. Petra, I'll be ready in 20 minutes. He sent her a thumbs-up emoji and then put the car in drive and pulled back into traffic. It wasn't long before they were seated at a deli. He had three sandwiches in front of him, she had a half a sandwich and a salad. She glanced at his lunch, lifted her eyebrows, and then smiled easily. I get the feeling that you enjoy the fact that I'm always hungry. She nodded, her hand over her mouth as she chewed lettuce. She swallowed and said, it makes me think I'm dieting, even though I'd eat this any day. Like you'd need a diet. She rolled her eyes and took an extra large bite of her sandwich. They ate for a minute before she asked, so what's going on with you? What do you mean? There was something big going on inside of him, but he wanted to know how she knew. She waved her hand around in front of him. You have this whole preoccupied aura going for you. Is it Arya? Sort of. He set his food down and brushed the crumbs off his fingers. She's doing well. Better than she has in a long time. I hope it lasts. It will. She's a smart girl. Yeah. I just. She's got me thinking about my own life. About the decisions I've made. Petra leaned back, her palms on the table and her arms straight. Like what? Football. Whoa. Whoa, they're big guy. You told me that you were the game and the game was you. I know. But I never really had a choice. The path was always there in front of me and I just went with it. He rested his elbows on the table. I could be a great golfer, better than Tiger, and I'd never know. She licked her beautiful lips. Or a ballet dancer. An astronaut. A firefighter. A computer programmer. Her eyes sparkled. You could have the key to flying cars locked away in that head of yours and because you played football, none of us will have flying DeLoreans. He cocked his head and a smile. It's crazy how well you understand me. She nodded seriously as she drank from her straw. You know what you have to do, don't you? Buy some plutonium? No, she smacked his arm. You need to take the coin test. The what now? The coin test. She picked her purse off the extra seat and dug through, coming up with a quarter. It's a simple test. Heads, you keep playing football. Tails you quit. Okay. His head spun. He couldn't let a coin toss decide his fate, could he? Then again, up to this point in his life, that had basically been his strategy. He'd gone with the hand fate dealt him, and it had done well. He played for a fantastic football team. He had a big, beautiful house. He was dating this sweet woman. 
Why not let fate decide? One, two, three. She flipped the coin. Time slowed down as Brad watched the silver disc turn over and over in the air. It moved so slowly he could practically read the date. And while it spun through the air, he thought about what he'd do if it came up tails. He have to quit the team. That would suck. He had a good rapport with the other players. London was his friend. He'd think Brad was nuts to quit now, at the top of his game. And he was right. He'd lose out on a good portion of his contract. That was money in the bank if he stuck around. And, if he managed it right, he and his future family would be set. Without that guarantee, he'd have to find a job. Working at a desk sounded exhausting and morally depleting. He'd be grumpy in a day. His legs bounced. And then there was the rush of a play going right. The kind where he could read the ball, read the field, read his opponent so well that everything clicked into place and he soared. It wasn't about the crowds, it was about the clarity that came when he pushed himself to the brink and then found another ounce of will to go one more play. It wasn't about his mom and what she wanted either, that disappeared when he went off to college. He dug his cleat into the grass and it felt like home. Football had gotten him through the lonely first year because football was a piece of him. As long as he had that piece, he'd have peace. The quarter landed in Petra's palm and she flipped it over onto the back of her opposite hand. Brad covered her hands with his one. Don't. Her energy stilled. Why not? Because I can't walk away from it. Says who? Says me. He smiled the words tumbled out of him. I think, I think I did choose this path, or God chose it for me. Because when I think of my life without football, it's like I'm lost. She smirked and pulled her hands away from his, dropping the quarter into her purse with a pointed look. That's the real test, isn't it? To see if I could live with tails. He folded his arms. She laughed. You're a smart man. She ducked her head and focused on her salad. He picked up his sandwich, feeling much better about life in general. Petra was the answer. He'd known he needed to see her, that she'd help. And she had. Which made him fall just a little deeper for her. You're pretty amazing, you know that? She laughed. Yep. But I'm glad you know it too. He shoved her lightly, already feeling better, happier. Yeah, he knew she was amazing. He just wasn't allowed to do anything about it. If it were up to him, they'd be exclusively dating, and he didn't need a coin flip to figure that one out. Chapter 22 that night Petra sat at the bar in her parents' kitchen and shared everything that had happened since Valentine's Day. Her mom and Nora stood on the other side of the bar, their spoons dipping into the Chocopolitan ice cream container at regular intervals as they listened with rapt attention. Her dad had taken the three granddaughters for ice cream. No doubt they were all getting tummy aches and dad would be popping tums all night. When she'd summed up their lunch that afternoon, she finally took a deep breath and went for a spoonful of ice cream. Three different flavors of chocolate in one pint-sized container was heaven. Mom turned to Nora. Well, I'm glad he's playing for himself. Nora pointed her spoon at the counter. Mom, he's too invested in the game. His sister said he hadn't found a woman he loved more than football. What if he never does? What if he convinces himself he has and then finds out later that he really didn't? What if it's some sort of addiction? She can't live in fear. No, agreed Nora. But she doesn't have to put herself in that situation again. They continued to talk about her as if she weren't there. 
Petra let them go on because she had the same thoughts bouncing around in her head. Maybe they could come up with an answer about football. Brad isn't Dylan. Besides, there are no guarantees in life. She could fall in love with a dentist who dies in a plane crash. Should she avoid flying for the rest of her life? Nora's hand went to her chest in shock. You can't seriously compare dying in a plane crash to playing football. Mom was right. There weren't guarantees. Life was full of ups and downs. The trick was to find a way to enjoy the ride. Brad made her happy. When he told her today that she got him, her whole body had gone warm and gooey. He got her too. Even though she told him he had no game, his cheesy one-liners never failed to lift her spirits. And his kisses? Forget about it. The man was a pro. Instead of letting the debate continue, she decided to interrupt. Pulling Dylan and Evie's wedding invitation out of her back pocket, she flopped it on the counter between the two of them. They paused, glanced down, and then pounced on it like cats on a laser dot. They both looked up at the same time, their eyes brimming with uncertainty about how to proceed. After all, the remarriage of an ex-in-law was uncharted territory. Petra flipped her spoon over and sucked the ice cream off of it before saying, I was thinking of taking Brad as my plus one. Mom and Nora exchanged a look. Nora nodded approvingly. That'll show Dylan what he's missing. Brad's, buffer, cuter, and actually made it onto a pro team. Whoa! Petra held up her hands. That's not at all what I was thinking. Really? asked Mom in disbelief. I wouldn't mind seeing Dylan eat a little humble pie. What has gotten into you too? Petra snatched up the invite and stuffed it back into her pocket. You're supposed to be an example as the older sister. I'm supposed to protect you. Ask Andrew how many times I threatened to go after Dylan with a paintball gun for what he put my baby sister through. Petra sat up taller. She didn't need her big sister to protect her. Although, there were a couple times she would have planned the paintball attack if she'd known that was an option. Dylan has been a much better ex-husband than he was a husband. Mom conceded the point with a nod. Besides, Petra hurried on before Nora could argue with her. He's moving on. I want to too. And, I like Brad. I think brining him to the wedding would be a good way to say I want to be more serious. She took an extra large bite of ice cream, filling her mouth so she couldn't say anything else. She put Brad off for some time, not wanting to get serious. He'd proven over and over again that he was a good guy, trustworthy, and maybe he was her match. She wouldn't know unless she gambled some of her heart. The thing was, with Brad, it didn't feel like much OFA gamble. Ooh. Nora pumped her eyebrows. Fine. If it's that. She lifted her spoon full of milk chocolate ice cream. But that doesn't change the fact that he's totally hot. Who's hot? I can turn down the thermos, said Dad as he came in on the tail end of the conversation. The ladies all giggled at his cluelessness. Mom pecked a kiss on his cheek and he gave her side a squeeze. Petra sighed. If she was ever going to get where her parents were, she was going to have to be brave in the here and now. She hugged Taya hello and then sent her to the bathroom to wash her sticky hands. She could only imagine what the inside of her parents' car looked like. Three little girls with ice cream fingers could do some damage. While Nora helped her girls in the kitchen sink, Petra snuck out to the garage to call Brad. Brad. Brad flipped through the channels, looking for something good. Football was over. Baseball hadn't started yet. Golf was not in swing. 
there was nothing good on. He brought up the streaming movie service, hoping to find something to binge watch. Petra was at her parents' house and Aria was out with friends. London was in Seattle with Maya on tour. He could have called a couple of the other guys but they'd want to go out, hit the clubs, and he wasn't in the mood. All he really wanted to do was be with Petra and Taya. The little girl was growing on him. He'd watched over his younger sisters growing up, and Petra's daughter brought out the same protective grizzly bear inside of him. They could do something she wanted to do. Well, not play beauty parlor, he had to draw the line at that. But maybe she'd like to go to the park or something. His phone rang and he picked it up, already feeling happier just because it was Petra. Hey, babe. Hey, her voice was soft, as if she didn't want to be overheard. Are you still at your mom's? Yeah, the kids just got back. I, um, I wanted to ask you, if you wouldn't mind going as my plus one to a wedding. Wait a second. He hit the mute button and sat up higher. Are you asking me on a date? Oh my gosh, don't make a big deal out of this. She was nervous. His smile went from 10 to 100 watts. Finally, she was going to introduce him to her family. If that wasn't a step up from casual, he didn't know what was. Whose wedding? See, that's the thing. It's a little awkward because it's Dylan's. Brad's heart screeched to a stop, right along with his thoughts. Dylan? Your ex? He knew darn well who Dylan was and that they'd been married. He knew much more about Dylan than Petra thought he knew. Yeah, is that weird? Is it too soon to introduce you to my ex? He could just see her twisting the hem of her t-shirt in her delicate fingers. He took a moment to really hear what she was saying. She was asking to take things between them to the next level. He'd be an idiot to say no. Avoiding Dylan was impossible if he was going to continue to see Petra. If he was ever going to be able to say I love you without scaring her away, he had to put forth the effort to be a part of her life. And, no matter what happened between them, Petra and Dylan shared a child. Dylan would always be a part of her life. No, not too soon. He cleared his throat once and then had to do it again before he could talk. I'd be happy to go with you. Okay. Good then. I mean, that's great. Petra? Yeah. It's going to be okay, okay? Who was he trying to convince here? I know. I'm not at all upset about Dylan getting remarried. I mean, I thought I would be, but Evie's been really good for him. He's a better person with her in his life, more devoted to being a dad and better at communicating. I'm happy for him. Brad scratched his cheek confused as to why she was unloading this all on him. Uh, huh. So I'm not nervous about Dylan. That's good. The line was silent so long he checked to make sure the call was still connected. Then it hit him. You're nervous about us. Maybe, she said so quietly he had to strain to hear her. Honey, we're good. It's just, this is kind of a big deal. My family is growing. I'm going to be the coolest aunt to Dylan's new girls. Is that what you'd call me? I'm not their stepmom, so I was trying to come up with a term that would work and not be weird. I think aunt works fine. I did too. So my family is growing and it's a big deal to bring you into the circle because it's been the same size for years and now, it's not. He scrubbed his knuckles over the couch cushion. You stink at relationship talks. She burst out laughing. I didn't always. I just wish I could have said all this in person. 
Do you want to video chat? Heck no. I probably have ice cream all over my chin or something. I'll bet you're beautiful, he said soft and low charging the conversation with intimacy. You're too good to me, Brad. There's no such thing. Thank you. The I love you was right on the tip of his tongue. Saying it over the phone would be so much easier than saying it in person. But, that was one area that he didn't want to take the easy way out. Once again, he was struck with the idea that Petra deserved better than a phone call confession of love. He'd tell her, and he'd tell her right. Are you good? I'm good. They worked out the date and dress code, said, goodbye, and hung up the phone. Brad leaned back against the couch and stared up at the ceiling. This was an interesting turn of events. He hadn't really thought through what would happen when he saw Dylan. Maybe it was his one-track mind keeping his eyes on the prize, Petra. There was a day of reckoning coming. Maybe, like Petra, Dylan wouldn't remember him from that day and nothing would happen. But what if he did? The sound of Petra's nervousness coming across the phone was enough to spur him to continue forward. She needed him. She claimed she was over the whole Dylan getting remarried thing, but until it happened, she wouldn't know for sure. She needed support. She needed a friend. And, she needed to know she was beautiful and desirable. He could do those things for her. A few months ago, Doc had asked him to visualize what he would say to Dylan if he saw him in person. Brad had worked through the exercise, crafting an apology. It had helped. At the time, he never thought he'd use it. The wedding could be his chance to finally say the words that had stuck to his soul like tar. And, maybe if he apologized to Dylan, Petra would be okay, with his role in her past too. He would apologize to her too. But only if Dylan recognized him. Otherwise, he'd wait until he and Petra were alone to explain how and why he'd found her online that day several months ago. The plan sounded shaky to him. But there was one thing he was certain of, he wouldn't be free to love Petra completely until she knew the whole truth because, until she found out, he would always hold a sliver of fear in his heart. Fear and love were opposites. One couldn't survive while the other had control. Therefore, he needed to gain control of his fear, wipe it out, so that love could thrive. Suddenly full of energy, he popped off the couch and headed towards his stationary bike. He needed to burn off some anxiety that he was going to lose Petra, because the chance was real that he might. Chapter 23 Petra slowly blew out a breath to calm her racing heart as they entered the restaurant for the wedding dinner. Taya tried to let go of her hand and she adjusted her grip to keep the girl from dogging through the crowd in search of her new stepsisters and BFFs. Not only would she introduce Brad to Dylan and his new family, her ex-in-laws would be here. She hadn't thought much about Mr. and Mrs. Silverling until the ride over. Dylan's parents were good people. They were. They were also under the impression that she'd driven Dylan into his depression. She'd never forget the day Dylan's mom called to tell her that she needed to spend more time seeing to her husband's needs. That was a good day, not. Brad stepped ahead of her, twisting his arm behind his back and reaching for her hand. She grabbed hold, pulling Taya behind her. The group waiting to be seated parted for him probably not wanting to get run over if they didn't move. She saw a few people take out their phones and snap pictures. That was something she'd have to get used to. Maybe Brad's celebrity status would work to her favor with Dylan's parents. His dad was a huge football fan. He might be struck silent by the fact that she brought a titan to the dinner. Brad glanced behind him and she smiled, giving his hand a squeeze. A hostess showed them to a private room in the back. 
As soon as they walked in, Layla and Mila rushed Taya for hugs. They clamped onto one another as if they'd not seen each other for months instead of the mere 24 hours. They'd actually had to be apart. Petra made certain to greet them both and compliment them on their dresses. They were so cute. She lifted her gaze to find Dylan approaching the doorway, a scowl on his face. She glanced down to make sure she'd dressed Taya correctly. Evie had wanted the girls to coordinate in flower dresses. They were all the same print in a different color. It was sweet how Evie included Taya and softened Petra's heart to the situation even more. Taya had on the right dress. Petra gave Dylan a curious look. Dylan glared at Brad and took her by the arm to pull her aside, not even acknowledging her date. She threw an apologetic look to Brad. I'll be just a minute. Leaving him in a room full of strangers was beyond rude. Are you kidding me right now? Dylan growled. What? She shook off his hand. He had no right to touch her, let alone manhandle her like that. Your. Date. She glanced over at Brad. He had his hands in his pockets and his head down but his eyes were trained on the two of them. What, you're allowed to move on but I'm not. I told you I was bringing someone. You're perfectly welcome to move on. But not with him. He spat out the last word. What's wrong with him? Oh, maybe this was about the fact that he was a football player. Well, Dylan would just have to get over his aversion to all things football. She was done living her life for him, had been for quite some time. Just because he plays football doesn't mean. Brad stepped up to them. He lightly touched her arm, the contrast between his touch and Dylan's wasn't lost on her. Where Dylan had been slightly demanding, Brad's was all give, as in give the butterflies in her tummy something to flap about. I can't let you two fight because I'm here. Brad, he's being unreasonable, Petra defended herself and her choice to bring him. Brad gave a small shake of his head. He's not. He has every right to hate me. What? She glanced back and forth between the two of them. Why? Dylan snorted in derision. You don't know? Man, and you thought I was distant. What? She demanded from Brad. He ran his hand through his hair, opening and closing his mouth. He's the one who took me out of the game, Dylan filled in. The one who, her voice trailed off as her mind picked up speed. Brad was a defensive tackle. Her eyes darted to Dylan's elbow and then up to Brad's eyes. You? I don't understand, how? Instead of answering her question, Brad faced to Dylan. The look on his face was resolved, like a man facing a firing squad. If he had been the one to break Dylan's arm, then, her mind couldn't finish the thought because it was so far-fetched. I'm sorry. I've thought about that hit every day for the last five and a half years. Petra reached behind her to find a chair to hold on to. If it weren't for that hit, she stared at Dylan. They would be in a different place right now. Wouldn't they? Her head raced through the past, through the knowledge she had now, seeing things in hindsight. Seeing them clearly, and yet, brand new knowing Brad was involved. Brad kept talking. I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't mean to take you out. I can't tell you how much guilt I've carried, the day I signed with the Titans, my hands shook so hard. I just, I'm sorry, man. I wish things had turned out differently. If I could have traded places with you, I would have. Dylan continued to glare. Brad faced Petra. I'm sorry to you too. I broke rule number three. I knew who you were that day I first messaged you. 
I kept tabs on the two of you after the accident. I, I wanted to know if you were okay, and I didn't have any other way to find out. She recoiled. You are a stalker. He gave her a pained smile. Hopefully not in a creepy way. I've worried about you. And then when I got to know you, I couldn't seem to walk away. You're strong and amazing and resourceful and determined and kind-hearted and just about the most perfect human I've ever met. Tears pricked the backs of her eyes and she stepped away from him. There was too much information for her to process, too much for her to just brush away with offhanded forgiveness. She needed time. I think you should go. Dylan put his hand on Brad's shoulder and pushed him towards the door. I'll make sure she gets home. I really am sorry, Brad said. It sucked, man. Dylan admitted. Petra snorted. Leave it to Dylan to sum up several years of heartache in three words. Dylan turned his head and his eyes caught Evie laughing as she talked to his parents. But it doesn't suck today, he admitted quietly. Brad's eyes glistened. Relief plastered across his face. The kind that pierced her heart. He'd suffered too. She didn't want to think about what he'd gone through, to give him any credit for feeling bad about what he'd done. She wasn't there yet. The wounds were fresh. Not the old one about Dylan. That she could forgive, had long ago. The game came with risks and they played and lost. That was how it went sometimes. Petra stared up at the ceiling, willing the tears not to fall. She'd worked too hard on her makeup to let it get ruined now. Brad's confession brought up a lot of old emotions as well as some new ones. She'd taken him into her heart. Thought she was falling in love with him. Thought they could have a future together. That wasn't going to happen. He'd lied to her. He'd stalked her. She'd let her guard down and this is what happened. Evie's father called the group to order and asked them to find a seat for dinner. Petra hurried over to the little girls. She told Dylan she'd watch them throughout the meal. This was his day. It was definitely not her day. She turned off her phone, not wanting to see Brad's messages pop up. She stuffed her feelings deep inside and focused on Taya. Being a mom had gotten her through hard things before. She could do it again. Asterisk. So he approached you, asked Brad. He'd offered to give her a ride home. Since her options were Brad or her ex-in-laws or an Uber she had to pay for, she opted for Brad. Evie was totally cool about it. Brad had brought her up to speed with hushed whispers throughout dinner. She'd given Petra a long hug which was really nice and almost made Petra cry. The woman was a saint. Yeah, he said, and I quote, how's life? PFT. I thought it was a bad pickup line. I never thought he was that guy. She ran her thumb along the door handle. How'd you know it was him? I've followed his career. She turned towards him, surprised. Really? Yeah, it was a special kind of torture. Every success or award he earned I hated him more. I had no idea. You wouldn't. I kept it from you. Petra nodded, unsurprised. You were kind to him tonight. I've realized something, and please don't take this the wrong way. She twisted her lips but stayed quiet. As he was standing there apologizing for screwing up my life, I realized that the accident hadn't ruined us, my anger did. Petra's hand dropped to her side. Wow. Brad. You're growing up. He laughed. Evie is a Titans fan. She wants season tickets. 
I had to work through the anger if I was going to sit with her at a game. You know what else is big? What? You dating again. I feel stupid for falling for him. The more I think about him knowing all about us, our past, and my life, the more upset I am that he didn't tell me. Dylan smirked. What? You have a type. A type. Some women like blondes. Some like computer geeks. You like football players. She rolled her eyes. As if it's that simple. She gripped the door handle. Brad and me? It's too complicated. I just want a love that comes easy. Since when did anything worthwhile come easy? When did you become so smart? When I was dumb enough to lose my family. Petra didn't feel any triumph at his admission that he'd messed up. She might have a few years ago when the pain was all fresh. My mom will love to hear that you said that. Today she just felt sad for what could have been. Well, I'll be praying for you and Evie, every day. You two are going to make it. Thanks. Listen, I didn't react that well when I first saw DeGrand. Would you mind telling him I'm sorry? I don't want it to be weird when I see him again. She tightened her grip on the handle. I'm not sure I'm going to speak to him. He's a stalker, I have to block his number. Besides, he broke the rule, honesty is the foundation. I'm sorry, Brad said. Petra had no doubt he meant it. She turned to look out the window. I'll survive, I always do. Chapter 24 Brad glanced around the small room. The receptionist that had shown him the way to the room 3 at Dr. Payne's dental had turned on the massage feature, and his whole backside vibrated. It was annoying. He reached behind him in an effort to find the off switch. Petra hadn't returned his calls or answered his messages. She'd probably blocked his number so he'd been forced to take drastic measures to see her again. Yes, scheduling an appointment with her dentist was pretty drastic. In light of her comment about him being a stalker, he decided that going to her work was less creepy than showing up at her house. It was hot in this room. And the room was too small. He tugged his shirt away from his body, trying to create the sense of space around him that wasn't there. Why didn't they make exam room a big enough for guys like him? Surely he wasn't the only six feet three inches man to need his teeth cleaned. He didn't really need his teeth cleaned. What he needed was a chance to explain himself. If he had to do it with a water pick and a sucky thing in his face, so be it. He gave up trying to find the switch and clenched his leg and arm muscles against the buzzing. In a rustling of clothes and stomping of feet, Petra was standing next to him, her fists on her hips and murder in her eyes. This is my job, she hissed. He swiped his hand across his forehead. Did I ever tell you that I'm afraid of the dentist? He barely managed to keep his voice level. Every parcel of his being urged him to grab hold of her, pull her close, and just hold on to her. She stared at him without speaking. However, the fire in her eyes dimmed. Seriously frightened. He glanced over his shoulder at the cupboards. Maybe you could give me something to take the edge off. He tried to joke. He'd keep trying too because all he wanted was to see a smile on her face. Okay, so no help there. Look, I'm facing this fear to talk to you. Not to mention your dentist isn't on my insurance, so. She stomped her foot on a pedal and his chair flew backwards, laying him flat. He gripped the sides, digging his fingers into the leather. Now was as good a time as any to spill his guts. Petra, I should have told you from the start. I don't have an excuse. 
At least, not one that's good enough. Why did you contact me? She held up a tool of some sort. It was sharp and looked cold, mean. Brad's eyes zeroed in on the impossibly pointy tip. He literally couldn't look away. What I told Dylan was true. I've kept tabs on you guys. Mostly Dylan. I've carried this huge bag of guilt around. I saw you in the stands that day, pregnant. It was too much. Anyway, the team counselor suggested I look in on you. He thought that once I knew you were okay, I'd be able to let go of the negative feelings and break through to another level of play. Did it help? She flipped on the bright light, blinding him. The fact that she hadn't actually touched him hadn't escaped Brad's notice. Not at first. He kept talking, laying it all out there. The whole battery thing threw me off. But then, we talked and talked and I realized that you're wonderful. I expected someone bitter and jaded and I found someone sweet and kind, even to people who don't deserve it. He couldn't help but throw that in there because he really didn't deserve her forgiveness no matter how much he wanted it. You're so much more than I planned on, I, I love you, Petra. She flipped off the light and his eyes slowly adjusted to the change. I can't trust you, Brad. You can, Petra. I'm the same guy who took you on the slingshot and that let you win at go-karts. She snorted at his let-her-win comment. He hadn't and she knew it but he was trying to break through her walls and the best way to do that, at least with her, was to get her to laugh. You need me, honey. And I need you. You entered my life under false pretenses. I turned my back on basic rules for online safety and I feel like I betrayed part of myself for letting you into my life, my daughter's life. I don't know how to come back from that. I'm sorry. She covered her mouth and tears built in her eyes. She ducked out of the room and left him alone. Brad swore. He scrambled from the chair. He wasn't going to sit there if there was no hope. Petra heaved a deep breath, begging her eyes to stop leaking. She was the epitome of professionalism. Breaking down on the job was an unpardonable sin. She didn't mind if others did it but didn't allow herself room to be that dramatic. Yet here she stood, in the stupid supply room, with a tissue pressed to both eyes and her nose running like a dental thing that are you and dollar. Maddie poked her head in the door, took one look at Petra, and slipped inside. Hey! It's been hours since he left. Have you been in here the whole time? Petra choked on a sob as she shook her head. She'd managed to make it through most of the day with only short breaks to cry between patients. He didn't even get his cleaning. She laughed at how stupid that sounded. Like Brad was here for a cleaning. The poor guy is scared of the dentist. Maddie rubbed her back. What are you going to do? I told him that we couldn't work. Maddie frowned even as she continued to rub Petra's back in support. Petra gulped down the lump in her throat and kept talking. We can't. It's too much. My family is all mixed up and in transition right now. His sister moved in with him. I haven't met his mom but I hear she's tough to deal with. I just don't think I can handle the stress. Please. You handle stress better than anyone I know. Petra gave her a weak smile. You don't want to let him go, do you? I don't. But. I do. She gripped the tissues in tight fists. Ugh. What am I going to do? Maddie was quiet for a minute. Do you remember when Mark and I were looking at that house and I couldn't decide if I wanted to move? Petra nodded. Maddie fished a quarter out of her pocket. Let's flip a coin. 
She laughed. You're telling me that I already know what the right move for me is. Maddie nodded. She did know. That's why she was in here crying, because she'd made a mistake sending Brad away. He'd said he loved her, and she believed him. But like a broken record, she repeated the same phrases she'd used to convince herself that she had to break up with him. He lied to me. And stalked me. You say stalking, I say overactive concern. Petra laughed. That's so dumb. It is, but I don't think he intended to hurt you, sweetie. He's in love with you. And the fact that he's been worried about you for years is kind of sweet. Well, crap. Petra pulled out her phone. What do I say? I sent him packing. Tell him to come back. Petra started typing. He hates the dentist. Maddie laughed. And you're in love with him. Yes, I am. She typed several messages and deleted them. Finally, she ended up with How's Life? She hit send before she could change her mind. If he didn't respond, then she'd just have to go to his giant house and track him down. Brad sent back a thumbs down emoji. Not the kind of response she was looking for that included another declaration of his deep seated feelings for her, but she'd take it. Petra, do you think it's possible that we could be in U.S.? She held her breath. If he said no after seeing her crazy, she'd understand. Maybe she could offer to talk to the team counselor, get some of her issues taken care of by a professional. Brad, yes. Her heart about leapt out of her chest. She couldn't type fast enough and made several mistakes before getting something legible. Even with my ex and his stepkids and your crazy mom who hasn't met me and your sister living at your house, and all the crazy things that have happened this week? Brad, yes. Petra, can I see you? Tonight? Brad, yes. Petra was going nuts. Can you say something besides yes? Brad, I love you. Petra's whole body sagged with relief. I love you too. Brad, confetti emoji, I can't wait to kiss you. I'm coming over. Petra, drive fast. Safe but fast. She jumped up and down, her arms flapping. He's coming, she squealed. Maddie shoved her to the door. Don't stand there, go out and meet him. Petra raced for the front door. She didn't care if Dr. Payne saw her slacking off or making out in front of the office. She didn't care if she was creating a scene. She was in love and the whole world should know it. Brad Spider screeched to a stop in the red zone. Petra shoved her way through the glass door. He got out just in time for her to throw herself into his arms. I'm so sorry about earlier. He kissed her with an urgency and she returned each one. What made you change your mind, he asked as he trailed kisses down her neck and then worked his way back up to her mouth. The coin test. She put her hands on his face and brought their foreheads together. You passed the coin test. He laughed, bending down and wrapping his arms around her body, he lifted her in the air. Petra giggled. She bent down and kissed him again. Put me down so I can kiss you good. Well, when you put it like that. He set her gently on her feet. She leaned up to kiss him but he stopped her. She pulled back, a small line between her eyes. Our lives are complicated, babe. I hope they get more complicated. More? She blinked in surprise. You need to know that I want it all. The wedding, babies, big family Thanksgiving dinners. The whole shabang. But what you need to know most is that I want it with you. Brad, 
she whispered his name, unable to make more sound because her heart was beating so fast. Babe, I love you more than football. She burst out a laugh, her heart exploding from all the feel-goods inside of her. Throwing her arms around his neck, she whispered in his ear, that's the most romantic thing you've ever said to me. Yes, life was messy but it was also beautiful because she had found the love of her life. Brad was her match, her perfect for her man. He made her laugh when life got tough and he made her swoon in those stolen moments. They'd be living off of those, and she could handle that, she could handle anything life threw at them as long as they could laugh together. Yes, honesty was the foundation, but laughter was the glue. She could hardly return his kisses she was smiling so big. Epilogue Petra held tight to Taya's hand as they made their way down the concrete steps to their reserved seats on the 50-yard line. In her other hand, she held tightly to a homemade poster that she'd carefully folded in half to keep the secret tucked inside. Hi! She waved at Layla and Mila, who were already in their seats. They had on matching t-shirts that sported the Titans logo. Teo wore one too. Brad had hooked them all up with team gear for the first game of the season. He spoiled them rotten. Evie twisted her knees to the side to let Taya through to sit between her stepsisters. They were thick as thieves these days, spending as much time at her and Brad's house as they did at Dylan and Evie's. It was great. A busy and blessed life. Which was about to get busier. She pressed her hand to her tummy. No one knew, not even Brad. Today was her big announcement. Her family was watching the game at home. With any luck, they'd all find out when Brad did. Her diamond ring sparkled in the light. Yep, she'd gone ahead and said yes, when Brad asked her to elope. They didn't have much time before the season started and she didn't want a big wedding, not again. The small ceremony was tasteful and full of family and a whole lot of kissing. In short, it was perfect. Taya had spent the week at Dylan and Evie's while Petra and Brad secluded themselves in a cabin in Montana. The hikes were breathtaking and the time alone was like a dream. The Titans took the field, their helmets shining in the sun and their white pants blinding. The crowd cheered. Petra bit her lip, waiting for just the right time to hold up her sign. Timing would be critical if Brad was going to see it. She waited the whole first half and then the second, her stomach churning. Brad was in the game, his head down, concentrating. He had one interception but the clock was winding down and he ran back to position without even glancing their way. The game ended with a whistle and Petra's head dropped back. She'd had one goal today and it looked like she'd failed. She could always hang the poster up at home. The big reveal would be a big deal no matter when she told him. But, she'd wanted to tell him here, in his game, to show him that she supported his love for football, his career. She'd envisioned this big moment where the circle of their family came together and celebrated for him. She stood up, dejected and defeated. Getting out of the parking lot was going to take some time. Brad had post-game responsibilities and she didn't want to wait around. If she didn't eat some real food soon, her any time of day sickness would kick in. Dylan tugged on her arm. Look! He pointed to the jumbotron. She glanced up and saw a huge heart around her image. The caption to the side said, I love you, babe, and had Brad's hashtag. The stadium mood and odd. She stared for a full ten seconds, shocked that he'd gotten the jump on her. She grinned and opened the sign, reading it on the screen along with the rest of the stadium. Hashtag 24's going to be a daddy. What? screeched Evie, a huge smile on her face. Wild applause broke out. There were screams and gasps and congratulations all around her. 
People sitting behind her waved at the camera and pointed to her belly. Her cheeks reddened. She searched the field for Brad, but couldn't find him in the group of guys on the sideline. All she could see was a sea of helmets bouncing up and down as they chanted, Dad D.Y., Dad D.Y. Suddenly Brad broke out of circle, guys slapping him on the back and on the head in congratulations. He ran straight across the green grass, showing off his legendary speed. Ripping off his helmet he threw it aside and vaulted up the wall that separated them. She gasped, grabbing onto his jersey to pull him to her. He landed on his feet with the grace of an athlete and kissed her with the all the passion of a devoted husband. She lost herself in his embrace. Floating away and leaning against him for support as he kissed her knees right out from under her. This was one of many moments she wanted to hold on to forever. It was a good thing they had forever to make so many more. You've been listening to The Devout Groom A Texas Titans Football Romance Written by Lucy McConnell And read by Christina Dimmick Hello and welcome back to my channel. We are going to do the fourth and final Texas Titans romance today. It is called The Devout Groom. And um, what I love most about this book is Petra. Petra is our main female character and she is sarcastic and sassy and all of these absolutely wonderful things. And she's positive, a devoted mother dis and despite everything that she's been through, she is a hopeless romantic at heart. And so as much as she tries to fight her feelings for a Texas Titan, she just can't do it. So um, I'm excited to share this book with you today and I hope you enjoy it.